Section 0 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rote Wheeler. Introduction. The general reader, for whom this writing is primarily designed, though he be college-bred, and may thus have had a mathematical discipline extending possibly through an elementary course in the calculus, probably entertains very erroneous or very inadequate notions respecting the proper character of mathematics, and especially respecting alike its marvelous growth in modern times and the great range and variety of doctrines that the term has come to signify. With a view to correcting such errors, at least in some measure, if they exist, and in order to enhance the reader's interest and to enlighten his appreciation, it seems worth while to preface the exposition proper with some general indications, albeit they must needs be mainly of an exterior kind, of the nature and the extent of the science whose foundations are to be subsequently explained. Let it be understood, then, that while mathematics is the most ancient of the sciences, it is not surpassed by any of them in point of modernity, but it is flourishing even today as never before, and at a rate unsurpassed by any rival. To compare it to a deep-rooted giant tree of manifold high and far-reaching arms is not an adequate simile. Rather is the science like a mighty forest of such oaks. These, however, literally grow into and through each other, so that by the junction and the intercessence of limb with limb, and root with root, and trunk with trunk, the manifold wood becomes a single, living, organic, growing whole. The mathematical achievements of antiquity were great achievements. The works of Euclid and Archimedes, of Apollinus and Diophantus, will endure forever among the most glorious monuments of the human intellect. And just now, owing to Dr. Heath's superb English edition of Euclid's Elements, a beautiful translation of the thirteen books from the definitive text of Heiberg, with rich bibliography and extensive commentary setting the whole matter in the composite light of ancient and modern geometric research, one sees even better than ever before how great mathematically was the age that produced the immortal alexandrine classic yet the elements of euclid is as small a part of mathematics as the iliad is of literature that the pandects of justinian is of human jurisprudence or as the sculpture of phidias is to the world's total art not the age of euclid but our own is the golden age of mathematics. Ours is the age in which no less than six international congresses of mathematics have been held in the course of ten years. Today there exist more than a dozen mathematical societies containing a growing membership of over two thousand men and women representing the centers of scientific light throughout the great culture nations of the world. In our time, more than five hundred scientific journals are each devoted in part, while more than two score others are devoted exclusively to the publication of mathematics. It is in our time that the Jahrbuch über die Fortschritte der Mathematik, yearbook for the progress of mathematics, though it admits only condensed abstracts with titles and does not report upon all the journals, has nevertheless grown into nearly forty huge volumes in as many years. It requires no less than seven ponderous tomes of the forthcoming Encyclopedia der Mathematischen Wissenschaften, Encyclopedia of the Mathematical Sciences, to contain not expositions, not demonstrations, but merely compact reports and bibliographic notices sketching developments that have taken place since the beginning of the nineteenth century. This great work is being supplemented and translated into the French language. Finally, to adduce yet another evidence of like kind, the three immense volumes of Moritz Cantor's Geschichte der Mathematik, History of Mathematics, 
though they do not aspire to the higher forms of elaborate exposition, and though they are far from exhausting the period traversed by them, yet conduct the narrative down only to 1758. A fourth volume in continuation of Cantor's work has recently appeared. It was composed mainly by other hands. That date, however, but marks the time when mathematics, then schooled for over a hundred eventful years in the fast unfolding wonders of analytic geometry and the calculus, and rejoicing in these, the two most powerful instruments of human thought, had but fairly entered upon her modern career. And so fruitful have been the intervening years, so swift the march along the myriad tracks of modern analysis and geometry, so abounding and bold and fertile withal has been the creative genius of the time, that to record, even briefly, the discoveries and the creations since the closing date of Cantor's work would require an addition to his great volumes of a score of volumes more. It is little wonder that so vital a spirit as that of Mathesis, increasing in intensity and more and more abounding as the ages have passed, it is small wonder that since pre-Aristotelian times it has challenged the mathematician and the philosopher alike to tell what it is, to define mathematics. And it is now not surprising that they should try in vain for many hundreds of years, for naturally conception of the science has to grow with the growth of the science itself. Cassius J. Kaiser End of Introduction Section 1 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Watt Wheeler. Pure Mathematics, Chapter 1, Number. Part 1. The notion of the number is extremely slow to develop both in the individual and in the race. Yet it has its origin at such a remote period in the evolution of man that only a possible reconstruction of its history may be given. Such an account may be built up mainly from three sources. A study of the knowledge and use of number among peoples lowest in the scale of civilization at the present time. The genesis of the number concept in the mind of the child and a comparison of root words of various languages, past and present. Number is coeval with spoken language, and probably annotates by a long period any written language or symbolism. Primitive man recorded the results of hunting or fishing excursions, the number of warriors in the opposing camp, or the number of days' journey from home by the use of pebbles, shells, knots in cord, nicks in wood, scores on stone, and most important for the present day, by the fingers and toes. The mode of recording numbers by knots on cord gave rise to the term kipu, reckoning, from the Peruvian language kipu meaning knot. Edward Claude, in the story of the alphabet, has this reference. The kipu has a long history and is with us in the rosary upon which prayers are counted. In the knot tied in a handkerchief to help a weak memory, and in the sailor's log line. Herodotus tells that when Darius bade the Ionians remain to guard the floating bridge which spanned the Ister, he tied sixty knots in a thong, saying, Men of Ionia, do keep this thong and do as I shall say. So soon as ye shall have seen me go forward against this Scythians, from that time begin and untie a knot each day, and if within this time I am not here, ye find that the days marked by the knots have passed by, then sail away to your own lands. The kipu reached its more elaborate form among the ancient Peruvians. It consisted of a main cord, to which were fastened at given distances thinner cords of different colors, each cord being knotted in divers ways and each color having its own significance. Red strands stood for soldiers, yellow for gold, white for silver, green for corn, and so forth. While a single knot meant ten, 
Two single knots meant 20. Double knots, 100. Two double knots, 200. Each town had its own officer, whose special function was to tie and interpret kipus. They were called kipu kamayokuna, or knot officers. Compare harpe donaptai, or rope stretchers, in connection with the geometry of the Egyptians. The knot reckoning is in use among the Puna herdsmen of the Peruvian plateau. On the first strand of the kipu, they registered the bulls. On the second, the cows. Then again, they divide into milch cows, those that are dry. The next strands register the calves, and next the sheep, and so forth, while other strands record the produce. The different colors of the cords and the twisting of the knots giving the key to the several purposes. The Paloni Indians of California have a similar practice, concerning whom Dr. Hoffman reports that each year a certain number are chosen to visit the settlement of San Gabriel to sell native blankets. Every Indian sending goods provided the salesman with two cords made of twisted hair or wool, on one of which was tied a knot for every wheel received, and on another a knot for every blanket sold. When the sum reached ten reals, or one dollar, a double knot was made. Upon the return of the salesman, each person selected from the lot his own goods, by which he would at once perceive the amount due, and also the number of blankets for which the salesman was responsible. Hawaiian tax gatherers kept accounts of the accessible property through the island on lines of cordage from four to five hundred fathoms long. A method of keeping the accounts of the British exchequer before the use of writing paper was by means of tally sticks. These were of willow, about eight or ten inches long. Notches were cut, a deep one for a pound, a small one for a shilling. The stick was then sawed in half in two near one end and split down to this cut, each half bearing a record of the notches. The shorter piece was given to the depositor, and the bank retained the longer. A great mass of these sticks was still in the basement of the Parliament houses when it was decided to burn them in 1834. Samuel S. Dale describes the bonfire. He says, A pile of little notched sticks bearing strange-looking inscriptions in abbreviated Latin and Old English script, the evidence of thrift for a thousand years, Tokens of all the motives that prompt men and women to save, love, hate, greed and sacrifice, hope and fear, frugality and fraud, the process of honest toil and of crime, held for ages that the missing pieces carried away by successive generations might be redeemed, their presence a mute evidence of the blasted hopes of depositors, for a thousand years, they were fed steadily to the flames from early morning until a few minutes before seven o'clock in the evening of Thursday, October 16, 1834, when suddenly a furnace flue overheated by the unusual fire started a blaze in a room above, and in a few hours the House of Lords and the House of Commons were in ashes, along with nearly all the wo old wooden tally sticks and all the basic standards of weight and measure for the British Empire. A few of the old tally sticks were saved. When the savage, in his first dim gropings for truth, recognizes that two objects are more than one, the first step is taken toward the formation of the number concept. That a long pause ensued before the next step was taken is evidenced by a number of cases, cited by various writers, of tribes whose only number words are for one and many, or one, two, and and many. This word for many plays the same role in the language of the savage as infinity. In ordinary parlance, a number inexpressively or inconceivably great. The growth of expressibility of number may be compared with the ever-widening ripples when a pebble is dropped into still water, the outer ripple representing the upper bound of conceivable number. All the region beyond would be, in the language of the savage, many. The Hindu number system is the first ever devised which has no outer bound. This fact has led to a more precise use of the word infinity 
in modern mathematical terminology. The possibility of the Hindu system are well illustrated by the answers of the celebrated Archimedean cattle problems. These answers, 10 in number, were composed of 206,545 figures each. Such a number, if printed in small pica type, would be nearly a quarter of a mile in length. The ability to form a definite conception of a number grows with intelligence, but in the presence of numbers of such magnitude, it is opportune to ask what relation exists between the power to conceive the number and the ability to represent it. There seems to have been a curious crossing over of the two. The poverty of the aboriginal language should not be taken as evidence of inability to use large numbers. It simply means that the verbal expression paused for a longer time after the number two than did the number sense. Instances are given of peoples whose number names do not go beyond ten, but who reckon as far as one hundred. The number sense grows along with other mental development, but has not kept step with the verbal and symbolic expression of large numbers. It is questionable if the number 10,000 stands for a distinct conception if it is measured by units. One obtains an idea of such a number only by grouping it, say, into a hundred hundreds. There are several distinct steps in the formation of a number system. The recognition of increase by adding, in succession, single objects to a group, counting, attaching a number name to the group counted, as three sticks, such a number which the object or unit is named is called a concrete number. The final separation of the number notion from the objects counted or abstraction. One asks how many sticks in the group and the answer is three, an abstract number. The indication of the number named by a symbol, the choosing of a method of grouping, and finally the perfection of the system by arrangements and combinations of the number words and symbols. It is a long way from the mokenam, one, uruhu, many, of the bokokudos. In the modern notion of number, of the mathematician, the class of all similar classes. Number, in its primitive sense, answers the question, how many? It is a pure abstraction which results from counting. Cardinal number tells how many of the group as seven trees, while the ordinal number of any one of the objects indicates the position of the particular object in the series, as the sixth tree. These two ideas are equally fundamental, each being derivable from the other. Counting is simply pairing off, or in mathematical language, establishing a one-to-one -one correspondence between the individuals of a group of objects counted as pebbles, the fingers, marks or scores, number names, or the symbols for these number names. In the first stages, it would be comparatively easy to invent a word and a symbol for each number. But as the need for larger numbers grew, some method of grouping became necessary. In Problemata, attributed to Aristotle, the following discussion takes place. Why do all men, barbarians as well as Greeks, numerate up to ten, and not to any other number, as two, three, four, or five, and then repeating one and five, two and five, as they do one and ten, two and ten, not counting beyond the tens, from which they again begin to repeat. For each of the numbers which proceeds is one or two and then some other, but they enumerate, however, still making the number ten their limit. For they manifestly do it not by chance, but always. The truth is, what men do upon all occasions, and always, they do not from chance, but from some law of nature. Whether is it because 10 is a perfect number, for it contains all the species of number, the even, the odd, the square, the cube, the linear, the plane, the prime, the composite, or is it because the number 10 is a principle? For the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, when added together, produce the number 10. 
or is it because of 10 numbers in continued proportion? Four cubic numbers are consummated, out of which the Pythagoreans say that the universe is constituted. Or is it because all men from the first have 10 fingers? As therefore men have counters of their own by nature, by this set they enumerate all other things. Dr. Conant gives an illustration which typifies the beginnings of the grouping of the number concept. More than a century ago, he says, travelers in Madagascar observed a curious but simple mode of asserting the number of soldiers in an army. Each soldier was made to go through a passage in the presence of the principal chiefs, and as he went through, a pebble was dropped on the ground. This continued until a heap of ten was obtained, when one was set aside and a new heap begun. Upon the completion of ten heaps, a pebble was set aside to indicate one hundred, and so on until the entire army had been numbered. That man carries in the fingers the natural counting machine is shown by the fact that the great majority of number systems have been based on five, ten, or twenty. The typical case of a number system is that of the Zuni scale. Arithmetic has been defined as the science of number and the art of computation. This twofold nature of the subject is due to the fact that the Greeks divided the subject into arithmetic proper, which is the science of numbers, a subject for the philosopher, and logistics, or computation, which was to be taught to the slave. Notation and numeration are respectively the writing and reading of numbers. A theory of the building up of a number system is given by Dean Peacock in his article on arithmetic in the Encyclopedia Metropolitana. The discovery of the mode of breaking up numbers into classes, the units in each class increasing in decouple proportion, would lead very naturally to the invention of a nomenclature for numbers thus resolved, which is simple and comprehensive. By giving names to the first natural numbers, or digits, i.e. the first nine numbers, called digits, from counting on the fingers, and also to the units of each class in the ascending series by ten, we shall be enabled by combining the names of the digits with those of the units possessing local or representative value to express in words any number whatsoever. Thus the number resolved by means of counters in the manner indicated by figure 2 would be expressed by 7, 6, 10s, 500s, 4,000s, or inverting the order and making slight changes required by the existing form of the language by 4,567. The successive columns A, B, C, D, are called orders. The number of ones in any order required to make one of the next higher order, in this case 10, is called the radix, scale, or base of the system. In the above information, when 9 have been put in column A, the 10th would be placed in column B, and the 9 removed from column A. Such a system is called the decimal, or 10 times system. One of the earliest devices for reckoning consists of a board strewn with sand on which parallel lines were drawn with the finger. These lines fulfill the same office as the compartments above marked A, B, C, D. Upon the lines the counters were laid. This reckoning board was called an abacus with an old semantic word avac meaning sand. The development of the abacus from the sandboard to the swan pan of the Chinese and the counting frame of the kindergarten is to be considered in connection with reckoning. It was the custom of the Romans to drive a nail in the temple of Minerva for each year. When, as with counters, the number of marks exceeded the power of the eye to grasp, at a glance, grouping was used. The simplest method of writing a number is by a mark or stroke for each unit, or one in the number as stroke, 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 for seven. The stroke was universally used by primitive peoples as a symbol for one. 
the drawing of a tomb board of Wabojig, a celebrated war chief who died on Lake Superior about 1793, shows this clearly. His totem, the reindeer, is reversed. The seven strokes number the war parties he led. The three upright strokes symbolize wounds received in battle. The horned head tells of a desperate fight with a moose. The scoring of each fifth, one counted, may be regarded as the second step in the development of a satisfactory number symbolism. Such a method of recording succeeding events is not uncommon today. The thresher often so marks each stack of grain as it leaves the machine, and in loading and unloading vessels it is frequently the mode used by the tallyman. Thus, 22 would be written, stroke, 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 cross, 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 stroke, stroke. Of the numerous systems of notation which have been devised, three are distinctive from their mode of formation, from their logical completion, and from their extended use, the Greek, the Roman, and the Hindu sometimes incorrectly called the Arabic. Consider a number formed by counters, placed in the various compartments, A, B, C, D. The largest number of counters that may be put in any one compartment is nine. That is, there are nine counters for each compartment. The Greeks adopted as their number symbols the letters of their alphabet in order. The first nine letters for nine numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, of column A. The next nine letters for the numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, of column B. As the alphabet consisted of but 24 letters, to fill out column C, three obsolete letters were interpolated. In the accompanying scheme, taken from Gal's History of Greek Mathematics, the star letters are those not belonging to the alphabet. The limit of the system with letters of the alphabet alone is 999. When it became necessary to write larger numbers, a stroke like an inverted prime was put before and usually somewhat below the letter, as seen in the number 1000, to increase the value of the letter 1000 fold. For 10,000, a new letter was used, the M, the first letter of Murid or mirrored. The symbols were always written in descending order, from left to right. The largest number now possible in the Greek notation is 9999999. The use of the alphabet as numerals seems to date from about 500 BC. The Greek mode of writing fractions is quite simple, the denominator being written over the numerator, and the numerator is written with one accent followed by the denominator twice, with two accents. As kappa alpha over iota zeta, or iota zeta accent, kappa alpha accent accent, kappa alpha accent accent. If the numerator is unity, it is omitted. One thirty second would be written lambda beta accent, or lambda beta accent accent. Special signs were sometimes used for one-half, two-thirds, addition, and subtraction. Archimedes devised a plan by which the Greek number system might be prolonged indefinitely, and which has been thought by some to contain the germ of the modern notation of logarithm. In a pamphlet entitled Samites, in the Latin Arenarius, the Sand Reckoner, addressed to Galen, king of Syracuse, says Gao, Archimedes begins by saying that some people think the sand cannot be counted while others maintain that if it can, still no arithmetical expression can be found for the number. Now I will endeavor, he goes on, to show you by geometrical proofs which you can follow that the numbers which have been named by us are included in my letter addressed to Zeuxippus are sufficient to exceed not only the number of a sandbox as large as the whole earth, but of one which is as large as the universe. You understand, of course, that most astronomers mean by the universe the sphere of which the center is the center of the earth and the radius is a line drawn 
from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun. Assume the perimeter of the Earth to be 3 million stadia, and in the following cases, take extreme measurements. The diameter of the Earth is larger than that of the Moon, and that of the Sun is larger than that of the Earth. The diameter of the Sun is 30 times that of the Moon, and is larger than the side of a chiligon inscribed in a great circle of the sphere of the universe. It follows from these measurements that the diameter of the universe is less than 10,000 times that of the Earth and is less than 10 billion stadia. Now suppose that 10,000 grains of sand, not less than one poppy seed, and the breadth of a poppy seed, not less than one fortieth of a finger breadth. Further using the ordinary nomenclature, we have numbers up to a myriad myriads, a hundred million. Let these be called the first order, and let a myriad myriads be a unit of the second order, and let us reckon units, tens, etc., of the second order up to a myriad myriads, and let a myriad myriads of the second order be a unit of the third order, and so on, ad lib. If numbers be arranged in a geometrical series, of which, 1 is the first term and 10 is the radix. The first 8 terms of such a series will belong to the first order, the next 8 to the second order, and so on, calling these orders octads and using these numbers following the rule that spheres are to one another in the triplicate ratio of their diameters. Archimedes ultimately finds that the number of grains of sand which the sphere of the universe would hold is less than a thousand myriads or ten millions of the eighth octad. This number would be expressed in our notation as one with 63 ciphers annexed. There seems to have been no attempt to apply this method further, the ordinary system being sufficient for the needs of the time. The main principle underlying the Roman system was to prove a symbol for each column or order, the symbol being repeated for each unit in the order. The following reconstruction of the Roman process is made for the purpose of comparison with the other two systems and is not offered as a probable historical course. For each unit of column A, a Roman I was used, it being the nearest to the primitive stroke or score. X was used for the second order, C for the order of hundreds, and M for thousands. These are called unit letters. So far, the gap from i to 10 is too great, it being necessary to write i nine times for nine. A halfway symbol was then provided for each interval, v for 5, l for 50, and d for 500. These are called half-unit letters. It is altogether probable that the half-unit letter is a relic of the pause in finger reckoning when the first hand was completed. Many of the decimal systems still preserve this trace of a quinary base. The half-unit symbol may have arisen in connection with the use of the reckoning board. Placing counters on the spaces as well as upon the lines as the notes of the musical staff. Figure 5 indicates the method of writing 7868 on the sandboard. It is very probable that the use of the space is, was derived from the half-unit letter rather than in the reverse order. So far, the system is built upon an additive basis, the value of a symbol of equal or less value written at the right of a given symbol being added to the value of the given symbol. Thus, if 20 is to be written, another x is written at the right of the x, for 10, as xx, while 16 would be written xvi. At this stage, 4 would be written iiii. -I a form still to be seen on a clock face. A still further improvement, lessening the number of symbols, was the adoption of a subtractive principle. This means that a symbol of lesser value written at the left of a given symbol has its value taken from the value of the greater symbol. In this way, 4 would be written IV. Two facts are here noticeable. The subtractive principle need be used but twice in each column. In the column A, for example, in writing 4 and 9, 3 might be written IIV, with no advantage over III. 
a half unit letter is never used in the subtractive sense. That is, L is used for 50 rather than LC. The third and final step was the adoption of the multiplicative principle, also seen in the Greek notation. In the Roman scheme, it appeared as a dash or vinculum, drawn over the letter to increase its value a thousandfold, as in figure 5. A V with a stroke across the top indicates 5,000. The Roman mind was not of scientific cast, and one would scarcely expect to find the number system worked out to logical perfection. In fact, there is a decided lack of uniformity in the manner of writing numbers used by various Roman authors. The following set of rules, compiled by Dr. French, seems to be the logical working out of the system. Affirmative rules. 1. The value of a unit letter is repeated with every repetition of the letter. 2. The value of a letter written at the right of a letter of equal or greater value is added to that value. 3. The value of a unit letter at the left of the next higher unit, or half unit letter, is subtracted from the value of that letter. 4. A vinculum placed over a letter increases its value a thousandfold. Negative rules. 1. A half unit letter is never repeated. 2. A half-unit letter is never written before a letter of greater value. 3. A unit letter is never written before a letter of greater value except the next higher half-unit and unit letters, i.e. 99 is never written IC. 4. The vinculum is never placed over I. 5. A letter is not to be used more than three times in any order. Little may be said of the origin of Roman numerals. It is generally supposed that the system was inherited from the Etruscans. Various and interesting have been the theories advanced to explain the choice of the symbols. One is that the I is a sort of hieroglyphic form of the extended finger, V for the hand and X for the double hand. Another theory is that the decim is related to decusire, to cut across and that the cutting across of a symbol multiplies its value by 10. Thus, I cut across is X. C is the initial letter of centum, 100. Traces of the subtractive principle have been found on brick tablets from the Temple Library of Nippur, recently deciphered by Professor Hilprech of the Babylonian Expedition of the University of Pennsylvania. These bricks probably date from about the 20th century BC. Each of the wide symbols indicated a 10, the final straight wedge a 1, the 20 and 1 being combined in a subtractive sense to give 19. The fundamental principle of assigning a symbol to each column destined the Roman system of notation to ultimate disuse. By this principle, an indefinitely large number would mean an indefinitely large number of columns and hence an indefinitely large number of symbols. No difference how many symbols were in use, it would be easy to specify a number which could not be written. Such a system must finally give way to another with no such limitations. End of section 1section 2 of the science history of the universe volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the science history of the universe volume 8 edited by francis watt wheeler number part 2 chapter 1 number part 2 the Babylonian number system was based on 60, both for whole numbers and fractions. The possible explanation of the sexagesimal system is that the year was reckoned as 360 days, thus dividing the circle into 360 parts. And they were probably aware of the division of the circle into six parts by stepping off the radius six times on the circumference, and by so doing arriving at 60 parts of the circle in each part stepped off. 60 proved to be particularly favorable base. Being divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, and 12, a large mass of information as to the mathematical accomplishments 
has recently been revealed by Professor Hilprech, who has examined more than 50,000 cuneiform inscriptions from the Temple Library of Nippur. The Babylonians had a strange custom of deriving their numbers from a large number, which may be called a basal number. This basal number is 12,960,000, or 60 to the fourth. This number is, according to the theory of Professor Hilprech, the famous number of Plato, Republic, Book 8. This number is constructed from 216, the minimal number of days of gestation in the humankind, and is called the Lord of Better and Worse Births. If the 216 be interpreted as days together with 12,960,000, the latter number gives 36,000 years, the great platonic year which was the length of the Babylonian cycle. Thus implied that Plato's famous number and the idea of its influence upon the destiny of man originated in Babylonia. The Aztec system of numeration had the score for its basis. There were special signs for the first five numerals, for 20, for its square, 400, and for the cube, 8,000. Certain combinations of signs symbolized the other numerals, the Chinese had, from earliest times, constructed a system of numerals similar, in many respects, to what the Romans probably inherited from their Pelasgic ancestors. It is only to be observed that the Chinese mode of writing is the reverse of the Arabic, and that beginning at the top of the leaf it descends in parallel columns to the bottom, proceeding, however, from right to left, as practiced by most of the Oriental nations. Instead of the vertical lines used by the Romans, therefore, horizontal ones are found in the Chinese notation. Thus, one is represented by a horizontal stroke with a barb termination, two by a pair of such strokes. The mark for four has four strokes with a flourish. Three horizontal strokes and two vertical ones form the mark for five, and other symbols exhibit the successive strokes abbreviated so far as nine, 10 is figured by a horizontal stroke, crossed with a vertical score, to show that the first rank is completed, while 100 has two vertical scores connected by three short horizontal ones. The Hindu system was based on the principle of assigning a symbol to each of the nine numbers of the first column, 1 for 1, 2 for 2, 3 for 3, 4 for 4, 5 for 5, 6 for 6, 7 for 7, 8 for 8, and 9 for 9. The Hindu notation may be reconstructed as follows. It requires to write the number pictured in the accompanying cut. There are 4 in the A column, or 4 1s, 3 in the B column, or 3 tens, 5 in the C column, or 5 hundreds, 1 in the D column, or 1,000, and 4 in the E column, or 4 ten thousands. Using the symbols above, 4 is written in the A compartment, 3 in the B compartment, etc. So long as a box arrangement is used with the compartments named, the method would be considered complete. In fact, the above number could be written just as well without the cells, as 41,534. And the order for which any symbol stands would be determined by its position with reference to the others. This is called the place value property, and is the important feature of the system. But one thing is lacking. The method fails when any column is empty. Suppose columns A and C above to be vacant. There would be then four E's, one D, three B's, and no A's or nor C's. This could be written in cells but could not be written without some scheme of labeling the columns. To avoid this difficulty, a new symbol, cipher, was invented. It was called cipher from an Arabic word meaning empty. The above number may now be written 4, 1, cipher, 3, cipher. In the Hindu notation, each symbol is in addition to its intrinsic value, an acquired value resulting from its position. Thus the 3, standing in the second place, has the value 30, 3 being its intrinsic value, and the 10 being its acquired or place value. 
Thus, both the multiplicative and additive principles are involved in place value. 325 is 3 times 100 plus 2 times 10 plus 5. Writing two symbols, now called figures, side by side, adds them after the left-hand figure has been multiplied by 10. This is readily seen that there is no limit to the number of columns that may be used without increasing the number of symbols. That is, the Hindu notation begins at units column and may be carried indefinitely to the left. The smallest number that may be written so far is unity or one. The two final steps in the perfecting of the system, the invention of the decimal point, which permits of the writing of numbers indefinitely small, striking off the right-hand barrier, and the discovery of the exponential notation and logarithms, which facilitate computations will be considered later, together with the long struggle between the Roman and Hindu systems for supremacy. The origin of the Hindu notation is shrouded in mystery. It is custom for Orientals to attribute any great discovery or invention to the direct revelation of the gods. Professor Hilbrecht gives an illustration of this trait. According to Barossus, a Babylonian priest who lived sometime between 330 and 250 BC, the origin of all human knowledge goes back to divine revelation on primeval times. In the first year, there made its appearance from a part of the Eurythian Sea, which bordered upon Babylonia, a living being endowed with reason, who was called Oanes. According to this tradition, confirmed by Apollodorus, the whole body of this creature was like that of a fish, and it had a, under a fish's head another or human head, and feet similar to those of a man subjoined to the fish's tail, and it also had a human voice, and a representation of him is preserved even to this day. This being, it is said, in the daytime, used to converse with men, without, however, taking any food. He instructed men in the knowledge of writing, of sciences, and every kind of art. He taught them how to settle towns, to construct temples, to introduce laws, and to apply principles of geometrical knowledge. He showed them how to sow and how to gather fruit. In short, he instructed men in everything pertaining to the culture of life. From that time, nothing else has been added by way of improvement. But when the sun is set, this being Oanes used to plunge again into the sea and abide all night in the deep, for he was amphibious. Professor Florian Kajori thus sums up the leading conclusion due to Wopek as the historical development of the Hindu numeral system. The Hindus possessed the nine numerals, without the zero or cipher, as early as the second century after Christ. It is known that about that time a lively commercial intercourse was carried on between India and Rome by way of Alexandria. There arose an interchange of ideas, as well as merchandise. The Hindus caught glimpses of Greek thought, and the Alexandrians received ideas on philosophy and science from the East. The nine numerals without the zero thus found their way to Alexandria, where they may have attracted the attention of the Neo-Pythagoreans. From Alexandria they spread to Rome, thence to Spain and the western part of Africa. Between the 2nd and 8th centuries, the nine characters in India underwent change in shape. A prominent Arabic writer, Al-Biruni, died 1038, who was in India during many years, remarks that the shape of Hindu numerals and letters differed in different localities, and that when the Hindu notation was transmitted to the Arabs, the latter selected from the various forms the most suitable. But before the East Arabs thus received the notation, it had been perfected by the invention of the zero and the application of the principle of position. Perceiving the great utility of the Columbus egg, the zero, the West Arabs borrowed this apoch-making symbol from those in the East, but retained the old forms of the nine numerals which they had previously received from Rome. The reason for this retention may have been a disinclination to unnecessary change, coupled perhaps with a desire to be contrary to their political enemies in the East. The West Arabs 
remembered the Hindu origin of the old forms, the so-called gubar, or dust minerals. After the 8th century, the numerals in India underwent further changes, and assumed the greatly modified forms of the modern Davanagari numerals. Professor Moritz Cantor recently expressed the opinion that the use of the zero was probably due to the Babylonians, 1700 BC. There are two methods of reading numbers in general use, in both of which the orders are grouped, beginning with the first order, or the order of units. In the French method, each group consists of three orders, such a group being called a period. The names of the first three orders, being with the lowest, are units, tens, and hundreds. These names are applied to the three orders in each period, followed by the name of the period. The names of the first twelve periods are follow. One, units, two, thousands, three, millions, four, billions, five, trillions, six, quadrillions, seven quintillions, eight sextillions, nine septillions, ten octillions, eleven nonillions, twelve decillions. In the English method, each period consists of six orders. Named units, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and hundred thousands. The names of the periods follow. One, units, two, millions, three, billions, four, trillions, five quadrillions, six quintillions. In both systems, the number names are read in descending order from left to right, and in all cases, compounds are formed in the same way, except in the interval from 10 to 20. Professor Brooks in Philosophy of Arithmetic gives the following account of number naming. A single thing is called one. One and one more are two. Two and one are three. And in the same manner, we obtain four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And then adding one more and collecting in a group, we have ten. Now, regarding the ten as a single thing and proceeding to the principled state, we have one and ten, two and ten, three and ten, and so on up to ten and ten, which we call two tens. When we arrive at ten tens, we call this a new group, a hundred. This is the actual method by which numbers were originally named. But unfortunately, perhaps, for the learner and for science, some of these names have been so modified and abbreviated by the changes incident to use that with several of the smaller numbers at least, the principle has been so far disguised as not to be generally perceived. If, however, the ordinary language of arithmetic be carefully examined, it will be seen that the principle has been preserved even if disguised so as not always to be immediately apparent. Instead of 1 and 10, we have substituted 11, derived from an expression formerly supposed to mean 1 left after 10, but now believed to be a contraction of the Saxon endelefen, or Gothic einlif. And instead of 2 and 10, we use the expression meaning 2 left after 10, but now regarded as arising from the Saxon twelif, or Gothic twalif. In the numbers following 12, the stream of speech running day by day has worn away a part of the primary form and left the words that now exist. Thus, supposing that the original expression to be 3 and 10, if we drop the conjunction, we have 310. Changing the 10 to teen and the 3 to thir, we have 13. In a similar manner, 20 is contracted of two tens. It is to be noticed that Professor Brooks has always used the form 2 and 10 rather than 10 and 2. That such use leading to the forms from 10 to 20 is the exception rather than the rule is seen when it is recalled that from 20 on the larger number is always read first. The word million seems to have been used first by Marco Polo. During the next 300 years, it was used by writers in several senses and not until the 16th century did it succeed in finally securing its place in the number system. Billion in the English system is equivalent to 1,000 French billions, or a trillion. An example will suffice to show the two methods of reading a number. Thus, 4, 3, 6, 7, 9, 2, 5, 4, 3, 
0.896578, according to the French method, is read 436,792,543,896,578, while the English method would be 436,792,543,896,578. The primitive form of the abacus was a board strewn with sand, upon which lines were drawn and pebbles were used as counters. On the Egyptian abacus, the lines were at right angles to the operator, and Herodotus states that they calculate with pebbles by moving the hand from right to left, while the Greeks move it from left to right, thus indicating that the unit's column was taken with the Egyptians on the extreme left. The varying values of the counters, when changed from one column to another, is referred to in the comparison of Diogenes Laertius. A person friendly with tyrants is like the stone in computation, which signifies now much, now little, which recalls Carolyle's ranking of men with the pieces on a chessboard. A single example of a Greek abacus is extant in the form of a marble table discovered on the island of Solamis in 1846 and now preserved in Athens. This table is five feet long and two and a half feet wide, and the lines which are parallel to the operator are in a good state of preservation. Difficulty of calculation with Roman numerals rendered necessary the use of the abacus, inherited from the Greeks and in turn the ease with which the ordinary computations were performed with its aid prevented the perfection or inventing of a usable system of notation. Horace alludes to the practice of boys marching to school with the abacus and boxes of pebbles suspended from the left arm. Quo pero magnis exentorionibus orito levo suspensi loculos tabula lamci lacerto. In the time of the greatest Roman luxury, the counters were of ivory, silver, and gold. The more serviceable form was developed under Roman usage, in which the table or board was replaced by a thin metal plate and grooves cut entirely through, in which were metal buttons, which could be slid from one end of the groove to the other. If at one end, a button registered one in that groove, if at the other, it was valueless. In place of a long groove containing nine buttons, a shorter groove registered four, and still shorter one immediately above had a value of five. At the right of the unit's column were two short columns in which could be registered twelfths, the Roman fraction still preserved in name in ounce and inch. Several of these metal abaci are to be found in museums. Another form of abacus, still in general use in the Orient, is that of a frame across which wires are strung, upon which are movable beads. This is the swan pan of the Chinese and the tokchu of the Russians. In 1812, the abacus was carried from Russia to France in the form of the counting frame, as a device for teaching number in primary work, and is now found in all kindergartens. A slight evidence of belief in the cultural epoch theory that the training of the child mind should follow the steps in the mental development of the race. At the decadence of Rome, the Roman notation and abacus reckoning remained as an inheritance to Central Europe. The Arabs being in possession of the Hindu numerals carried them to Spain, and they were used in the commercial towns bordering the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Some of the more aspiring youths of England and France journeyed to Spain to acquire the learning of the Greeks in Hindus, which had been preserved and cultivated assiduously by the Moors. Others, merchantmen of Italy, perceived the advantage gained in the use of these numerals in the Phenocitian towns, and they in turn carried the knowledge home. Of the former who visited Spain was Gerbert, afterward Pope Sylvester II. Gerbert's abacus was of leather and contained 27 columns. In place of the old counters, new ones of horn were used, upon each of which one of the first nine numerals was written. Thus, the first step in the use of the Hindu numerals was taken. Of the latter, merchantman of Italy was Leonardo of Pisa, who in 1202 wrote a treatise on mathematics called 
Liber Abakai. It begins thus. The nine figures on the Hindus are nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. With these nine figures, and this sign, cipher, which in Arabic is called cipher, any number may be written. The long struggle of 500 years for supremacy between the line reckoning, or abacus, and the Hindu numerals began. In one of the cuts is seen a page of line reckoning from an early English textbook, The Grounds of Artes, by Robert Record, 1558. This work, which ran through at least 28 editions, is in the form of a dialogue between master and pupil. The following extract concerns the difficulty the pupil has in multiplying by a fraction, as to why the product should be less than the number multiplied. The master explains the definition of multiplication, but the scholar is not satisfied, and the master says, Master, if I multiply more than one, the thing is increased. If I take it but once, it is not changed. And if I take it less than once, it cannot be as much as before. Then, seeing that a fraction is less than one, if I multiply by a fraction, it follows that I do take it less than once. Pupil Sir, I do thank you much for this reason, and I trust that I do perceive the thing. The use of counters had not disappeared in England and Germany before the middle of the 17th century. Various methods of finger reckoning have been developed and are commonly found in the older arithmetics. The accompanying cut is from records The Ground of Artists, 1558, and gives a general idea of this practice. According to Pliny, the image of Janus, or the sun, was cast with the fingers so bent as to indicate 365 days. Some have thought the Proverbs 3, 16, length of days in her right hand, alludes to such a form of expressing numbers. An interesting illustration is given by Leslie. The Chinese have contrived a very neat and simple kind of digital signs for denoting numbers, greatly superior to that of the Romans. Since each figure has three joints, let the thumbnail of the other hand touch these joints in succession, passing up one side of the finger, down the middle, and again up the other side, thus giving nine marks applicable to the decimal notation. On the little finger, these signify units. On the next, tens. On the next, hundreds, etc. The merchants of China are accustomed, it is said, to conclude bargains with each other by help of these signs and to conceal the pantomime from the knowledge of bystanders. The Korean schoolboy carries to school a bag of counting bones, each about five inches long and somewhat thinner than the ordinary lead pencil. A box of square sticks four inches in length and about a half an inch square, called sangi, is used in a very ingenious fashion by the Chinese for the solution of algebraic equations. The form of reckoning board adopted in the Middle Ages has left some words and customs. Fitz Nightsgerald, writing about the middle of the 12th century, describes the board as a table of 10 feet long and 5 feet wide, with a ledge or border, and was surrounded by a bench or bank for the officers. From this bank comes the modern word bank as a place of money changing. The table was covered after the term of Easter each year with a new black cloth divided by a set of white lines about a foot apart and across another set, which divided the table into squares. This table was called skakarium, which formerly meant chessboard, and which is the term exchequer, the court of revenue. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chapter 2. Calculation. Part 1. Under the term logistic, the Greeks treated what is now ordinarily termed computation or calculation, the latter word coming from a Latin word meaning pebble, inasmuch as the reckoning was done with counters or pebbles. Calculation is the process of subjecting numbers to certain operations, 
now to be defined. There are six fundamental operations in arithmetic, all growing out of the first. Formerly, these were differently classified, sometimes as high as nine being considered, the other three being special cases or complications of the fundamental six. These six operations are divided into two groups, the direct operations, of which there are three, and the inverses, each of which has the effect of undoing one of the former three. 1. Direct addition. Inverse subtraction. 2. Direct multiplication. Inverse division. 3. Direct involution. Inverse evolution. When one subject is put with a group of like objects, forming thus a new group, having one or more object than the original group, the process is said to be that of addition, and is indicated by the plus sign. This sign appears in a work by Grammateus in 1514, and in 1517 in a book by Gillis van der Hock. Thus, one apple added to two apples gives three apples, or with abstract numbers, two plus one equals three. The objects or numbers added are called addends, or summands, and the resulting group or number is the sum. The ending end, or and, so common in mathematical terminology, is Latin present passive participle. In this case, addends is to be translated literally the being added numbers. Addition is, in its simplest form, the putting together or uniting of two numbers. And all additions of this nature may be broken up into a series of repetitions of the fundamental process of increasing a number by unity. Thus, if it be desired to add three apples to five apples, it may be done at a single step, or at three partial steps, which may be indicated thus. Five apples plus one apple equals six apples, six apples plus one apple equals seven apples, seven apples plus one apple equals eight apples, or five apples plus three apples equals eight apples. The three steps resulting the same as the single step, given last, which justifies the statement above that addition rests upon the fundamental process of increasing a number by unity. Like numbers are those in which the same unit is used. Seven apples and three apples are like numbers, as also seven and three. Four trees and nine stones are unlike numbers, as are five ones and seven tens. That is, in a number, 435, written in the Hindu notation, 4 in hundreds order, is not like 3 in tens order, nor like 5 in units order. It is fundamental that only like numbers may be added. Before 3 tens is added to 5 ones, the 3 tens must be changed into 30 ones. This is a very simple matter, only being, as it were, a shift in thought and it accounts in a great measure for the simplicity of the operations with Hindu numerals. In 435, the four may be thought of, in turn, as 400, or as 40 tens, or as 400 ones. The place value feature permits of numbers being immediately broken up into parts, and these parts treated one at a time. Thus, in addition, like orders are written in the same column, and the columns are added separately. This process is illustrated in the following example. 432 plus 265 equals 400 plus three tens plus two ones plus two hundredths plus six tens plus five ones equals 697, or six hundredths nine tens, and seven ones. The sum of the ones, five plus two equals seven, is first found and written below the column of ones, and the other orders are added in succession. A difficulty arises when the sum of a column is greater than nine, the largest number that may be written in a column. An example will make it clear. 387 plus 256 equals 300 plus eight tens, plus seven ones, plus two hundred, plus five tens, plus six ones, equals six hundred and forty-three, 
or five hundredths plus thirteen tens plus thirteen ones, or five hundred plus fourteen tens plus three ones, or six hundred plus four tens plus three ones. The thirteen ones is changed to one ten and three ones. The three is written in ones column, and the one ten is added or carried to the tens column. The fourteen tens is treated in a similar way. Addition obeys the commutative law. That is, the addition may be performed in any order. Five plus three equals three plus five. It is immaterial whether the three is added to the five or the five is added to the three. The associative law is also valid for addition. If five and seven are to be added to four, it does not matter whether the five be added and then the seven or the five and seven first united and then added to the four. This is expressed by means of parentheses. The parentheses means that the numbers within are first united. Four plus five plus seven equals four plus, in parentheses, five plus seven. If two numbers are added, the sum is a number. This statement seems like mere verbiage, but will take on meaning when considered in the light of the other operations. Subtraction is the inverse operation of addition. Addition is putting one number with another to form a third, and subtraction is taking one number from another to form a third. If addition has been stated in the form, given two numbers to find their sum, subtraction will be stated, given the sum of two numbers and one of them to find the other. The sum of two numbers is eight, and one of them is five. What is the other? Would be solved by taking five from eight, leaving three. Subtraction is indicated by the minus sign. The number taken away is called the subtrahend, and the number from which the subtrahend is taken is named the minuend. The resulting number is called remainder, or difference, depending on which of the two phases of subtraction is considered. These two points of view may be brought out by concrete examples. If A has $10 and pays out $7, how many dollars has he remaining? In this example, the $7, or subtrahend, was originally a part of the minuend, $10, and is taken away. The $3 is then called remainder. Again, if A has $10 and B has $7, how many dollars must B earn to have as many dollars as A? Here, the $10 of A and the $7 of B are distinct numbers, and the resulting number is called the difference. In subtraction, the subtrahend is written before the minuend, with like orders in the same column. Each column is subtracted separately. 476 minus 263 is equal to 4 hundredths plus 7 tens plus 6 ones minus 2 hundredths plus 6 tens plus 3 ones equals 213, or 2 hundredths plus 1 ten plus 3 ones. Two methods are in general use in the case that the number in an order of the subtrahend is too large to be taken from the number in the same order of the minuend. Both methods are inherited from the Hindus, having come down from the earliest printed textbooks and seem to be of about equal difficulty. The method of decomposition, or borrowing, consists of taking one unit from the next higher order, changing it to the order in question, adding to the number in that order, which makes the subtraction possible. 700 plus two tens plus four units equals 700 plus one ten plus 14 units equals 600 plus 11 tens plus 14 units. 724 minus 269 equals 455. 600 plus 11 tens plus 14 units minus two hundredths plus six tens plus nine units equals four hundredths and five tens and five units. The method of equal additions is based on the fact that the same number may be added to both minuend and subtrahend without changing the value of the difference. That is, 724 minus 269 equals 724 plus 100 plus 10 minus, in parentheses, 724 plus 100 plus 10 minus, 
in parentheses, 269 plus 100 plus 10. The 10 in the minuend is thought of as 10 ones, while in the subtrahend it is necessary to think of it as 110, similarly for the 100. The example used above is worked by means of equal additions and will show the transformations involved. 724 minus 269 is replaced by 724 plus 100 plus 10 minus 269 plus 100 plus 10. 724 plus 10 tens plus 10 ones equals in the hundreds column 7 plus in the tens column 2 plus 10 plus in the ones column 4 plus 10 which equals 7 hundreds 12 tens 14 ones 269 plus 100 plus 110 is under the hundreds column 2 plus 1 plus under the tens column 6 plus 1 plus under the ones column 9 or 3 hundreds 7 tens 9 ones resulting in 455. In use with the first method, it may be said 724 minus 269, 9 from 14 is 5, 6 from 11 is 5, 2 from 6 is 4. With the second method, 9 from 14 is 5, 7 from 12 is 5, 3 from 7 is 4. Another mode of thinking of subtraction is called the Austrian method or the method of making change, that the greater portion of subtractions in the business world is concerned with making change, has led to a wide use of the method in the schoolroom. It consists in building to the subtrahend until the minuend is reached. That it is the natural method is evidenced by the fact that it is almost invariably used by those who have never had the benefit of or have forgotten school training. 987 minus 236, one says, six and one are seven, writes one, three and five are eight, writes five, two and seven are nine, writes seven. Its introduction as a distinct method is due to Augustus de Morgan, England's foremost writer on arithmetic. It is readily seen that the subtraction does not obey the commutative law. One may subtract five from eight, but not eight from five. This leads to the query, if one number is subtracted from another, is the result always a number? The answer is yes if the minuend is larger than the subtrahend. Otherwise, that the result is not a number, such as those heretofore considered. These will be called natural numbers. If five is to be subtracted from eight, no difficulty arises, but if attempt be made to take 8 from 5, the fact arises that no such operation is possible. Such a condition brings the arithmetician face to face with one of the most important considerations in mathematics, one without which the complete structure, modern mathematics, would not be possible. It is the principle of continuity, or principle of no exception, due to Hankel. It may be stated in this form. There shall be no exception to the applicability of any operation. If the result is not found in such numbers as already belong to the system, call this result a number of a new kind and determine its properties. Suppose a man has $50 and spends $40. He has left $10. This operation is subtraction. Suppose he spends $60 instead of $40. This seems very much the same kind of an operation. It is agreed to call this subtraction also, and say that he has a debt of $10, which is a new kind of number. The natural numbers may be represented by dots with any chosen interval between them. If one goes four dots to the right from the third dot, he is at dot seven, or three plus four equals seven. If one goes five dots to the left from dot nine, he is at dot four. This going to the left is expressed by as the minus sign, or a subtraction, 9 minus 5 equals 4. But if one starts at dot 5 and attempts to go 8 dots to the left, no dot is found to mark the stopping point. The fiat of the mathematician says, let there be a dot there. 
In this manner, a series of dots is obtained extending to the opposite direction. These may be named or marked at pleasure. Call the first one at the left of one, zero, the second, minus one, the third, minus two, etc. The reason for the choice of these names is apparent. If a man has one dollar and spends one dollar, he has no dollar remaining, and the symbol for an empty place is zero. If he now spends a dollar, he is one dollar in debt, and this is the opposite of one dollar credit, and it is appropriate to mark it minus one, giving it a sign minus to distinguish it from one. If it is desired to mark the one, a plus sign, if it is desired to mark the one, a plus sign is put before it, calling all numbers to the right of zero positive numbers and those to the left negative numbers. Then five minus eight equals minus three, while eight minus five equals plus three. All the numbers, as now represented, are called whole numbers or integers. If it is agreed always to mark the ones at the left of zero, one may mark the ones at the right, or not, at will, and no confusion will arise. Zero is now a number dividing the positives from the negatives. It is called zero. The properties of a negative number, which are most important, are two. One, a negative number may be represented by a dot as far to the left of zero as the corresponding positive number is to the right. Two, a negative number destroys the effect of, or annuls, a positive number of the same value when added to it. Thus, plus 8 plus minus 5 equals plus 3. The minus 5 destroying plus 5 of the plus 8, leaving plus 3. If, in an addition example, all the add-ends are the same, as in 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 8, the form is shortened into 4 times 2 equals 8. The first number, or the multiplier, indicating how many addends were taken. The second number, showing the addend, is called the multiplicand. The St. Andrew's cross, indicating that the operation of multiplication is to be performed, was introduced by William Outred in 1631. Robert Recorde, in 1557, introduced equals as the sign of equality, which he says is a pair of parallels, or Gamova lines, of one length, thus equals, because no two things can be more equal. Multiplication is then, in essence, repeated addition. The commutative law is seen to be valid in this operation. Seven rows of three dots is the same as three rows of seven dots, or three times seven equals seven times three. Multiplication also obeys the associative law. That is, in a multiplication example, where more than two numbers, or factors as they are called when used in multiplication, are involved. These factors may be grouped in any manner. Three times seven times five equals three times, in parentheses, seven times five, equals, in parentheses, three times five times seven. The three may be multiplied by the seven, and this result, called a product, may then be multiplied by 5, or the 7 and 5 may be first multiplied, and then the 3 used, etc. A negative number multiplied by a positive gives a negative product. If in the line of dots one goes 5 dots to the left 3 times, one arrives at dot negative 15, or negative 5 times 3 equals negative 15. But if one attempts to multiply 3 by negative 5, no meaning is attached. One may perform a certain act three times, or one time, or zero times, which means that the act is not performed. But to attempt to perform an act minus 5 times is meaningless. In keeping with the principle of no exception, such an operation must be given a meaning and it is done by widening the definition of multiplication. But in doing so, the old multiplication, repeated addition, must be kept as a special case. It should be noted that this application of the principle of continuity is a purely arbitrary process. 
it may be said, since the multiplication by a negative has no meaning, simply reject it, and say it cannot be performed. Such was the usage for a long time. And had it continued, so the whole system of mathematics would have been like an unsymmetrical tree, simply allowed to develop and branch in any manner. The filling out or completing the meaningless cases is like a process of grafting, which rounds out and gives a symmetrical growth. One method of procedure here would be as follows. Negative 5 times 3 equals negative 15. And knowing that with positive numbers the commutative law holds, it is agreed to still let it be valid, from which negative 5 times 3 equals 3 times negative 5. But negative 5 times 3 equals 15. Therefore, 3 times negative 5 equals negative 15. And the conclusion is multiplication by a negative number changes the sign of the multiplicand and then multiplies it. Another and better method is to define the operation of multiplication in such a way that it will be applicable in all cases. Such a definition is the following. Multiplication is the performing that operation on the multiplicand, which, if performed on unity, or 1, produces the multiplier, to multiply 3 by negative 5. The operation upon 1, which produces negative 5, is to change the sign of 1 and repeat it 5 times. Do the same with 3. Minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, the sum of which is minus 15, as before. It will be seen that this definition of multiplication includes repeated addition, as a special case. In the same manner, it is seen that Minus 3 times minus 5 equals plus 15. Considering the four cases, plus 3 times plus 5 equals plus 15, plus 3 times minus 5 equals minus 15, minus 3 times minus 5 equals plus 15, minus 3 times plus 5 equals minus 15. It is clear that when the two signs are both positive or both negative, that is, alike, the product is positive. When they are unlike, the product is negative. The conclusion is then, in multiplication, two like signs produce positive, and two unlike signs produce negative. The plus sign is read plus, and the minus sign is read minus. One of the commonest forms of the early methods for multiplication is the tessellated multiplication, very much akin to the usage of today. Another was the quadrilateral multiplication. In this form, the partial products do not progress to the left, as in the tessellated style, and are added obliquely, as shown by the arrows. These were not drawn in the work. End of section 3. Section 4 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chapter 2. Calculation, Part 2. Lucas de Burgo called the third form lattice multiplication. The multiplicand is the outside top horizontal row the multiplier, the outside right vertical column. The product of any figure of the multiple canned by a figure of the multiplier is found in the square formed by the intersection of the column and row in which the figures are multiplied and found. Thus, 9 times 2 is found in the third column from the left, and the second row from the bottom. These products are added in the oblique columns cut out by the diagonal lines to the left. Less purely mental work is performed in this method than in either of the other two. Napier, the inventor of logarithms, made use of this method in a device called Napier's rods, which were usually of bone, and enabled the operator to perform the multiplications mechanically. From these methods was evolved the modern form, as in addition and subtraction the numbers are broken up into orders. 437 times 56 results in the first line 2622 
the second line, 2,185, added together 24,472. Four hundredths, three tens, seven ones, times five tens, and six ones, results in twenty-four hundredths, eighteen tens, forty-two ones, or twenty thousands, fifteen hundredths, and thirty-five tens, or forty-two ones is four tens plus two ones, eighteen tens plus four tens equals twenty-two tens, is two hundredths plus two tens, twenty-four hundredths plus two hundredths equals twenty-six hundredths, equals two thousand plus six hundredths. In the second row of partial products, thirty-five tens equals three hundredths and five tens. Fifteen hundred plus three hundred equals eighteen hundred equals one thousands plus eight hundredths. Twenty thousands plus one thousands equals twenty one thousands equals two ten thousands plus one thousands. The two partial products then appear thus and are added. First row, two thousand six hundred and twenty two. Second row, two thousand one hundred and eighty five, resulting in twenty four thousand four hundred and seventy two. The product of any two whole numbers is a whole number. The product of zero and any whole number is zero. The inverse operation of multiplication is called division. In its simplest form, it is repeated subtraction. If it is asked how many twos in eight, the answer would be determined by subtracting two from eight in succession as many times as possible, noting the number of times, four, as the answer. Division has two phases. One may think of finding how many times one number is contained in another, which is division proper, a species of measurement, or one may wish to divide a number into equal parts, the number of such parts being given. The form is called partition. With abstract numbers, no such distinction need be made, but with concrete numbers, it is important. The name of the number to be divided is dividend. Of the dividing number, divisor, and of the resulting number, quotient. If any part of the dividend is left undivided, it is called the remainder. There are various signs used to indicate division. 8 over 2 or 8 slash 2 may be regarded as indicating that 8 is to be divided by 2, as also 8 colon 2. The sign in general use, the division sign, was used by Dr. John Pell, 1610 to 1685, although this sign has been in use with other meaning by earlier German writers. Three methods or algorithms for what is now termed long division deserve to be mentioned. One of the epic-making works on arithmetic was written by Lucio Pacciolo, a Franciscan monk, this book, published in Venice in 1494, gives the first of these methods, the galley, or scratch method, a dividing upward. It is a relic of the old method of reckoning on sand, where the figure is scratched out as soon as used. The above example of the method is from Perbach. Thus, to divide 59,078 by 74. In the first step, 7 is divided into 59 and the quotient 7 is written. 7 sevens are 49. 49 from 59 is 10, which is written above 59. The dividend is 10 slash, now slash 078. 7 fours are 28. 28 from 100 is 72, which is written still above the last dividend. The new dividend is 7 slash slash to slash, now slash seven eight. And the division continues, each figure being scratched out as soon as used. The first downward division, the present Italian method, appears in a printed arithmetic by Calandri, 1491, although it is found occasionally in manuscript form during the 15th century. Consider the following example. 74 into 59,000 and 78, from 798 
2 over 7, 6 over 4. Results in 518. Results in 727 and 666. Results in 618, 592, with a remainder of 26. 1 shows the completed form of solution, and 2 the successive steps obtained by separating the number into orders. 74, 7 tens, 4 units, into 59,078, 5 ten thousands, 9 thousands, 0 hundreds, 7 tens, 8 units, then 7 hundreds, 9 tens, and 8 units. The three lines show the partial product in the three stages of its reduction. The third, or Austrian method, consists in omitting the partial products and performing the subtraction at once. Comparing the three methods as to two points, one, beginning on the left, to subtract the partial product, two, writing the partial product, the following scheme will show their relations. One, the galley method, yes. The Italian method, no. Austrian method, no. Two, the galley method, no. The Italian method, yes. The Austrian method, no. The galley method is so-called on account of the final form which resembles a boat under full sail. The Austrian method, which probably will ultimately replace the Italian, is constructed from a combination of the best features of both the older methods, two of the galley and one of the Italian. As in the inverse process of subtraction, it was found that the operation did not always result in a natural number, and it was necessary to create a new kind of number, the negative, thus widening the number system to form the class of whole numbers or integers. It is to be expected that a like condition exists in the case of division. If 2 be divided by 1, the quotient is 2, but if one attempts to divide 1 by 2, no corresponding whole number is found. Considering the second phase of division, the separating of a number into two equal parts, it is agreed to let this quotient be a number such that it requires two of them to make one, or unity. This new number is named one-half, and written by putting the number divided above a short horizontal line, and the divisor below the line, as one over two. The class of such numbers is called fractions, from the Latin frangieri, to break. The number below the line is called the denominator, or namer, telling what the part is. The number above the line tells how many parts are taken, and is called the numerator, or number. This function of the numerator will be apparent later. The first widening of the number system, which arose in the case of the inverse operation subtraction, created exactly as many new numbers as there were already in the system before the new numbers entered. Every combination of two numbers with a minus sign between them gives a positive or natural number, when the larger number appears before the sign, and a negative, that is, a new number, when the smaller number comes first. In division, the case is the exception, rather than the rule, where either order of the numbers results in a whole number, as 3 over 2, and 2 over 3, and if one order does so result, the other does not, as 8 over 2, and 2 over 8. It is apparent, then, that the new numbers taken in under the name fraction are infinitely greater in number when compared with the number already in. A fraction may be interpreted in any one of three ways. The fraction 3 over 2 may be thought of as 1, 3 units divided into two equal parts. 2. One unit divided into two equal parts, and three of these parts taken, as 3 times 1 over 2, and 3, in an indicated division not yet performed. The distinction between 1 and 2 may be seen from a figure where unity, or 1, is represented by a line 1 centimeter in length. If the numerator of a fraction is 1, it is called a unit fraction, as 1 over 2, or 1 over 7, or 1 over 8. A proper fraction has a numerator less than its denominator, as in 1 over 7, 2 over 3, 3 over 12. All other fractions are improper, as in 8 over 3, 
5 over 2, 4 over 2. Such a fraction can always be changed to either a whole number, as in 4 over 2 equals 2, or a whole number and a unit fraction, as in 3 over 2 equals 1 and 1 half. The whole numbers were represented by dots, arranged on a line at equal intervals extending to the right and left indefinitely from a chosen dot mark zero, or zero. The creation of the number one-half introduces a point midway between zero and one, and by combination with each of the whole numbers, in the manner three over two equals one and a half, also places a point midway in each interval. The fraction one-quarter places a point halfway from zero to one-half. By continuing this process, it is seen that distance between the dots representing fractions is made smaller and smaller, as the various fractions take their places on the line. When all of the fractions have been represented, if one chooses a particular dot, say 3 over 7, one can always find another dot among those placed whose distance from the given dot 3 over 7 is less than any assigned length of line. The proof of this may be put in the form of conversation between A and B. If the dot 1 is 1 inch from the dot 0, A is to show that a dot may be found in the collection of dots which represent fractions which shall be nearer to the dot 3 over 7 than any fractional part of an inch which B may name. B says, is there a dot nearer to 3 over 7 than 1 over 10 of an inch? A's reply is, choose the dot 31 over 70, whose distance from 3 over 7 is 1 over 70. B then says, find me a dot nearer than 1 over 100 of an inch. A's answer is, the dot 3 over 1 over 700 is only 1 seven hundredth of an inch from 3 over 7, and so forth for any value B may name. The dots are said to be dense and it might be thought that the whole line is filled up, that it has become a continuous line rather than a collection of discrete dots. But such is not the case. There are infinitely more dots on the line that do not represent fractions than there are dots that do represent them. The third of the inverse processes, evolution, will reveal the existence of the missing dots, and by its aid, they, as a new type of number, will be included in the number system, which will then be represented by a continuous line. Fractions are treated in the most ancient mathematical handbook known, written by an Egyptian scribe, Amos or Moonborn, sometime before 1700 BC. This papyrus, now preserved in the British Museum, is entitled Directions for Obtaining the Knowledge of All Dark Things, and covers practically the whole extent of Egyptian mathematics, no substantial advances being made until the time of Greek influence. Another papyrus, that found at Achmin, written perhaps after 500 AD, gives the same treatment of fractions as is found in the work of Amos. Thus, Egyptian mathematics was in its most flourishing condition when Abram left Ur in the Chaldees and remained stationary for a thousand years. See frontispiece. The writer gives, in most cases, no general rule for obtaining results, simply a succession of like problems, the easy step of generalizing by induction seemingly beyond his power. Whole numbers receive no treatment. The work, beginning with fractions, which subject was evidently very difficult, as the author confines his attention solely to unit fractions and fractions with numerator 2. Fractions of the latter type are changed into the sum of two or more unit fractions. Thus, Amos changed 2 over 9 into 1 over 6 and 1 over 18, and gives a table of such changes of fractions between 2 over 3 and 2 over 99. By the aid of this table, any fraction of odd denominator could be so broken up. In this way, Amos could solve such a problem as divide 5 by 21, the 5 is first broken into 2 and 2 and 1. From the table is found 2 over 21 equals 1 over 14 and 1 over 42. 
5 over 21 equals 1 over 21 and in parentheses 1 over 14 and 1 over 42 and in parentheses 1 over 14 and 1 over 42 equals 1 over 21 and in parentheses 2 over 14 and 2 over 42 equals 1 over 21 and 1 over 7 and 1 over 21 equals 1 over 7 and 2 over 21 equals 1 over 7 and 1 over 14 and 1 over 42. The fractions were written side by side, with no sign for addition between them. While the Egyptians met the difficulties of fractions by reducing them to fractions having a constant numerator, 1. The Babylonians avoided the same difficulties by treating only fractions with a fixed denominator, 60 and the Romans also used a single denominator, 12. The usual rule for the division of fractions by inverting the divisor and then multiplying is not common in the textbooks of the 16th century. It is given as follows by Theerfelden, 1578. When the denominators are different, invert the divisor, which you are to place at the right, and multiply the numbers above together and the numbers below together, then you have the correct result. As to divide three quarters by five eighths, invert thus. Three quarters times eight over five equals twenty four over twenty equals one over one fifth. The close of the eighth century found the Hindu decimal notation practically perfect as a means of writing whole numbers. The final perfection of the method by applying it to fractions in the form of decimals did not occur until the time of Simon Stevin, 1548-1620. In seven pages of his work, published in 1585, Stevin leaped what had been an impassable gap for 900 years. The reason for this pause is not difficult to determine. In decimal fractions or decimals, unity, or one, is divided into ten equal parts, each part called a tenth. A tenth is divided into ten equal parts, and each part called a hundredth. Thus the orders on the right of the unit's column are symmetrically named, adding the suffix th with those on the right. As the number of orders on the left is unlimited, so the number of orders on the right is unbounded, and one is enabled to write numbers of unlimitedly small value. The smaller the value of the number, less than one, the larger the number of orders required to express it. The units column is marked by placing a period after it. Sometimes the period is midway between the top and bottom line of the type, as 3.8, but ordinarily it is written on the baseline as 3.8, for 3 and 8 tenths. In reading decimals, the decimal point is always read AND. In the first grouping of units, there was no reason for putting 10 in a group rather than any other number, the use of 10 simply growing out of the use of the hands as a counting machine. In fact, it would have greatly simplified some applications of the number system if primitive mathematicians had been born with six fingers on each hand. A duodecimal or twelve scale would enable the writing of such common fractions as one-third, two-thirds, one-sixth, or duodecimally in the form of 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, whereas decimally they have a continually recurring set of figures, one-third equals 0 0.3333, etc., one-sixth equals 0 0.1666, etc. Charles XII of Sweden, a short time before his death, while lying in the trenches before a Norwegian fortress, seriously debated introducing the duodecimal system of numeration into his dominions. On the other hand, there is a very decisive predetermining feature in the case of the division of the unit. Necessity arose for having or dividing objects into two equal parts long before separation into ten parts was even thought of, while the difficulty of dividing into ten equal parts is apparent. The use of the period or comma to mark the unit order began with Pitiscus, 1612, with all the advantages of the decimal notation carried to the right of the units column. It was not until the 19th century that decimals came into ordinary arithmetic. 
End of section four. Section five of the science history of the universe, volume eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Pure Mathematics. Chapter 3, Power of Numbers, Part 1. If the product of several numbers, these numbers or factors happen to be a repetition of the same number, or in other words, if the factors are equal, the product is called a power of the number which was repeatedly used to produce it. The process of finding a power of a number is involution. The term power was used by the early Greek writers in this sense. The powers are named following the ordinal names of the number of times the factor is used. If the factor of 2 is used 5 times, as 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, or 32, 32 is said to be the fifth power of 2. The second power is called the square of the number, as it was early known that the number of square units in a square is equal to the second power of the number of units of length in one side. If a square is 5 inches on each side, its surface may be measured, using a small square 1 inch on each side. Such a unit is called a square unit or square inch, or a unit of square measure. This square inch may be laid along one edge five times, thus forming one row of five square inches. Five such rows may be formed one above the other, completely using up or covering the original square. The area of the surface of the square is then said to be five times five square inches, or 25 square inches. The number of square units in a square is then the second power of the number of units of length in one side. This fact, which was early known, led to the naming of the second power of a number, the square of the number. In a similar manner, the volume of a cube is found by taking, for the unit of cubical measure, a cube one inch on each edge. A cube is a solid figure in which all of the edges meeting in a corner are at right angles to each other, and in which all edges are equal. In this cube, each edge is five inches. Its volume is found by taking for a unit of cubical measure a cube one inch on each edge. This unit or cubic inch is laid along one edge as many times as possible, or five times, thus forming a row of five cubic inches. On the bottom, five such rows may be formed, giving a layer of five times five cubic inches. It is required five such layers to fill up the given cube, or five times five times five cubic inches. This use of the third power of the number of inches on the edge gives the name cube of a number to the third power of the number. Since no solid figure exists with four edges at right angles, this process of naming the powers ceases with the third, or cube. In the figure taken from a paper by Miss Benedict are shown various symbols which have been devised for the indication of powers. Writing the number of the power a little above and to the right of the number, as seven cubed for seven times seven times seven, is due to the French mathematician and philosopher Descartes. The three, which indicates the number of times the seven is used as a factor, is called an exponent, while the seven is termed the base. The exponential notation permits the writing of very large or very small numbers much more compactly than can be done without its use. Modern researches in astronomy and physics have rendered necessary the use of extremely large numbers as well as extremely small, the lower orders of which are either unknown or of small consequence. The number of vibrations per second of light waves in the visible spectrum vary from 3.94 in a 10 to the power of 14 to 7.63 in a 10 to the power of 14. The wavelengths of the spectrum vary from 0 0.000000762 meter to 0 0.000000393382 meter. In the exponential notation, these numbers will be written as 7621 into 1 by 10 to the power of 10 and 3933.825 times 1 by 10 to the power of 10. If two powers of the same number are to be multiplied, the exponents are added. As 7 to the power of 3 times 7 to the power of 5 is equal to 7 to the power 3 plus 5, which is equal to 7 to the power of 8. If two powers of the same number are to be divided, 
the exponent of the divisor is subtracted from the exponent of the dividend. 7 to the power of 5 divided by 7 to the power of 3 is equal to 7 to the power of 3 minus 5, which is equal to 7 to the power of 2. If a power of a number is itself to be raised to a power, as in finding the third power of 7 to the power of 2, the result is obtained by multiplying the exponent 2 by the 3, exponent of the power to which 7 to the power 2 is to be raised. 7 to the power of 2 raised to the third power is equal to 7 to the power 2 times 7 to the power 2 times 7 to the power 2, which is equal to 7 to the power 6, or also is equal to 7 to the power 2 into 3. A corresponding process takes place in extracting a root of a power. The cube root of 7 to the power of 6 is equal to the cube root of 7 to the power of 2 times 7 to the power of 2 times 7 to the power of 2, which is equal to 7 to the power of 2, which is also equal to 7 to the power 6 divided by 3. As the exponent indicates the number of times, the base is used as a factor. It must be a natural number since using a number as a factor 3 times or half a time, is meaningless. The principle of no exception is here applied as before, and a meaning is given to the exponents of the form 3, 2 thirds, 0, which will be at the same time consistent with the meaning of a whole number used as an exponent. If 7 to the 5th power be divided by 7 to the 5th power, the quotient is 1, but if the exponents be subtracted, as is done when division is performed, the quotient is 7 to the power 5 minus 5, which is equal to 7 to the power of 0, which should be equal to 1. In a similar manner, it may be shown that any number with an exponent of 0 is equal to 1. Is this reasonable in the light of the use of an exponent to tell how many times a factor appears? In 3 times 5 or 15, 7 is not used as a factor, or in other words, it is used 0 times, which may be written as 3 times 5 times 7 to the power 0, which is equal to 3 times 5, into 1, which is equal to 3 times 5. Carrying the reasoning a step further, 7 to the 5th power divided by 7 to the 8th power is equal to 1 by 7 to the 3rd power. But subtracting exponents, 7 to the 5th power divided by 7 to the 8th power equals 7 to the power 5 minus 8 equals 7 to the power minus 3. Therefore, 7 to the power minus 3 equals 1 by 7 to the power 3, which may be stated generally. The sign of an exponent may be changed by changing the position of the number from one side of the denominator line to the other. The meaning to be attached to 7 to the power 2 thirds is determined in a similar manner. It will be assumed that 2 thirds, when used as an exponent, while as yet it has no meaning, will follow the law above for multiplication, that is to multiply 7 to the power 2 thirds by itself. The exponents are added. 7 to the power of 2 thirds times 7 to the power of 2 thirds is equal to 7 to the power 2 thirds plus 2 thirds, which is equal to 7 to the power 4 by 3. Repeat the process. 7 to the power 2 thirds times 7 to the power 2 thirds times 7 to the power 2 thirds equals 7 to the power 2 thirds plus 2 thirds plus 2 thirds equals 7 to the power 6 thirds equals 7 squared. When a number is used as a factor 3 times, it is said to be cubed. The inverse process of finding the number when its cube is given is called finding the cube root. Since the cube of 7 to the 2 thirds is equal to 7 to the power of 2, 7 must be the cube root of 7 to the power 2. That is, the numerator of a fractional exponent tells us the power that is to be taken and the denominator tells the root to be taken. 32 to the power 2 fifths means that 32 is to be squared and its fifth root found. 32 squared is equal to 1024. The fifth root of 1024 is 4, since 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 is equal to 1024. When 32 to the power 2 fifths equals 4, 16 raised to the power of 0.5 equals 16 to the power 1 by 2, which is equal to 4, since 4 times 4 is equal to 16. 7 to the power of 1 is of course 7. The use of exponents in computations greatly facilitates the work. Exponents so used are called logarithms. It will be agreed that 10 will be used as a base, and that every number is some power of 10, understanding by power 10 with an exponent, which is not necessarily a whole number. 10 to the power 0 is equal to 1. 10 to the power 1 is equal to 10. 10 to the power 2 is equal to 100. 10 to the power 3 is equal to 1000, etc. Since the exponent of 1 or 10 to the power 0 is 0, and of 10 or 10 to the power 1 is 1, any number between 1 and 10 
must have an exponent or a logarithm of a number lying between 0 and 1. In the same manner, any number lying between 10 and 100 will have a logarithm whose value is between 1 and 2. These facts may be put in a very brief form. Logarithm of 1 is 0. Logarithm of 10 is 1. Logarithm of 100 is 2. Logarithm of 1000 is 3. The logarithm of 8 is a decimal lying between 0 and 1. The value of this decimal, found by an elaborate process of calculation, is 0 0.903090, an unending decimal. Tables have been calculated of these exponents. To every number, an exponent or logarithm, and to every logarithm, a number. If it be required to multiply one number by another, the logarithm of each number is found in the table. These two logarithms are added, giving according to the method of adding exponents, the logarithm or exponent of the product. Opposite this logarithm is found the number or products desired. Thus, by the use of logarithmic tables, the operation of multiplication is replaced by the much easier and shorter operation of addition, and division is replaced by subtraction. This final step in the perfecting of the methods of computation was the invention of John Napier, Baron of Merkiston, from 1550 to 1617. It seems to be an easy consequence of exponential notation, but curiously enough, was discovered by Napier before the invention of exponents by Descartes in 1637, although the first steps towards this exponential notation are found in the works of Simon Stephen, 1548 to 1620. In October 1608, Hans Lipperhey invented the telescope. In the summer of 1609, it was perfected by Galileo, and from this date began the conquest of the heavens. The next century, terminating with the death of Sir Isaac Newton, 1727, was the golden age of astronomy, in which the movements of the celestial bodies were subjected to mathematical law. It is a striking coincidence that the invention of the telescope, which so increased the need for tedious calculation, should occur almost simultaneously with the invention of logarithms, which to such a degree shortened these calculations. The greatest of French mathematicians and astronomers, Laplace, paid this tribute to Napier, the invention of logarithms, by shortening the labors, doubled the life of the astronomer. It is one of the greatest curiosities of science that Napier constructed. Logarithms before exponents were used, says Kahori. And the fact that logarithms naturally flow from the exponential symbol was not observed until much later by Euler. Following is a description of Napier's method. Let AE be a definite line. AE is taken to be 10 to the power 7 a proceeding very similar to the basing of the Babylonian number system, or 60 to the power of 4. A dash D dash, a line extending from A dash indefinitely. Imagine two points starting at the same moment, the one moving from A towards E, and the other moving from A dash along A dash D dash. Let the velocity during the same moment be the same for both. Let that of the point on line A dash D dash be uniform. But the velocity of the point on A E, decreasing in such a way that when it arrives to any point C, its velocity is proportional to the remaining distance CE. If the first point moves along a distance AC, while the second one moves over a distance A dash C dash, then Napier calls A dash C dash the logarithm of CE. The adaptation to the number 10 was suggested at a meeting of Napier with Henry Briggs, who was professor of geometry in Gresham College, London. Briggs' own words indicated his admiration for the invention. Napier, Lord of Markinston, hath set my head and hands at work with his new and admirable logarithms. I hope to see him this summer, if it please God, for I never saw a book which pleased me better and made me more wonder. Briggs was delayed in his journey to meet Napier, who said to a friend, Ah, John, Mr. Briggs will not come. Just at that moment, Briggs arrived and it is said that almost one quarter of an hour passed by, each beholding the other without speaking a word. Briggs at last spoke. My lord, I have undertaken this long journey purposely to see your person, and to know what engine of wit or ingenuity you first came to think of this most excellent help in astronomy, viz. the logarithms. But my lord, being by you found out, I wonder nobody found it out before, when now known it is so easy. Computations of logarithms to the base 10 soon followed, and are known today by the name Briggs logarithms. In 1647, Gregory St. Vincent discovered that the use of a base denoted by E equal to 2.71828218284590046 had a peculiar relation to the equilateral hyperbola. Such logarithms are called hyperbolic or natural, although occasionally incorrectly termed Napierian, 
and are of immense service in pure mathematics. Since Napier did not use exponents, he cannot be said to have used a base in his system. If, however, his logarithms are expressed as exponents, the base or number which is raised to the power would be nearly 1 by e, where 1 by e is the base of the natural system. The invention of logarithms was designed to simplify the labor of calculation. An attempt along another line has been to perform the calculations mechanically. Napier, with the rods or bones, succeeded in a way with multiplication. The first successful attempt to perform the first four operations by machinery alone was that of Blasey Pascal from 1623 to 1622, when a lad of 18. The close application to this work undermined a not over strong constitution, and he died at the early age of 39. The Pascal machine, which is here illustrated, was constructed on the principle of a wheel among the circumference of which were marked the first nine numerals. One turn of this wheel caused the next wheel, similarly marked, to pass through a tenth of a revolution, and so forth. Pascal's machine was not built, however strictly on a decimal scale, as it was designed for monetary work. A similar attempt was made by Leibniz, the German mathematician. End of Power of Numbers, Part 1《Section 6 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 1. Pure Mathematics. Chapter 3. Powers of Numbers. Part 2. The most elaborate calculating machine ever attempted was designed by Charles Babbage, 1791-1871, to on which he expended a private fortune of over $100,000, and toward which the British government contributed $80,000 and a fireproof building for its construction. While the machine was never completed, the work on it left an indelible stamp on British artisanship. The most successful machine was constructed by George and Edward Scheutz, who were inspired by the attempt of Babbage. This machine, which computes and prints logarithmic and other tables, finally came into the possession of the Dudley Observatory at Albany, New York. The last few years have seen a great advance in the art of constructing computing machines for purely commercial purposes. The inverse process of involution is evolution, the problem of which is to determine one of a given number of equal factors when their product alone is given. The factors so found are called square root, cube root, fourth root, etc., depending upon the number of factors involved. The square root of 4 is 2, the cube root of 27 is 3. The simplest method of extracting a root is to divide the number by its lowest prime factor and continue the process. It may be illustrated by finding the cube root of 216. Since there are three factors 2 and three factors 3, there are three factors 2 times 3 or 6, or the cube root of 216 is 6. 216 divided by 2 is 108, 108 divided by 2 is 54, 54 divided by 3 is 27, 27 divided by 3 is 9. 9 divided by 3 is 3. The symbol of evolution is square root sign, an abbreviation R for root, followed by the vinculum. A figure is placed above the V of the square root to indicate the root taken, except in the case of square root when it is usually omitted. The ordinary algorithm or scheme for finding square root is given in a paraphrase of the work of Theon of Smyrna, who flourished about 139 AD. Quote, we learn the process from Euclid 2, 4, where it is stated, If a straight line be divided by any point, the square on the whole line is equal to the squares of both parts, together with twice the oblong which may be found from those segments. So, with a number like 144, we take a lesser square, say 100, of which the root is 10. We multiply 10 by 2, because in the remaining gnomon, a, b, c, d, e, f, there are two oblongs, and divide 44 by 20. The remainder 4 is the square of a, b, 
or two. Figure 28, disk diagram of Leibniz's calculating machine. Cube root is found in a similar manner, based on the cube instead of the square. Thus, the cube on the sum of two lines, A and B, is equal to the cubes on A and B and three flat figures A on two edges and B on the third, together with three oblong figures B on each of two edges and A on the third. This is expressed by a formula. Open parentheses A plus B close parentheses cubed is equal to A cubed plus 3A squared B plus 3AB squared plus B cubed. Figure 29, illustration of cube root, trenchants, arithmetic, 1566. That evolution does not always result in a number of our system a fraction, which will now be called a rational number, is seen if one attempts to find the square root of 2. This may be done with any degree of approximation by annexing ciphers on the right of units column, resulting in an endless decimal. 1.1412 dot 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 dot. That this number cannot be expressed as a fraction is proved in Euclid's Elements of Geometry, although the proof is attributed to some commentator. Suppose the square root of 2 is equal to m over n, where m and n represent the numerator and denominator of a fraction and have no common factor. Then multiplying this equation by itself, member by member, 2 equals m squared over n squared, which says that m squared is divisible by n squared, which cannot be, since m and n have no common factor. In a square side 1, the diagonal is represented by the square root of 2. It is proved in Euclid 1, 47, that the square of AC is equal to the sum of the squares on BC and AB. The square on AB is 1, on BC 1, and the sum of these is 2. The square on AC is 2, then AC is the square root of 2. If AC and AB have a common measure, that is, if a third line exists, which is contained a whole number of times in AB and AC, the square root of 2 divided by 1 would be represented by the quotient of two whole numbers as m over n, which is shown above to be impossible. If AB is taken as this third line, it is contained in itself once, and in AC more than once and not twice, or the ratio of these two numbers, m over n, is less than 2 and more than 1. This may be put in the form 1 is less than m over n is less than 2. If one-tenth of AB is taken, there results 1.4 is less than M over N is less than 1.5. If one-tenth of this is used, 1.41 is less than M over N is less than 1.42. Continuing, 1.414 is less than M over N is less than 1.415. 1.4142 is less than m over n is less than 1.4143, and so on indefinitely. These two lines are said to be incommensurable, that is, they have no common measure. Euclid does not treat of incommensurables as such, as his mode of representing numbers by lines, which will be spoken of later, and the peculiar device used by him in dealing with ratios avoided the difficulty. Theodorus, circa 400 BC, showed that the lines represented by the square roots of 3, 5, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 17 are incommensurable with the unit line. Going back to the number system following division, it was found to be representable by a series of dots, between any two of which existed a third dot, yet the dots do not form a continuous line. If one chooses as the side of the above square the distance from dot O to dot 1, and then lays off AC from 0, 
the end C will give a dot which is not found in the system of rationals. The final widening of the number system, so far as arithmetic is concerned, takes place here when such expressions as the square root of 2, the square root of 3, pi, or the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle, equals 3.14159 dot 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 e, the base of the Napierian system of logarithms are called numbers, although none of them is representable fully by any number of orders in the Hindu notation. Such numbers are called irrationals, and are divided into two classes, surds, which are expressible by a combination of root signs, and transcendentals, which are not as pi and e. A transcendental is sometimes defined as a number which is not the root of any algebraic equation, with positive integral exponents and rational coefficients. Irrationals were discovered by the Pythagoreans. The following story is told concerning irrationals. Quote, it is said that the man who first made the theory of irrationals public died in a shipwreck because the unspeakable and invisible should always be kept secret, and that he who by chance first touched and uncovered this symbol of life was removed to the origin of things, where the eternal waves wash around him. Close quote. Such is the reverence in which these men held the theory of irrational quantities. Greek arithmetic, the science of numbers as distinguished from logistic or calculation, has its beginnings with Pythagoras, circa 569 to 500 BC, who founded a brotherhood holding common philosophical beliefs which were based on mathematics. The Pythagoreans did not commit their work to writing and held it secret from those outside their own circle, and the glory of any discovery was given to Pythagoras himself as the founder of the school. The properties of numbers studied by the Pythagoreans may be classed under four heads which give rise to four types of numbers. Polygonal numbers, or those numbers which, if indicated by dots, can be arranged in polygons or regular figures. Factors of numbers, numbers forming a proportion. And numbers in series. Figure 30, gnomon. Figure 31, triangular numbers. All numbers, whole, are divided into two classes, even and odd. The odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, are called gnomons. That is, an odd number is always the difference between two square numbers, and can therefore be represented by the figure which remains when a square is cut from the corner of a larger square. Thus, in the figure 36 is a square number, since it can be arranged in the form of a square with six dots on a side. The lower right-hand square, 16, is taken from 36, and there remains the gnomon, 20. The product of two numbers is said to be plain, and if the number cannot be represented by a square, it is called oblong. Triangular numbers are those which can be arranged in the form of a triangle. In the triangular number 10, one side of the triangle is 4. The following passage from Lucian, given by Ball, has reference to this fact. A merchant asks Pythagoras what he can teach him. The following conversation ensues. Pythagoras, I will teach you how to count. Merchant, I know that already. Pythagoras, how do you count? Merchant, one, two, three, four. Pythagoras, stop. What you take to be four is ten, a perfect triangle, and our symbol. It may be said that the whole treatment of numbers by the Greeks through the time of Euclid was geometrical. The ease with which numbers could be represented by lines led to a habitual linear symbolism such as is used by Euclid, circa 300 BC, where the second, seventh, eighth, and ninth and tenth books either deal with magnitudes, which include lines as well as numbers, or numbers themselves, which are represented by lines. The first proposition of the seventh book of Euclid is taken from T. L. Heath's Euclid, volume 2, page 296, the most valuable commentary that has appeared in English. Quote, Two unequal numbers being set out, and the less being continually subtracted in turn from the greater, 
If the number which is left never measures the one before it until a unit is left, the original numbers will be prime to one another, that is, will contain no common factor. For the less of two unequal numbers AB, CD being continually subtracted from the greater, let the number which is left never measure the one before it until a unit is left. I say that AB, CD are prime to one another, that is, that an unit alone measures AB, CD. For if AB, CD are not prime to one another, some number will measure them. Let a number measure them, and let it be E, let CD measuring BF leave FA less than itself, let AF measuring DG leave GC less than itself, and let GC measuring FH leave a unit HA. Since then, E measures CD and CD measures BF, therefore E measures BF. But it also measures the whole BA and therefore will also measure the remainder AF. But AF measures DG and therefore E also measures DG. But it also measures the whole DC, therefore it will also measure the remainder CG. But CG measures FH, therefore E also measures FH. But it also measures the whole FA, therefore it will also measure the remainder, the unit AH, though it is a number, which is impossible. Therefore, no number will measure the numbers ABCD, therefore ABCD are prime to one another. This theorem leads to the usual method of determining the largest number which is a common factor of two given numbers. The smallest is divided into the larger, the remainder from this division into the former divisor. The final remainder, which is contained without a remainder, is the largest common divisor. If this last divisor is unity, the numbers are said to be prime to each other. Figure 32, Albert Durer's engraving melancholy, showing magic squares. With the Greeks is found much mysticism imbibed from the Egyptians. The Pythagoreans sought the origin of all things in number. One is the essence of all things. Four is the symbol of perfection corresponding to the human soul. Five is the cause of color. Six of cold. Seven of mind, health, and light. Eight of love and friendship. A perfect number is equal to the sum of its factors. 28 equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. Other numbers are excessive or defective. Amicable numbers are those each of which is equal to the sum of the factors of the other, as 222 equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 71 plus 142, and 284 equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 10 plus 11 plus 20 plus 22 plus 45 plus 55 plus 110. To Eratosthenes is due a method of picking out prime numbers, numbers which have no factors except the number itself and unity. The even numbers, except two, contain no primes. All the others, as far as one wished to go, were written upon a papyrus. Every third number contains three as a factor and was cut out of the papyrus, so with every fifth, seventh, and so forth. The remaining numbers on the papyrus are prime. The papyrus with the holes where the numbers were cut out was called Eratosthenes' sieve. The last important Greek writer on arithmetic was Diophantus of Alexandria, who flourished about 150 BC. His work will be mentioned in connection with algebra. One of the famous theorems in the theory of numbers, due to Fermat, contains the number of primes contained in the form fn equals 2 to the 2n power plus 1, where n is any number. Fermat believed that every value of n gives a prime, and showed this for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Euler, in 1732, found that for n equals 5, the number has a factor 641. Factors have been found for each of the following values of n. 6, 7, 9, 11, 12, 18, 23, 36, 38. 
Firma asserted without proof that n sub n plus y to the nth power equals z sub n is unsolvable except in certain self-evident cases. Mathematicians have not as yet been able to prove or disprove this statement. Dedekind's view of the irrational as a schnitt or cut may be given in his own words, quote, if all points of the straight line fall into two classes, such that every point of the first class lies to the left of every point of the second class, then there exists one and only one point which produces this division of all points into two classes, this severing of the straight line into two portions. Close quote. If the point represents a rational number, well and good, if not, the exists posits such a point, and it is said to represent an irrational number. Figure 33, the nine sections of a magic cure, Andrews. Figure 34, closed knight's tour, magic square, Fonsalides. Figure 35, Euler's magic square. The formation of magic squares, which reveal the wondrous symmetry of numbers, has had a fascination for mathematicians of all lands. The earliest record of a magic square is found in Chinese literature of about 1125 AD. Chinese Philosophy by Dr. Paul Karras, quoted by W.S. Andrews. The Woodcut by Albert Dürer contains the first magic square found in the Christian Occident. Successive numbers, beginning with one, are to be so placed in a square array that the sum of each column, the sum of each row, and the sum of each diagonal shall be the same. A curious form of the magic square was worked out by a Moravian, Benzaledes, in which the numbers, in addition to having the arrangement of a magic square, follow the knight on a chessboard, one square forward and one square diagonally. Figure 34. Magic cubes have also been constructed in which the numbers are arranged in cubical array. An unsolved problem found among Euler's papers is to place a number in each of the 16 squares, A, B, C, and so on, such that the sum of the squares of the numbers shall fulfill the conditions of a magic square, and, in addition, the products of the numbers taken horizontally two at a time and also vertically two at a time, shall be the same. Euler stated that he had found a general means of solution which is not given. The particular case here given was found in the papers he left. Figure 35. End of section 6. Section 7 of the Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Pure Mathematics, Chapter 4, Algebra. Part 1. There is no hard and fast dividing line between algebra and arithmetic. Algebra was called by Sir Isaac Newton universal arithmetic, a generalization of those processes which have to do with number. It is a generalization in the application of the processes rather than in the processes themselves. The most important generalization is in the notion of number itself. In arithmetic, it was represented by a continuous line, indefinite in extent both to the right and left. A combined result of the three inverse processes, subtraction, division, and evolution, widens this number system to cover the entire plane. Algebra has been defined as the science of the equation, but the equation is also a valuable asset of arithmetic. 
When the savage first recognizes that two is made up of one and one, setting these ideas over against each other and balancing them, the equation has become a factor in his thought, although it has had no symbolic or verbal expression. The algebraic use of the equation differs essentially from the general use to which it is put in arithmetic. In the latter, it was arrived at after a process of thought and sums up that thought. That is, it becomes a formula in which are found only known terms. It is seen after an elaborate course of reason and experiment that the square described on the sum of two lines A and B is equivalent to two squares, one on A and another on B, and two rectangles or oblongs, formed by A for one side and B for the other. This is put in the shape of a formula. Left parentheses, A plus B right parentheses squared equals A squared plus 2AB plus B squared, where nothing is found in it except the known lines A and B. Thus, in arithmetic, the equation is the vehicle by which truth already discovered is expressed. On the other hand, in algebra, the equation is the tool by which the discovery is made. The unknown number, or the number to be found, is represented by some symbol or word, and from the statement of the problem, a balance is set up which the operator manipulates until such unknown is determined. The equation is the most useful and powerful tool in the hands of the algebraist, and this particular distinction just made may be said to be the important one. The main purpose of algebra is to evolve a mechanism by which the equation may be so manipulated that it will reduce to a simple equation between the unknown number on the one hand and a known number on the other. If the average schoolboy were asked for his notion of algebra, his probable reply would be that it has something to do with X and Y. In paging over a recent textbook on the subject, the remark was made that the whole language seemed to be made up of X's and Y's. While the development of a comprehensive symbolism is one of the important features of the algebra of today, it was not always so. The modern symbolism in algebra did not reach its present perfection until the 18th century, and in the past 10 years a new symbolism has sprung up in which words, which are ambiguous at best, are entirely replaced by symbols in the whole course of the reasoning. However, algebra today is characterized by a more general symbolism for number, the use of a single letter for the unknown number and of other letters for the known numbers involved greatly facilitates the operations with these numbers and enables the stating of a general law in a single step. In the formula cited above, A is a line, and it may be regarded as a number which is found by measuring the line by a unit. Two elements come in which make this a more general number than could be expressed in the Hindu notation. If the unit is changed, the number A is changed. In this way, A may be said to stand for any positive number whatsoever. Again, A and B may be any two lines at will, and the statement is still true. The principle of continuity, or of no exception, invoked in the widening of the number system gave new numbers which in general obey the laws of the old. Thus the above statement, which originated with A and B as lines, is equally true if A and B are negative numbers. Summing up this point, it may be said that in addition to representing numbers by the Hindu method, algebra represents numbers by means of letters. And while such numbers are regarded as known, yet it may be that no particular value is thought of in the discussion, and they may be given any value at will. Again, a number which is in a constant state of flux or change may be the subject of thought as the price of wheat on the exchange or the velocity of a railroad train. It would be exceedingly difficult to represent such a number with no more mechanism than arithmetic affords, but algebra allows of its representation by a letter. 
The last letters of the alphabet are usually allotted to these variable numbers, and the first letters to constants or numbers which do not vary. Another, and in some ways parallel, distinction is made in using the last letters for unknowns and the first letters for knowns. These are simply two phases of the same convention. This use of a letter for a general number is found in the works of Aristotle, where he says in one place, If capital A is the moving force, capital B that which is moved, capital G the distance, and capital D the time, etc. Still, a more general representation of number may be arrived at through the idea of functionality. A number is said to be a function of one or more other numbers if it depends for its value upon the value of the other number or numbers. Thus, the volume of a rectangular solid depends on the length of the base, the width of the base, and the altitude. In some cases, it is known exactly what the relation termed functionality is. But in the great majority of cases, such functionality or dependence cannot be put in any more definite form. If A and B are respectively the length and width of the base and C the altitude and capital V the volume of the rectangular solid, functionality is expressed by capital V equals capital F left paren A comma B comma C right paren. This functionality may be more definitely expressed as capital V equals A times B times C. One says the state of the weather, capital S, depends upon temperature, capital T, humidity, capital H, direction and velocity of wind, capital D, and capital V. But no more definite form can be written than capital S equals capital F, left paren, capital T, comma, capital H, comma, capital D, comma, capital V, right paren. If X, comma, Y are two variable quantities with dependence of Y upon X, this is put in the form Y equals F, left paren, X, right paren, or Y equals F of X. The number system of arithmetic was developed from the simple process of counting and gave rise to an idea of number, the field of real numbers, which was associated with a line, a space notion. Real number may be thought as arising from sequence in time. 51 is thought of not as a collection of 51 units, but as an element in a series after 50 and before 52. In counting, one arrives at 51 after 50 and before 52. In this way, algebra may be conceived of as the science of time series as opposed to geometry, the science of space, thus treating of the a priori elements of Kant, time, and space. The two, algebra and geometry, have been closely interwoven in their historical development, especially in the beginnings of each. It has been seen how the Greeks built their theory of number upon its line representation, and it is a common place that if a relation can be pictured to the eye by means of a figure in space, the reasoning is greatly assisted. Such a view is sometimes misleading. If intuition alone had been trusted to determine whether or no all points had been used up by fractions, the answer would have been yes, and the irrationals would have been omitted. Environment and racial conditions have been the determining factors in the growth of algebra and geometry. Egypt was an agricultural country. Land was of value in geometry as the science of measurement began there. The Arabians were a nomadic people. Land was only valuable at the time it was being grazed by the flocks and herds. The peculiarly clear atmosphere, resplendent with myriads of stars, nightly turned the Arabs' attention to the celestial bodies as he tended the flock. And he was led to cultivate those branches of analysis and astronomy which he received as the product of the subtle, imaginative mind of the Hindu. Thus, geometry and algebra, 
each arising from the needs and characteristics of a race peculiarly adapted to its cultivation, were developed side by side, each borrowing something from the other, but preserving its own distinctive qualities until the time of Descartes, 1637, when by his invention of the analytic geometry the two streams converge again, each becomes in full the interpretive agency of the other. Less than 50 years ago, it began to be more and more realized that while geometry always interpreted algebra correctly if it itself were correctly interpreted, yet the notions of geometry were only conventionally and approximately represented by a figure, and that intuition guided by the eye was not always to be trusted. So a new movement sprang up to completely arithmetize geometry. Its first and great apostle was Karl Weierstrass, the father of precision, born at Ostenfeld, October 13, 1815. The investigations of the foundations of mathematics of the past 10 or 15 years, carried on by a host of mathematicians in Italy, France, Germany, England, and the United States, has carried this work farther to base all geometry upon number. Thus, the continuity of the whole field of mathematics has been established and a complete symmetrical system has been built up or created beginning with a simple notion of putting one with one, growing like a great oak from the acorn until today it is impossible for one mind in a lifetime to embrace it in all its ramifications. A simple equation is one in which there is one unknown quantity and it is involved only in its first power or degree as x plus 7 equals 15. It is easily seen that the only value of x for which this equation can be true is 8 or x plus 7 equals 15 if x equals 8. A simple equation then may be looked upon as a single condition which is satisfied if a certain value is given to the unknown. The Egyptian treatise on mathematics by Amos gives, after his treatment of unit fractions, 11 problems, each resulting in a simple equation. The equation given is quoted by Kajori. Figure one row of Egyptian hieroglyphics, and one row of interpretations. Second row. Ha, heap, i.e., neb, fits two-thirds, x, left paren, two-thirds. Ma, fits one-half, plus one-half. Rho, suffix, fits one-seventh plus one-seventh. Hi fits whole plus one. Zeeper fit gives equals. M sa suffix 37 gives 37. Another problem reads heap. It's two-thirds. It's one-half. It's one-seventh. It's whole, it gives 33, which put in modern form, omitting the sign of addition which was not used by Amos, one two-thirds, one-half, one-seventh x equals 33. The method of solution is to determine by what one two-thirds, one-half, one-seventh, must be multiplied to give 33, and the answer is 14 and one-quarter, one-ninety-seventh, one-fifty-sixth, one over 679, one over 776, one over 194, one over 388. Such was the laborious and awkward solution of a simple equation. The mathematics of the Hindus, from Brahmagupta, born 598 A.D., to Bhaskara, born 1114, was made known to the English-speaking world by H.T. Colebrook, 1817. 
These treatises are clothed in mystic and obscure language and are very difficult of translation. The story of the origin of the work by Bhaskara is given by Brooks. The work is named for the author's daughter, Lilavati, who it appeared was destined to pass her life unmarried and without children. The father, however, having ascertained a lucky hour for contracting her in marriage, left an hour cup on a vessel of water, intending that when the cup should subside, the marriage should take place. It happened that the girl, from a curiosity natural to children, looked into the cup to see the water coming in at the hole, when, by chance, a pearl separated from her bridal dress, fell into the cup and, rolling down to the hole, stopped the influx of water. When the operation of the cup had been thus delayed, the father was in consternation, and examining he found that the small pearl had stopped the flow of water, and the long-expected hour had passed. Thus, disappointed, the father said to the unfortunate daughter, I will write a book of your name, which shall remain to the latest times, for a good name is a second life and the groundwork of eternal existence. The following problem from the Lilavati serves to show the poetic form in which they are garbed. Out of a heap of pure lotus flowers, a third part a fifth, a sixth, were offered respectively to the gods Siva, Vishnu, and the sun. A quarter was presented to Bhavani. The remaining six were given to the venerable preceptor. Tell me quickly the whole number of flowers. Out of a swarm of bees, one-fifth of them settled on the blossom of the Kadamba, and one-third on the flower of the Solindri. Three times the difference of these numbers flew to the bloom of a kataja. One bee, which remained hovered and flew about in the air, allured at the same moment by the pleasing fragrance of a jasmine in pandanus. Tell me, charming woman, the number of the bees. The following examples are taken from the Ganita Sara Sangraha, previously quoted, translated by M. Rangacharya of Madras. The source of this material is an article by Professor David Eugene Smith in Bibliotheca Mathematica, December 1908. One-fourth of a herd of camels was seen in the forest. Twice the square root of that herd had gone on to the mountain slopes, and three times five camels were, however, found to remain on the bank of a river. What is the numerical measure of that herd of camels? A quadratic equation is one in which appears as the highest power of the unknown the second power. Thus the equation x squared minus 7x plus 12 equals 0 contains the second power of x and is therefore a quadratic yielding as the two values of x, 3 and 4. The question naturally arises, how can x be at the same time 3 and 4? The quadratic is the expression of a double condition. It is satisfied not by 3 and 4 at the same time, but by 3 or by 4. As is seen by substituting 3 or x, giving 3 squared minus 7 times 3 plus 12 equals 0. Or... 9 minus 21 plus 12 equals 0. Again, 4. 4 squared minus 7 times 4 plus 12 equals 0. Or, 16 minus 28 plus 12 equals 0. The equation x squared minus 7x plus 12 equals 0 is true if x is 3 or if x is 4. Various devices have been used to solve the quadratic, which may be written in the general form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c may have any values whatever except that a may not be zero. If a equals zero, the second degree term would vanish and the equation would no longer be quadratic. The simplest mode is by completing the square. If the equation to be solved is x squared plus 6x equals 16, it is seen by comparing with the expression for the square of a plus b 
a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, that the left member of the equation, in order to be a perfect square, should have the term 9 added to it. Adding this to the other side, also the balance is preserved. x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals 16 plus 9 equals 25. Now, since both sides are perfect squares, the square roots may be found. The square root of x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals x plus 3. And the square root of 25 may be plus 5 or minus 5, since plus 5 times plus 5 equals 25, and minus 5 times minus 5 equals 25. This twofold condition is then expressed by writing square root of 25 equals plus or minus 5. Whereas above, it is understood that either plus 5 or minus 5 is to be taken. Equating the square roots of the two members, x plus 3 equals plus or minus 5, and breaking this up into two conditions, x plus 3 equals plus 5, x equals 2, or x plus 3 equals minus 5, x equals minus 8. Bhaskara, who solves such equations, says the second value in this case is not to be taken, for it is inadequate. People do not approve of negative roots. Such equations as the above were readily solved by the Hindus. Henkel says of them, If one understands by algebra the application of arithmetical operations to complex magnitudes of all sorts, whether rational or irrational numbers or space magnitudes, then the learned Brahmins of Hindustan are the real inventors of algebra. About 150 years after Muhammad's flight from Mecca, the study of Hindu science was taken up at Baghdad in the court of Caliph Almansas. In 773 AD, there appeared at his court a Hindu astronomer with astronomical tables which were translated into Arabic. The first Arabic treatise now known is that of Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. The work, which was translated probably by Athelard of Bath, and which is the first work in which the word algebra, or in the Arabic al shabr wal makabala occurs, begins, quote, Spoken has algorithmy. Let us give deserved praise to God, our leader and defender. Unquote. The word algorithmy is the Latin form of the author's name, from which comes the word algorithm, signifying a rule for computation. The two words used as a name for algebra mean restoration and opposition, and have reference to the transposing of the terms of an equation and discarding equal terms from both members. An equation of the form y equals 2x plus 5 expresses a condition between two unknowns or variables. Such an equation is said to be indeterminate, since any number of pairs of values of x and y will satisfy it. If x equals 1, y equals 7. If x equals 0, y equals 5. If x equals minus 1, y equals 3. If x equals minus 2, y equals 1. If x equals minus 3, y equals minus 1, and so on indefinitely. This relation between x and y may be shown graphically by a method which is the foundation of the analytic geometry invented by Descartes, 1637, from which date it may safely be said modern mathematics takes its rise. The principle upon which it is based is that a point in a plane may be located if its distances are known from two intersecting lines called axes. These axes are chosen for convenience at right angles, although this is immaterial except for simplicity. End of section 7. Section 8 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. 
The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Pure Mathematics, Chapter 4, Algebra, Part 2. The study of indeterminate equations is called Diophantine Analysis, from Diophantos of Alexandria, the last great Greek mathematician, of whose work six books remain, which treat of such problems as to find a right-angle triangle such that the difference of its sides is a square, and also the greater alone is a square, and thirdly its area plus the less side is a square. A solution to this problem is to take 1, 2 for the lengths of the sides. The Fermat equation x to the nth power plus y to the nth power equals z to the nth power is an indeterminate equation. The most famous problem of this type is the cattle problem, attributed to Archimedes, the most celebrated problem of antiquity. It is in the form of an epigram and has been translated by T.L. Heath as follows. Compute, O stranger, the number of cattle of Helios which once grazed on the plains of Sicily, divided according to their color, to wit, one, white bulls equals one-half plus one-third of the black bulls plus yellow bulls, two, black bulls equals one-quarter and one-fifth of the dappled bulls plus the yellow, three, dappled bulls equals one-sixth plus one-seventh of the white plus yellow. Four, the white cows equals one-third and one-quarter of the black herd. Bulls and cows equals herd. Five, the black cows equals one-quarter and one-fifth of the dappled herd. Six, the dappled cows equals one-fifth and one-sixth of the yellow herd. 7. The yellow cows equals one-sixth plus one-seventh of the white herd. He who can answer the above is no novice in numbers. Nevertheless, he is not yet skilled in wise calculations. But come, consider all the following numerical relations between the oxen of the sun. 8. If the white bulls were combined in one total with the black bulls, they would be in a figure equal in depth and breadth, and the far-stretching plains of Thrinacia would be covered by the figure, square, formed by them. 9. Should the yellow and dappled bulls be collected in one place, they would stand, if they ranged themselves, one after another, in the form of an equilateral triangle. If thou discover the solution of this at the same time, if thou grasp it with thy brain and give correctly all the numbers, O oh stranger, go and exult as a conqueror. Be assured that thou art by all means proved to have abundance of knowledge in this science. The Hillsboro, Illinois, Mathematical Club worked on this problem from 1889 to 1893. The answer given for the number of white bulls will reveal the magnitude of the numbers involved. 1, 596, 510, 804, 671, 144, 531, 435, 526, 194, 370, dot dot dot, 385, 150, 341, 800. Where the ellipses dot 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 indicate the omission of 68,834 periods of three figures each. Each of the ten answers is composed of 206,545 figures. Another of these famous puzzles is attributed to Euclid. A mule and a donkey were walking along laden with corn. The mule said to the donkey, if you gave me one measure, I should carry twice as much as you. If I gave you one, we should both carry equal burdens. 
Tell me their burdens, O most learned master of geometry. If two equations, x plus 2y equals 4, and x minus y equals 1, are given, both x and y are determined. Such a system is called a linear system, and a single pair of values of x and y may be found which satisfies both conditions. The statement of the two equations may be thought of as requiring that the position be found in which the generating point of either line will simultaneously lie on its own line, and also on the other. The graphical solution indicates that the point capital S, x equals 2, y equals 1, or more briefly put, S of 2 comma 1, is the desired point figure. Graph of x plus 2y equals 4 and x minus y equals 1 intersecting at point S. In the study of such systems, Leibniz, 1646 to 1716, discovered a symmetrical arrangement of the known numbers or the coefficients as they are called, which has been of immense service. This symmetrical array is called a determinant. The system of three equations, ax plus by plus cz equals d, lx plus my plus nz equals p, rx plus sy plus tz equals q, may be solved for x by writing a fraction whose numerator is made up of the numbers on the right for a first column, and the coefficients of y and z for the other two, and the denominator is the three columns of coefficients of x and y and z. The following is the arrangement. Figure x equals a quotient, where the numerator contains a matrix, 3 by 3 matrix, DBC, PMN, QST. The denominator contains the 3 by 3 matrix, ABC, LMN, RST. The evaluation of this may be shown in the method used for finding the numerator. Figure. Matrix with lines going through the diagonals of the coefficients DBC, DBC, LMN, LM, QST, QS. The numbers connected with each arrow to the right are multiplied and given the plus sign. Those connected with arrows pointing to the left are multiplied and given the minus sign. The sum of the six terms is the numerator, or DMT plus BNQ plus CPS minus SMQ minus BPT minus DSN. Similarly for the denominator. An equation of the form x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 0, called a quadratic or equation of the second degree, has been solved by completing the square. Another method is by means of a graph, x squared minus 4x minus 5 is placed equal to y, and the graph drawn by taking particular values for x, and from these determining the values of y which goes with each. A table of these values, taken from Boyd's algebra, shows the process. It is required to find the values of x which makes y equal 0, or which satisfy x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals y, when y equals 0. In the figure, y equals 0 when the curve crosses the x-axis, capital X prime x, or the values r, minus 1, plus 5. x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 0. Then, when x equals minus 1, or plus 5. Figure. Table on the left, graph on the right. In the table, title for y equals x squared minus 4x minus 5, two columns, x and y. Contents of column x, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, etc. Minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc. Second column, y. 
minus 5, minus 8, minus 9, minus 8, minus 5, 0, plus 7, etc., 0, plus 7, plus 16, etc. The graph to the right of the table is a graph of the x and y coordinates. End of figure. Another figure taken from the same text shows the method of solving the simultaneous quadratic system x squared plus y squared minus 2xy minus 4x minus 8y minus 20 equals 0. xy equals minus 2. Capital P, Q, R, S are the points of intersection of the two curves, and the value of x and y for each can be read directly from the figure. Solving the equation x squared minus 6x equals minus 13, by completing the square adding 9 to both members, x is found to be equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of minus 4. And the question arises, what is the measuring of the square root of minus 4? It is known that plus 2 squared equals plus 4 and that minus 2 squared equals plus 4. No number in the system so far considered will, when squared, give a negative number, and means must be devised by which such a number may be interpreted. Square root of minus 4 may be factored into square root of 4 square root of minus 1, or 2 square root of minus 1. If 2 be multiplied by minus 1, the result is minus 2, or the point A is changed over to the position b. Square root of minus 1 multiplied by itself must produce minus 1 from the notion of square root or square root of minus 1 times square root of minus 1 equals minus 1. Figure. A graph containing a parabola at about a 45 degree angle from the vertical and a hyperbola. The parabola and the hyperbola intersect at four points labeled P, Q, R, and S. Then, two times the square root of minus one times the square root of minus one equals minus two. If two be multiplied twice in succession by the square root of minus one, the result is moving A to B then it is reasonable to suppose that one multiplication, or two times the square root of minus one, should move it halfway. All that is now necessary is to choose the path. If A should be moved along the line AB, half the motion would carry it to zero, or square root of minus one times two equals zero. But 0 times 2 equals 0, and that would require that square root of minus 1 equals 0. But this is not desirable. The next simplest path is a semicircle. Figure. A circle on a graph intersecting the x-axis at points A and B, which are plus 2 and minus 2 respectively, and the y-axis at c and d, which is 2 times the square root of minus 1, and minus 2 times the square root of minus 1. If two multiplications carry a to b, a single multiplication should carry it to c. This is found to be a satisfactory definition, for by three multiplications, a is carried around to d. 2 times the square root of minus 1 times the square root of minus 1 times the square root of minus 1 equals 2 times minus 1 times the square root of minus 1, which equals minus 2 times the square root of minus 1. That is, d is marked with the minus sign of c, which should be so, and a fourth multiplication gives 2. That is, four multiplications carries a through a complete revolution. The square root of minus 1 is indicated by i, which has the function of a sign, merely indicating that the number before, which it is placed, belongs on the vertical line CD, while a number without such a sign is on the horizontal line AB, that is, a real number. A number represented on AB is called a pure imaginary. 
The name imaginary or fictitious number being given to expressions of this kind which constantly arose in the solution of equations and to which no meaning had been attached. Bascara says, The square of a positive as well as of a negative number is positive, and the square root of a positive number is double, positive and negative. There can be no square root of a negative number, for this is no square. The Italian algebraists called them impossible numbers. It was not until 1797 that Caspar Wessel devised a method of representation of imaginaries, but it did not attract particular attention. Again in 1806, Jean-Robert Argand independently arrived at the representation given above. It is a curious fact that the entire known biography of Argand could be written in half a dozen lines, yet his work is the basis of one of the most extensive fields in all mathematics. The number system now consists of real numbers represented on a horizontal line and pure imaginaries on a vertical line. The combination of these two classes forms the class complex numbers, which covers the entire plane. In the figure, 3 plus 2i is found by stepping off 3 units to the right of O and 2 units up giving point P. On the axis of real numbers, O4, the point marked 3, represents the number 3, but it was found to be sometimes more convenient to think of 3 as represented by the segment of line beginning with O and ending with 3. With the number 2 plus 3i, it will be thought of as represented by the point P or by the line segment OP at will. The angle MOP is called the amplitude of P and is denoted by phi. The length of OP, which is the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, which equals the square root of 13, is termed a modulus and is indicated by mod p. Complex numbers obey the laws laid down for real numbers. They may be subjected to the six operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, involution, and evolution. The mode of addition is the same as that employed in adding real numbers. Figure. The complex plane. From minus 3 to plus 4 on the real numbers, minus 3i to plus 3i on the imaginary axis, a line drawn from the origin to the point P, 3 plus 2i, with angle phi. If the real numbers are thought of as line segments and 2 is to be added to 3, it is done by placing the initial point O of O2 on the terminal point 3 of O3. The point then occupied by point 2 of O2 in its new position is 5, and O5 is the segment sum of O3 and O2. If the two complexes 2 plus 3i and 5 plus 2i are to be added, they are represented as in the figure, the first by OP and the second by OQ. Starting at P, lay off OL 5 units to the right and 2 units up. OR, which is the diagonal of a parallelogram on OP and OQ, is the sum of 2 plus 3i and 5 plus 2i. The number system now covers the entire plane. To every point in the plane there is a number and vice versa. The plane is two-dimensional, that is, by the Cartesian coordinates x, y, a point is determined by two values, x and y or in the argon diagram by the two real numbers a and b in the complex a plus bi. Space is three-dimensional in points. Figure, the complex plane, real numbers from 0 to 8, imaginary numbers from 0 to 5i. A parallelogram, starting at the origin and going up to p and to the right to r at its peak and then back to q which is at 5 plus 2i. P is at 2 plus 3i. End figure. To locate a point in a room completely, it is necessary to specify its distances respectively from, say, the floor and each of two intersecting walls, or by three numbers.
To take in all points in space, a third line or axis would be drawn perpendicular to the plane of the paper in the argon diagram at point O. Now if a third sign of direction J were used and the number system extended to take in space, what would result? The apparent discrepancy between the number system, which is two-dimensional, and space, which is three-dimensional, has been a source of a great deal of study and involves some of the most important theorems of algebraic analysis. A general equation of the form a0 times x to the n plus a1 times x to the n minus 1 plus a2 times x to the n minus 2 plus dot 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 plus a sub n minus 1 times x plus a sub n equals 0 is said to be of the nth degree where the exponents are all whole numbers. It has been proved that if such an equation is satisfied by a single value of x, it is satisfied by n values, that is, it has n roots. These roots may all be real or part real and part complex. If there are complex roots, they enter in pairs, which are conjugate. That is, if a plus bi is a root, so also is a minus bi. The condition that, if it is satisfied by a single root, is very important. Why should it not be? It was found that the quadratic could be easily solved in very many special equations of a higher degree. The cubic, or equation of the third degree, taxed the powers of the algebraists, and it was not until 1545 that a general solution was found. It seems almost axiomatic that the general equation must have a root, but such things are not taken for granted. The first proof that the general equation with whole numbers for exponents and coefficients, real or complex, was given in Argonne's memoirs. Since that time, a number of proofs have been offered, the principal contributor being Cauchy. This is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Now, since the hypothesis is proved, the conclusion that there are n roots is easily proved, such proof being familiar to any schoolboy. The next concern is, what is the nature of the roots? Weierstrass proved that the roots all are of the form a plus bi, that is, complex numbers of the two-dimensional system. This at once settles the question raised above, whether or not it is possible to extend the number system to the three dimensions of space. If the extension is made, such numbers would not be the roots of algebraic equations. In other words, such numbers would not be subject to the ordinary laws of algebra. Two diverging lines of thought begin here. If such extension of the number system be made, what formal laws of algebra should be rejected? Having determined the nature of the roots of equations to devise laws by which an equation may be solved. The second of the two will be considered first. It has been seen that the quadratic is solvable. Equations of higher degree have been solved in special cases. The general solution of the cubic next received attention. The following account of the solution of the cubic is from Ball's History of Mathematics. Niccolo Fontana, generally known as Nicholas Tartaglia, that is Nicholas the Stammerer, was born at Brescia in 1500 and died in Venice on December 14, 1557. After the capture of the town by the French in 1512, most of the inhabitants took refuge in the cathedral and were there massacred by the soldiers. His father, who was a postal messenger at Brescia, was among the killed. The boy himself had his skull split through in three places, while both his jaws and his palate were cut open. He was left for dead, but his mother got into the cathedral and, finding him still alive, managed to carry him off. Deprived of all resources, she recollected that dogs, when wounded, always licked the injured place, and to that remedy he attributed his ultimate recovery. But the injury to his palate produced an impediment in his speech, from which he received his nickname. His mother managed to get sufficient money to pay for his attendance at school for fifteen days, and he took advantage of it to steal a copybook from which he subsequently taught himself to read and write. But so poor were they that he tells us he could not afford to buy paper, and was obliged to make use of tombstones as slates on which to work his exercises. 
He commenced his public life by lecturing at Verona, but he was appointed at some time before 1535 to a chair of mathematics at Venice, where he was living when he became famous through his acceptance of a challenge from a certain Antonio del Fiore. Fiore had learned from his master, one Scipione Furio, who died at Bologna in 1526, an empirical solution of a cubic equation of the form x cubed plus qx equals r. This solution was previously unknown in Europe, and it is probable that Ferio had found the result in an Arab work. Tartaglia, in answer to a request from Cola in 1530, stated that he would affect the solution of a numerical equation of the form x cubed plus px squared equals r. Fiori, believing that Tartaglia was an imposter, challenged him to a contest. According to this challenge, each of them was to deposit a certain stake with a notary, and whoever could solve the most problems out of a collection of 30 propounded by the other was to get the stakes, 30 days being allowed for the solution of the questions proposed. Tartaglia was aware that his adversary was acquainted with the solution of a cubic equation of some particular form, and suspecting that the questions proposed to him would all depend on the solution of such cubic equations, set himself the problem to find a general solution, and certainly discovered how to obtain a solution of some, if not all, cubic equations. When the contest took place, all the questions proposed to Tartaglia were, as he suspected, reducible to the solution of a cubic equation, and he succeeded within two hours in bringing them to particular cases of the equation x cubed plus qx equals r, of which he knew the solution. His opponent failed to solve any of the problems which were proposed to him, which, as a matter of fact, were all reducible to numerical equations of the form x cubed plus px squared equals r. Notice that in this form, the x squared term is present, while in the other, the x term appears. Tartaglia was therefore the conqueror, and he subsequently composed some verses commemorative of his victory. Tartaglia, as was the custom in those days, did not reveal his method of solution. He hoped to publish a treatise on algebra of which the crowning feature would be the making known to the world this newly discovered solution of the cubic. But in this, he was to be disappointed through the treachery of Girolamo Cardan, the most famous astrologer of the time. This Cardan was a most strange admixture of genius and madness a gambler if not a murderer, an ardent student of science solving problems which had long baffled investigation. The elder of his two sons was executed for poisoning his wife, while it is said that Cardan cut off the ears of the younger in a fit of rage. In 1570, Cardan was imprisoned for heresy on account of having published The Horoscope of Christ. Figure 36 First published solution of the cubic equation from Ars Magna, 1545. The figure consists of writing in Latin. He afterwards settled at Rome, where he received a pension in order to secure his services as astrologer to the court. Having foretold that he should die on a particular day, he felt called upon to commit suicide to preserve his reputation. In 1545, Cardan completed and published the Ars Magna, the most advanced treatise on algebra which had appeared up to that time in which was given Tartaglia's solution of the cubic. This method has since been known as Cardan's method. Cardan also published the work of his pupil Ferrari on the biquadratic or equation of the fourth degree. This solution is sometimes known by Bombelli's name, to whom is due the credit of representing the three roots to the simplest form in the so-called irreducible case. From this time on, mathematicians devoted a great amount of time in attempting the solution of equations of higher degree. In his reflections on the resolution of algebraic equations, Lagrange, 1736-1813, gave a scientific classification of the methods already applied to the cubic and biquadratic, but was unable to apply them to the quintic or equation of the fifth degree. 
In this discussion, the foundation was laid for the study of substitutions, but other matters pressing for attention made necessary the laying aside of this work. He determined to take up the subject at some future time, but never did so. It was reserved for the brilliant young Norwegian Niels Henrik Abel, 1802-1829, to give a rigid demonstration of the impossibility of solving the quintic or higher equations by means of radicals. The extension of the number system to three dimensions was attempted by Argand and resulted in failure. A corollary of Weierstrass's theorem that the root of an algebraic equation must be of the form a plus bi is that no further extension can be made and have the numbers still conform to the laws of algebra. In the formation of the complex number, there are two units, one, or the unit along the axis of reals, and i, the unit along the axis of pure imaginaries. If the system is to be extended to space, a third unit is to be chosen, call it J, which will be measured on a perpendicular to the two axes already used. A number of this form would be A plus BI plus CJ. When the negative number was introduced, it was assumed that in multiplication it should obey the commutative law, that 1 times I equals I times 1. This was a pure assumption, made in order to give a meaning to multiplication by a negative. It was the subject of years of meditation with William Rowan Hamilton as to what would be necessary in order to extend the system so as to include the new unit J. At last, on the 16th of October, 1843, while walking with his wife along the Royal Canal in Dublin, the discovery flashed upon him that the commutative law might be rejected, and he engraved with his knife on a stone and brougham bridge the fundamental formula of the new algebra which is called quaternions. This bridge is since known as Quaternion Bridge. In 1844 appeared a classic work on analysis, the Ausdehnungslehre of Hermann Gossmann in which the number system is carried to n dimensions. This work attracted so little notice on account of its philosophische Allgemeinheit, it is said that after eight years but one man had read it. In 1862, a new edition was published which received no more appreciation than the first, and at the age of 53, its author, with a heavy heart, gave up mathematics for the study of Sanskrit. The generalization of algebra is carried out by assuming any number of units, i, j, k, l, etc., forming numbers with them as a plus bi plus cj plus dk plus el plus dot dot dot, and choosing to reject one or the other of the laws of ordinary algebra, for at least one must be rejected, and then building up a consistent algebra upon the remaining laws. In 1870, Benjamin Pierce, one of the foremost mathematicians that America has produced, published his Linear Associative Algebra, giving the elements of 162 algebras in which the numbers are linear functions of the units and obey the associative law. End of Section 8. Section 9 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi in November 2020. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 1. Pure Mathematics. Chapter 5. Geometry, Part 1 Geometry is the science of space, and is concerned with relations which exist between its various elements, linear, superficial, and solid. The earliest measurements were linear, and for the unit was taken some portion of the human body, for example, finger breadth, palm, span, foot, L, cubit, and fathom, but the body does not possess any convenient unit for the measurement of either surface or solid. 
The oldest geometrical work known uses the square unit for areas and the cubical unit for solids. How and when the choice of such units was made is difficult to say. The study of primitive races made possible the reconstruction of the steps in the formation of the number concept, but such study is silent in regard to the beginnings of geometry. The word geometry, from the Greek meaning to measure the earth, has its origin, as is the case with most sciences, in the needs of the human being at some particular time, as is indicated by Herodotus, where he says that Sesostris, circa 1400 BC, divided the land of Egypt into rectangular plots for the purpose of more convenient taxation, that the annual floods, caused by the rising of the Nile, often swept away portions of a plot, and that surveyors were in such cases appointed to assess the necessary reduction in the tax. Hence, in my opinion, arose geometry, and so came into Greece. Ames gives a number of problems concerning the calculation of the contents of barns, but as the shapes are unknown, it is impossible to interpret them. As with his work in arithmetic, no rules are given, but a number of problems solved in a similar manner. The method used in finding the contents of a barn is to multiply together two of the dimensions, and this by one and one-half the third. He also finds the area of a square, of an oblong, of an isosceles triangle, and of an isosceles trapezoid, the latter two being incorrectly found. In the isosceles triangle, a triangle with two equal sides, Ames takes half the product of the base and one of the equal sides, and follows the analogous proceeding with the isosceles trapezoid. While the error is slight in the examples given, it is sufficient to show that the results were only empirical, and that Ames was unable to extract the square roots which are necessary in an exact solution. The area of a circle is found by deducting from the diameter its one-ninth and squaring the remainder, which gives the value of the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle, usually indicated by pi, to be 3.1604, a value much more nearly correct than those used by many later writers. Another glimpse of Egyptian geometry is given by Democritus, circa 460 to 370 BC. In the construction of plain figures with proof, no one has yet surpassed me, not even the Harpedonopte of Egypt. To Professor Cantor is due the credit of making clear the exact meaning of this word, which is a compound of two words meaning rope stretchers or rope fasteners. Cantor says, there is no doubt that the Egyptians were very careful about the exact orientation of their temples and other public buildings. But inscriptions seem to show that only the north and south lines were drawn by actual observation of the stars. The east and west lines were drawn at right angles to the others. Now it appears, from the practice of Heron of Alexandria and of the ancient Indian and probably also the Chinese geometers, that a common method of securing a right angle between two very long lines was to stretch round three pegs a rope measured in three portions, which were to one another in the ratio three to four to five. The triangle thus formed is right angled. Further, the operation of rope stretching is mentioned in Egypt without explanation at an extremely early time, Amenemhat I. If this be the correct explanation of it, then the Egyptians were acquainted 2000 years BC with a particular case of the proposition now known as the Pythagorean theorem. Egyptian geometry, as well as the other sciences, was in the hands of the priestly caste, whose conservatism is illustrated by the fact that Egyptian doctors used only the recipes of the ancient sacred books for fear of being accused of manslaughter if the patient died. That no progress was made beyond that of Ames is borne out by the Edfu inscriptions of 107 to 88 BC, 
200 years after Euclid, in which the formula given by Ames for the isosceles trapezoid is still given, but applied to any four-sided figure, a proceeding of which Ames himself would not have been guilty. That the early Greek geometers derived their first knowledge from the Egyptians is derived from many sources. Eudemus, circa 330, pupil of Aristotle, wrote a history of geometry in which occurs this passage. Geometry is said by many to have been invented among the Egyptians, its origin being due to the measurement of plots of land. This was necessary there because of the rising of the Nile, which obliterated the boundaries appertaining to separate owners. Nor is it marvellous that the discovery of this and other sciences should have arisen from such an occasion, since everything which moves in development will advance from the imperfect to the perfect. From mere sense perception to calculation, and from this to reasoning, is a natural transition. The last step is the one taken by the Greeks. The Egyptian geometry was concrete, a thing of sense, and to Thales is due the honour of creating the beginnings of abstract geometry, a product of reason, the object of which is to establish precise relations between the parts of a figure, so that some of them could be found from others in a purely rigorous manner. Thales of Miletus, 640 to 546 BC, was a merchantman when his native city was in its most flourishing condition, and resided for a long period in Egypt, from whence he returned to his native city in his old age, bringing with him the knowledge of geometry and astronomy. Tradition informs us that he was one of the first gifted with the acumen to form a trust. Learning from the stars that the crop of olives would be abundant during a certain year, Thales secured control of all of the oil presses, and in the following fall made a large profit through his foresightedness. Aristotle. He announced beforehand an eclipse of the sun, which happened May 28, 585 BC, during a battle between the Medes and Lydians, and to this fact is attributed his inclusion in the ranks of the seven wise men, for, as Plutarch says, he apparently was the only one of these whose wisdom stepped in speculation beyond the limits of practical utility, the rest acquired the name of wisdom in politics. In a conversation concerning Amasis, king of Egypt, between Niloxenus and Thales, given by Plutarch, the former says, Although he, Amasis, admired you, Thales, for other things, yet he particularly liked the manner by which you measured the height of the pyramid without any trouble or instrument, for by merely placing a staff at the extremity of the shadow which the pyramid casts, you formed two triangles by the contact of the sunbeams, and showed that the height of the pyramid was to the height of the staff in the same ratio as their respective shadows. From Proclus it is learned that Thales devised a method of determining the distance of ships at sea by a theorem which is now known as Euclid I, 26. Pythagoras, concerning whose life there is a great deal of obscurity, was probably induced by Thales to visit Egypt when a young man, where he lived many years, afterward visiting Crete and Tyre and perhaps Babylon. Returning to Samos, his home, he found it under the tyranny of Polycrates and migrated to Italy, where he lived and taught for more than twenty years. His brotherhood falling under suspicion owing to its secrecy, Pythagoras fled to Metapontum, where it is supposed he was murdered in a popular outbreak about 500 BC. To Pythagoras, who raised geometry to the rank of a science, are many of the most important theorems. He is said to have introduced weights and measures among the Greeks, to have discovered the numerical relations of the musical scale, to have proved the theorem of squares on the sides of a right triangle, to have discovered that the plane around a point is filled by six equilateral triangles, four squares, or three hexagons, 
to have found the construction of a figure upon a line which is similar to a given figure and equivalent to a second given figure. The word mathematics is due to the Pythagorean school, and to them is attributed the division of a line into extreme and mean ratio, called the golden section, so that the whole line is to the greater segment as this segment is to the lesser, from which construction is derived that of the inscription in a circle of the regular five and ten-sided polygons. Proclus says that Pythagoras discovered the construction of the cosmic figures, the five bodies in the sphere, concerning one of which Iamblichus says that Hippasus was drowned for the impiety of claiming its discovery, whereas the whole was his discovery, for it is thus they speak of Pythagoras, and they do not call him by his name. The five regular solids were alternately compared by the Pythagoreans with the five worlds and with the five senses of man. Kepler, led astray by the speculations of the philosophers, conjectured that they were in some way connected with the orbits of the five worlds. He accordingly arranged the five solids in order, each inscribed in a sphere, which in turn was inscribed in the next figure and with the sun at the centre. The surfaces of the spheres carried the orbits of the planes. He found the ratio of the distances to be remarkably near the ratio of the actual distances from the sun. He made known his remarkable pseudo-discovery in the Mysterium Cosmographicum, 1596, which had at least one beneficial effect in that it brought him to the notice of Galileo and Tycho Brahe and opened the way for the future true discoveries which have placed his name in the galaxy of the immortals. Plutarch, in relating the discovery of the construction of a figure similar to one and equivalent to another, says that Pythagoras offered a sacrifice in thanksgiving, thinking it finer and more elegant than the other concerning the squares on the sides of a right triangle. Pythagoras thought that the distances of the heavenly bodies from the earth form the musical progression, from which comes the expression, the harmony of the spheres. The Pythagorean theorem that the square described on the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equivalent to the sum of the two squares described on the sides is the most famous theorem of geometry. It is said that over a thousand distinct proofs have been offered for it. The proof given by Pythagoras has never been found. He probably was led to the investigation of the figure from the observation of the special case, which is common in flooring with square tiles, as in the figure. The Egyptians were familiar with the right-angle property of the particular triangle with sides 3, 4, 5. Within the last few years it has not only been shown that the Hindus were familiar with the Pythagorean theorem in all its generality, and the theory of the irrational long before the time of Pythagoras, but Burke goes so far as to assert that the much-travelled Pythagoras obtained his knowledge from India. The proof given in the school text of today is the classic one given by Euclid, with, notwithstanding the strictures of Schopenhauer as a mousetrap proof and a proof walking on stilts, nay, a mean underhand proof, is one of the most beautiful ever offered. One of the most celebrated forms of proof is known as perigal's dissection, in which the squares are so cut that H plus P plus R plus L plus E in the figure may be arranged to form the large square. Another form of dissection is given in the second figure in the shape of a puzzle, in which the parts a, B, C, D, E are to be cut out and arranged so as to exactly cover the large square. This theorem is the limiting case between two theorems which may be stated together. The square on the side opposite an acute, obtuse, angle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides diminished, increased, by twice the rectangle of one of those sides and the projection of the other upon it. 
The figure of the Pythagorean theorem was called by the Persians the princess, and the other two figures were the sisters of the princess. The figure of one of these cases is here given, which corresponds to the figure given by Euclid for the Pythagorean theorem. In the accompanying figure, if the triangle in question is ABC, AB is the side opposite the acute angle BCA. CE is the projection of CA upon CB. If CA is allowed to revolve about point C to the position CA double prime, A double prime B will have become a side opposite an obtuse, greater than a right, angle. But in the turning, it passes through the condition of perpendicularity CA prime, and the right triangle CA prime B is the boundary between the two cases. When this condition occurs, the projection CE is zero and the Pythagorean theorem results. The three cases are stated in a single law in trigonometry called the law of cosines, which in turn is but one case of a general law in spherical, plane, and pseudospherical geometry. The 3rd century BC produced the three greatest mathematicians of antiquity, Euclid, Archimedes, and Apollonius, of which the earliest was Euclid. Very little is known of his life. Proclus gives this account on him. Not much younger than these, Hermotimus and Philippus, is Euclid, who put together the elements, collecting many of Eudox's theorems, perfecting many of Theatetus, and also bringing to irrefragable demonstration the things which were only somewhat loosely proved by his predecessors. This man lived in the time of the first Ptolemy. For Archimedes, who came immediately after the first Ptolemy, makes mention of Euclid, and further, they say that Ptolemy once asked him if there was in geometry any shorter way than that of the elements, and he answered that there was no royal road to geometry. He is younger than the pupils of Plato, but older than Erastosthenes and Archimedes, for the latter were contemporary with one another, as Erastosthenes somewhere says. That Euclid founded a school at Alexandria is known from this passage from Pappus. Apollonius spent a very long time with the pupils of Euclid at Alexandria, and it was thus that he acquired such a scientific habit of thought. Stobaeus relates that someone who had begun to read geometry with Euclid, when he had learned the first theorem, asked Euclid, But what shall I get by learning these things? Euclid called his slave and said, Give him threepence, since he must make gain out of what he learns. The importance of Euclid's elements was recognized by the Greek philosophers, who posted on the doors of their schools, Let no one enter here who is unacquainted with Euclid. The purpose of the elements is to begin with a few common notions which are statements assumed to be evident to any reasoning being, and together with five assumptions from these, build step by step a complete chain of theorems. That he succeeded is evidenced by the following passage from Brill. Whatever has been said in praise of mathematics, of the strength, perspicuity, and rigor of its presentation, all is especially true of this work of the great Alexandrian. Definitions, axioms, and conclusions are joined together link by link as into a chain, firm and inflexible, of binding force, but also cold and hard, repellent to a productive mind and affording no room for independent activity. A ripened understanding is needed to appreciate the classic beauties of this great monument of Greek ingenuity. It is not the arena for the youth eager for enterprise. To captivate him, a field of action is better suited, where he may hope to discover something new, unexpected. The work of Euclid was so perfect that it has remained for two thousand years the model from which textbooks in elementary geometry have been written. 
it is safe to say that it is the greatest work that a single human mind has ever produced the elements was divided into thirteen books best known today through three translators simpson heiberg and t l heath the latter work appeared in nineteen o eight and is of immense value in the realization of the great geometer's work euclid defines a point as that which has no part a line as breadthless length and a straight line as a line which lies evenly with the points on itself five postulates and five common notions form the foundation upon which the superstructure is built the following are granted one that a straight line may be drawn from any point to any point two that a finite straight line may be produced continuously in a finite straight line. 3. That a circle may be drawn with any center and any radius. 4. That all right angles are equal to one another. 5. That if a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. It will be noticed that the plane geometry is built on three elements, the point, the straight line, and the circle. This may be put otherwise. The three are only the circle and its two limiting forms, the point being the circle when its radius has become zero, and the straight line the form when the radius of the circle has increased to infinity. These three elements limit Euclidean geometry to two instruments, the undivided straight edge and the compass. Euclid assumes that the circle may be drawn, but a straight line has been drawn. It is a significant fact that it was not until 1864 that an instrument was invented by Pocillier by which a straight line could be drawn by mechanical means. Postulate 2 implies that space is continuous, not discrete, and also assumes its infinitude. The five common notions are 1. Things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. 2. If equals be added to equals, the sums are equal. 3. If equals be subtracted from equals, the remainders are equal. 4. Things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. 5. The whole is greater than any part. Common notion 4 implies the free mobility of rigid bodies in space. Bertrand Russell says, what is called motion in geometry is merely the transference of attention from one figure to another, and actual superposition nominally employed by Euclid is not required. Common notion 5 separates the finite from the infinite. The modern definition of an infinite element is that which is equal to a part of itself. According to Proclus, Every problem and every theorem which is complete, with all its parts perfect, purports to contain in itself all of the following elements, enunciation, setting out, definition or specification, construction or machinery, proof and conclusion. The enunciation states what is given and what is sought. The setting out marks off what is given beforehand and adapts it to the investigation. The definition makes clear the particular thing sought. The construction adds what is needed for the purpose of finding out what is sought. The proof draws the required inference by reasoning scientifically from acknowledged facts. The conclusion reverts again to the enunciation, confirming what has been demonstrated. The fifth proposition of Book One asserting the equality of the base angles of an isosceles triangle has been called the pons asinorum or bridge of asses the inference being that if the youth had ability to master this theorem, 
his future career in geometry was assured. An important set of theorems in Book I is concerned with the conditions of equality of triangles, which may be stated as follows. 1. Two triangles are equal if the three sides of one are respectively equal to the three sides of the other. 2. Two triangles are equal if two sides and the included angle of one are respectively equal to the corresponding parts of the other. 2. Prime. Two triangles are equal when a side and the two adjacent angles are equal, respectively to the corresponding parts of the other. 3. Two triangles are equal when two sides and an angle opposite one of them are equal, respectively to the corresponding parts of the other, containing, however, an ambiguous case. 3. Prime. Two triangles are equal when two angles and a side opposite one of them are equal, respectively to the corresponding parts of the other. It will be noticed that these are arranged in pairs, with the exception of one, which would be paired with the theorem stating the equality of the triangles, provided the corresponding angles are equal, which is not necessarily true in plane geometry. The primed number of each pair may be gotten from the unprimed by changing side to angle and vice versa. A side is determined by the two endpoints, and an angle by the two including lines, the point and line being the two limiting cases, one on either side of the circle. Such a property of certain theorems is called reciprocity or duality, and enables one to think of such a theorem as a theorem in points or a theorem in lines as well. This statement well illustrates duality. Two points, lines, determine a line, point. In the triangle theorems, the breaking down of reciprocity in one is due to the fact that the three angles of a triangle are not independent, as is the case in sphere geometry. If two are given, the third may be found by subtracting the sum of the two from two right angles. Three elements, a majority of the five which may be independent, are required for the determination of a triangle. End of section 9「Section 10 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2021. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rold Wheeler. Part 1. Pure Mathematics. Chapter 5. Geometry. Part 2. The most important of the remaining theorems of Book 1 are those treating of parallels, which will be considered later, and the Pythagorean theorem. Book 3 treats of circles. Book 4 of the inscription of regular polygons in the circle, one of the famous problems of the ancients, and which leads to the usual method of determining the approximate value of the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. The remaining books through Book 9 are mostly concerned with the geometry of lines, that is, arithmetic treated geometrically. The last three books are concerned with the geometry of space and culminate in the regular solid figures which may be inscribed in a sphere. While Euclid has been the guiding star of geometrical textbooks for twenty centuries, yet the tides of darkness have been so dense at many times that only the faintest gleams of light were discernible. About 1570, Sir Henry Savile, warden of Merton College, strove to arouse an interest by a course of lectures on Greek geometry, which were published in 1621. Concluding, he says, by the grace of God, gentlemen hearers, I have performed my promise, I have redeemed my pledge. I have explained, according to my ability, 
the definitions, postulates, axioms, and the first eight propositions of the elements of Euclid. Here, sinking under the weight of years, I lay down my art and my instruments. Kajori. Saval says, In the beautiful structure of geometry there are two blemishes, two defects. I know no more. These were the assumption of the fifth postulate and the theory of proportion. The non-Euclidean geometry has vindicated Euclid's position in the first, and it has taken 500 years from the time of Seville to appreciate the theory of proportion. The purpose of Euclid was to build up, with a minimum of assumptions, a logical structure in which reason is the sole factor. In such a system, the figure that is drawn is simply a guide to the thought and might be entirely dispensed with. Unless it is used with care, it may by subtly involving intuition ensnare one into error. The following example of the result of such misleading is well known. ABCD is a square. AB is bisected perpendicularly at E. DF is drawn equal to BD. AF is bisected perpendicularly at G. The two perpendiculars meet at H. CH, DH, AH and FH are drawn in the triangles ACH and FDH. CH is equal to DH. AC is equal to FD. AH is equal to FH. Therefore, by the theorem of equality of two triangles having sides respectively equal, the triangles ACH and FDH are equal, and the corresponding angles ACH and FDH are equals. But angle ACH is equal to angle BDH, from which angle FDH is equal angle BDH, a magnitude equaling a part of itself which contradicts the fifth common notion, that a whole is greater than any part of it. This elimination of observation from the geometry taught the schoolboy has led to attacks in recent years on the advisability of the use of Euclid as a school text. J. J. Sylvester, one of England's two greatest mathematicians, in answer to Huxley's statement that mathematics is that study which knows nothing of observation, nothing of experiment, nothing of induction, nothing of causation, gave voice to the following. I should rejoice to see Euclid honourably shelved or buried deeper than air plummet sounded out of the schoolboy's reach. The Perry movement, inaugurated in England by John Perry in 1901, has in a measure resulted in departing from Euclid so as to make geometry more of a subject of experiment and observation. The second great mathematician of this period was Archimedes, born at Syracuse in 287 BC, studied at Alexandria, returned to Sicily, and died in his native city in 212 BC. Aside from his mathematical contributions, his mechanical ability was marvellous. Archimedes was killed during the sack of Syracuse by the Romans under Marcellus. A soldier found him in the garden tracing a geometrical figure in the sand, as was customary in those days. Archimedes told him to get off the figure and not spoil it. The soldier, insulted, thrust him through with his dagger. The figure of a sphere inscribed in a cylinder was cut on his tomb in commemoration of his favourite theorem that the volume of the sphere is two-thirds that of the cylinder and its surface is four times that of the base of the cylinder. Cicero rediscovered the tomb in 75 BC and gives a beautiful account of his search in Tusculan Disputations, Book 5, 23. Shall I not, then, prefer the life of Plato and Architas, manifestly wise and learned men, to his, Dionysus, than which nothing can possibly be more horrid or miserable or detestable? 
I will present you with an humble and obscure mathematician of the same city, called Archimedes, who lived many years after, whose tomb, overgrown with shrubs and briars, I, in my questorship, discovered, when the Syracusans knew nothing of it, and even denied that there was any such thing remaining, for I remembered some verses which I had been informed were engraved on his monument, there was placed a sphere with a cylinder. When I had carefully examined all the monuments, for there are a great many tombs at the gate Achratme, I observed a small column standing out a little above the briars, with the figure of a sphere and cylinder upon it, whereupon I immediately said to the Syracusans, for there were some of their principal men with me there, that I imagined that was what I was inquiring for. Several men, being sent with sighs, cleared the way, and made an opening for us. When we could get at it, and were come near to the front of the pedestal, I found the inscription, though the latter part of all the verses were effaced almost half-way. Thus one of the noblest cities of Greece, and one which at one time likewise had been very celebrated for learning, had known nothing of the monument of its greatest genius, if it had not been discovered to them by a native of Arpinum. The work on the quadrature, or finding the area of a segment, of the parabola, is one of the most important works of Archimedes. The proof of the principal theorem of this work depends upon the method of exhaustions invented by Eudoxus, and which is the forerunner of the modern powerful implementation of analysis, the calculus. The lemma is thus stated by Archimedes. The excess by which the greater of two unequal areas exceeds the less can, if it be continually added to itself, be made to exceed any finite quantity. The theorem itself asserts that the area of a segment of the parabola is equal to four-thirds of a certain triangle inscribed in it. Another important work, The Sphere and the Cylinder, containing sixty propositions, was sent to his friends in Alexandria, in which he purposely misstated some of his results, to deceive those vain geometricians who say they have found everything, but never give their proofs, and sometimes claim they have discovered what is impossible. The work of Archimedes is of particular interest at the present time, owing to the discovery of a lost work by Professor Heiberg in Constantinople during the summer of 1906. The purpose of this work, which is addressed to Aristosthenes, is well summed up in the following statement, and makes clear the method by which Archimedes arrived at his discoveries. I have thought it well to analyze and lay down for you in this same book a peculiar method by means of which it will be possible for you to derive instruction as to how certain mathematical questions may be investigated by means of mechanics. And I am convinced that this is equally profitable in demonstrating a proposition itself, for much that was made evident to me through the medium of mechanics was later proved by means of geometry, because the treatment by the former method had not yet been established by way of a demonstration. For of course it is easier to establish a proof, if one has in this way previously obtained a conception of the questions, than for him to seek it without such a preliminary notion. Indeed, I assume that someone among the investigators of today, or in the future, will discover by the method here set forth still other propositions which have not yet occurred to us. Says Professor Smith, Perhaps in all the history of mathematics no such prophetic truth was ever put into words. It would almost seem as if Archimedes must have seen as in a vision the methods of Galileo, Cavalieri, Pascal, Newton, and many of the other great makers of the mathematics of the Renaissance and the present time. Very little is known of the life of the third member of this great trinity, Apollonius of Perga, the great geometer. It is supposed that he was born about 260 BC and died about 200 BC. 
He studied at Alexandria for many years and probably lectured there. His great work on the conic sections contains practically all of the theorems of the textbooks of today. The work was divided into seven books, perhaps originally into eight, and while very tedious, is characterized by strict Euclidean rigor. A cone is the figure generated by a line passing through a fixed point and constantly touching the circumference of a circle. If O is the point and C the circle, the line OC turns while still passing through O, so that point C traverses the circle. The complete cone consists of the symmetrical figure above O as well as the figure below, and both are extended into space indefinitely. A conic section is a curve which is formed by passing a plane through the cone. One of the best methods of quickly constructing these sections is to immerse a wooden or tin cone in a vessel of water. The line formed around the cone by the surface of the water will be the section. There are three general cases which arise, besides several special ones, as will be seen by the inspection of the figures, which are vertical cross-sections, that is, the eye is supposed to be on a level with the surface of the water and sees this surface as a line S. In figure 1, where the plane S cuts the two opposite generators PC and PB, an ellipse is formed. If the plane S happens to be at right angles to the axis of the cone as in 1A, a circle is the result. In figure 2, the upper half or nap of the cone has been lowered, that is, the cone has been revolved around P until the axis PB has become parallel with the plane S. The curve formed is an open curve and is called a parabola. If the cone be still further turned until both naps cut the water as in figure 3, the hyperbola is the resulting curve. This curve consists of two branches, both of which are open. If the plane S passes through the point P during this investigation, the degenerate conics are formed. One gives a degenerate circle or ellipse, which is a point where the radii have become zero. Two gives a line, which may be regarded as made up of two coincident lines. In three, these lines become distinct and intersect at P. It is thus seen that the parabola is the limiting case through which the varying ellipse passes as it merges into the hyperbola. These three curves may be defined by a single law of motion of a point in a plane, and for purposes of study this is more convenient. A point so moves that its distances form a fixed point, F, called the focus, and from a fixed line, d, d prime, called the directrix, are in a given ratio, e, the eccentricity of the curve. Now, the form of the curve and the class to which it belongs, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola, depends upon the value given to e. In the figure, f is the fixed point, p is the moving point on the curve, and d d prime is the directrix or fixed line. In figure 1, e is less than 1, and the curve is an ellipse. It is seen that it is symmetric to the line y y prime, and therefore must have another directrix, d d prime, on the right, and also a second focus, f prime. In figure 2, e is equal to 1, and the curve is the parabola. This curve constantly recedes from the line, yet ever curves to it. It may be thought of as the left half of an ellipse of which the right focus has been pulled out to the right an infinite distance. It is an open curve, that is, the two arms of the curve never join again. In figure 3 is seen the third case, where E is greater than 1, the hyperbola with two branches. In the generation of this curve, the point starting at A' recedes indefinitely downward to the right. 
it next appears coming back on the upper half of the left branch passing along that branch to an infinite distance and finally coming back along the upper right of the right branch it is convenient sometimes to think of the two ends of the curve being joined by a single infinite point and thus preserve continuity in the motion of the moving point the two branches of the hyperbola constantly approach without ever reaching the two intersecting lines o x prime and o y prime in the figure that is the curves are said to be asymptotic to these lines which are called the asymptotes of the curve in the full page figure is seen the relation which exists between the foci and directrices of the plane figure and the cone itself the plane a b cuts the ellipse from the cone if a sphere be dropped in the cone so that it will be in the cone and just touch the plane the point of touching or tangency will be a focus two such spheres are possible the small one above the plane and the large one below the foci are f and f prime these spheres touch the cone in circles if planes be passed through these circles as ac and bc they will cut the original cutting plane ab in the lines am and bn which are the directrices the futility of the argument that it is vain to cultivate truth for truth's sake is well seen in the case of the conics of apollonius this monumental work lay dormant and did not reach fruition until seventeen centuries after when kepler found the paths of the planets to be ellipses and newton subjected to law the wanderer of the celestial seas the comet whose path is an ellipse if it is a regular visitor of the solar system if the path of the comet is not an ellipse it is a parabola and it comes but once under the influence of the sun and then forever loses itself in the vastness of space antiquity has left us three famous problems the quadrature of the circle the duplication of the cube called the delian problem and the trisection of the angle or more generally the problem of the inscription of the regular polygons in a circle the quadrature of the circle popularly known as squaring the circle is the problem of finding the side of a square which has the same area as a given circle the philosopher anaxagoras occupied himself with this problem in his prison hippocrates of chios made one of the most famous attempts at its solution which resulted in finding a loon or surface in the shape of a crescent bounded by two arcs which was equal in area to a square archimedes showed that the problem is equivalent to finding the area of a right-angled triangle whose sides are respectively the perimeter of the circle and its radius and further showed that the ratio of these two sides is more than three one seventh and less than three ten seventy one this ratio is indicated by the greek letter pi introduced by w jones in seventeen o six and crystallized in use by euler archimedes method of determining its value was by inscribing and circumscribing polygons of ninety-six sides and by comparing the ratio of the perimeter of the circumscribed polygon to the radius determined a value greater than pi and by using the inscribed polygon he arrived at a value less than pi the present textbook method is to determine a formula or algorithm by which the perimeter of a polygon of two n sides may be found from the perimeter of the polygon of n sides by carrying this process on indefinitely the ratio may be found to any degree of approximation the ancient egyptians took the value 256 over 81 equal to 3.1605 three was the value used by the early babylonians and also by the jews one kings seven twenty three two chronicles four two 
A quaint picture is found in the beginning of Halley's edition of Apollonius, and again reproduced in Heath's volume. The legend below describes Aristippus, the Socratic philosopher, shipwrecked on the island of Rhodes, where he found the sand of the seashore covered with geometrical drawings. His exclamation was, Good cheer! I see evidences of the man himself. Ludolf van Keulen devoted a considerable portion of his life to the computation of pi. Dying in 1610, he requested that the result to 35 places which he had obtained be cut on his tombstone. Archimedes chose to have his favorite theorem graven on his tomb, as also James Bernoulli, who, while investigating the properties of the equiangular spiral, discovered the remarkable way in which curves deduced from it reproduced the original curve, and he requested that this figure should be carved on his tomb with the inscription Eadem numero mutata resurgo. Perhaps the limit of perseverance in this direction was reached by William Shanks, who in 1872 carried the result to 707 places. Some idea of the accuracy of this value may be inferred from Professor Newcomb's remark that if the circumference of the earth were a perfect circle, ten places of decimals would make its circumference known to a fraction of an inch. In 1770, Lambert discussed the statement that pi is irrational, that it cannot be expressed by a terminating decimal or the ratio of two whole numbers. In 1794, Legendre proved the irrationality of both pi and pi squared. Hermite in 1873 proved E, the base of the natural logarithms, to be transcendental, that is, it is inexpressible as a root of any algebraic equation with integral coefficients, and in 1882, Lindemann gave a similar proof for the transcendentalism of pi. Euler derived the relation between E and pi, expressed by the following formula, which is one of the most remarkable in mathematics. E to the power of I times pi is equal to minus 1. A method of approximating pi is by the theory of probability. On a plane, a number of straight lines are drawn parallel to each other and A units apart. If a stick of length L, less than A, is dropped at random on the plane of these lines, the probability that it will fall across one of the lines is 2L divided by pi times A, from which, by a large number of trials in which the number of times is recorded, that the stick crosses a line, an approximate value of pi is obtained. In 1864, Captain Fox made 1,120 trials and obtained pi is equal to 3.1419. Ball. In 1685, Kochowski gave a simple construction by which the length of a semicircle may be constructed with an accuracy correct to four decimal places. At the end point A of diameter BA, draw tangent AF. Take the angle ACE equal to 30 degrees and EF equal to three times the radius. Draw BF and which is the required line? Halstead. The value of pi to 52 places of decimals is pi is equal to 3 3.1415923653553 5 Three nine nine three seven five one zero five eight. Circle squaring has not entirely died out, but the mathematical knowledge of the cyclometer of today 
does not extend much beyond elementary arithmetic. For the lack of the requisite knowledge to appreciate the problem has been substituted a dogged perseverance which should achieve results if applied in a calling more befitting their abilities. Professor de Morgan, whose experience with the several cyclometers certainly puts him in a position to know their frailties, especially those of James Smith of Liverpool, says, The feeling which tempts persons to this problem is that which, in romance, made it impossible for a knight to pass a castle which belonged to a giant or an enchanter. The rinda pest of geometry cannot be cured when once it is seated in the system. All that can be done is to apply what the learned call prophylactics to those who are yet sound. When once the virus gets into the brain, the victim goes round the flame like a moth, first one way and then another, beginning again where it ended and ending where he began. Smith's value for pi is three one eighth which he attributes to a French well-sinker, of which de Morgan says, It does the well-sinker great honour, being so near the truth, and he having no means of instruction. Further speaking of Smith, he says, He is, beyond a doubt, the ablest head at unreasoning, and the greatest hand at writing it, of all who have tried in our day to attach their names to an error common cyclometers sink into puny orthodoxy by his side. The behaviour of this singular character induces me to pay him the compliment Achilles paid Hector, to drag him around the walls again and again. Again, as to Mr. James Smith, we can only say this. He is not mad. Madmen reason rightly upon wrong premises. Mr. Smith reasons wrongly on no premises at all. His procedures are not caricature of reasoning, they are caricature of blundering. The old way of proving two is equal to one is solemn earnest compared with his demonstration. The origin of the Delian problem, which occupies a large space in the history of Greek geometry, is given in a letter from Eratosthenes to King Ptolemy Energetes. Eratosthenes to King Ptolemy, greeting. There is a story that one of the old tragedians represented Minos as wishing to erect a tomb for Glaucus, and as saying, when he heard that it was a hundred feet every way, Too small thy plan to bound a royal tomb. Let it be double, yet of its fair form fail not, but haste to double every side. But he was clearly in error, for when the sides are doubled, the area becomes four times as great, and the solid content eight times as great. Geometers also continued to investigate the question in what manner one might double a given cube while it remained in the same form. And a problem of this kind was called doubling the cube, for they started from a cube and sought to double it. While then for a long time everyone was at a loss, Hippocrates of Chios was the first to observe that if between two straight lines, of which the greater is double of the less, it were discovered how to find two mean proportionals in continued proportion, the cube would be doubled, and thus he turned the difficulty in the original problem into another difficulty no less than the former. Afterward they say, some Delians attempting, in accordance with an oracle, to double one of the altars, to rid them of a pestilence, fell into the same difficulty. And they sent and begged the geometers who were with Plato in the academy to find for them the required solution, and while they set themselves energetically to work and sought to find two means between two given straight lines, Architus of Tarentum is said to have discovered them by means of half-cylinders, and Eudoxus by means of so-called curved lines. It is, however, characteristic of them all that they indeed gave demonstrations, but were unable to make the actual construction, or to reach the point of practical application, except to a small extent Menachmus, and that with difficulty. 
perhaps the most beautiful solution aside from that of Archytas, is by means of the sisoid or ivy-like curve invented by diocles this curve is formed by drawing the horizontal diameter of a circle and drawing pairs of equal half chords perpendicular to this diameter through the upper extremity of one of these chords and the opposite end of the horizontal diameter is drawn a chord the point of intersection of this chord with the other one of the pair of half chords is a point of the sisoid end of section 10「Section 11 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2021. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 1. Pure Mathematics. Chapter 5. Geometry. Part 3. In discussing the possibility of a geometrical solution of a problem, it has not always been clear just what is meant by possibility. Euclid limited his tools to the straight edge and compass, so that every geometrical problem must ultimately reduce to a finite number of constructions which are of one or more of the three classes finding the intersection of two straight lines or a straight line and a circle or of two circles at first glance one would say that the impossibility of a construction by such methods could never be completely established that perhaps some time someone would hit upon the happy combination necessary for the solution and so far as geometry itself is concerned it has as yet thrown no light on the subject it is here that algebra furnishes the clue since geometry admits of the construction of the square root of the product of two lines it may be said that the necessary and sufficient condition that an analytic expression can be constructed with the straight edge and compasses is that it can be derived from the known quantities by a finite number of rational operations and square roots. Klein, Famous Problems in Elementary Geometry It is at once seen that the Delian problem reduces to finding x where x cubed is equal to 2, and therefore is unsolvable as a Euclidean problem. The trisection of an arbitrary angle, while one of the famous unsolved problems, was not so enshrined in romance as was the Delian problem. The bisecting or dividing of an angle into two equal parts was very easy of solution, but not so the trisection. In very special cases, as that of the right angle, no difficulty is experienced. The earliest solutions were by means of the hyperbola and the conchoid of Nicomedes. Since that time, many and various have been the solutions offered, all depending either on higher plane curves than the circle, or upon mechanical instruments other than the ruler and compasses. Speaking of the latter, Plato says, The good of geometry is set aside and destroyed, for we again reduce it to the world of sense, instead of elevating and imbuing it with the eternal and incorporeal images of thought, even as it is employed by God, for which reason he always is God. It is easily shown that trisection cannot be reduced to the necessary conditions, and therefore it must be classed as an unsolvable Euclidean problem. Closely allied with this problem is the other of inscribing regular polygons in a circle. It has long been known that polygons may be inscribed if the number of sides is given by n equals 2 to the power of h, 3, 5, or the product of any two or three of these numbers. Gauss showed that the operation is possible for every prime number of the form p equals 2 to the power of 2n plus 1, 
but impossible for all other primes. Giving n the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, the primes 3, 5, 17, 256, 65,537 result. With n equals 5, 6, 7, primes do not result. Thus is seen that the regular polygon of 7, 9, 11, etc. sides are not constructible. The polygon of 17 sides has been constructed by many writers. One construction is given by Klein in Famous Problems. To the investigation of the polygon of 65,537 sides, Professor Hermes devoted 10 years of his life. The modification of the instruments used in constructions has been considered successfully by Mascheroni, who used compasses alone. All forms which involve rationals may be dealt with with the straight edge, while Poncelet conceived the idea of using the straight edge and a fixed circle. That angle trisectors still exist is attested by the publication some years ago with great eclat that a Western schoolgirl had succeeded where the mathematicians of twenty centuries had failed. Verily, fools venture in where angels fear to tread. Euclid's definition of parallel lines is straight lines which, being in the same plane and produced indefinitely in both directions, do not meet one another in either direction. Euclid's fifth postulate differs from all the others, and as Steckel remarks, it requires a certain courage to declare such a requirement alongside the other exceeding simple assumptions and postulates. And there is no better proof of the subtlety and power of the old Greek geometer than his assumption as undemonstrable that which required twenty-two centuries to prove as such. Euclid postpones the use of this postulate until nearly half of the first book is complete, and then assumes it as the inverse of one already proved, the seventeenth, and uses it only to prove the inverse of another already proved, the twenty-seventh. Proclus demanded a proof, as the inverse was demonstrable, and his time on it has been the bone of contention until the difficulty was cleared up in the nineteenth century by the most brilliant generalization in the whole field of mathematics. Playfair's form of this postulate, also stated by Proclus, is Through a given point not on a straight line, one line and but one can be drawn which is parallel to the given line. Comparing this statement with the one that one and but one perpendicular can be drawn from a point to a line, they appear of equal difficulty. On this slippery ground many good and bad mathematicians have lost their footing. Lagrange at one time wrote a paper on parallels in which he hoped he had overcome the difficulty, and began to read it before the academy, but suddenly stopped and said, Il faut que j'y songe encore. I must think it over again. He put the paper in his pocket and never afterward referred to it. Le Gendre showed that this assumption is equivalent to the statement that the sum of the angles of a triangle is equal to two right angles, and also proved that if ever a triangle is found in which the sum of the angles can be shown to be exactly two right angles, then this is true for any other triangle. Gerolamo Saccheri, in 1733, in a work, Euclid Vindicated from All Faults, obtained the first glimpse of the modern theory of parallels, and had it not been for his confidence in the existence of a parallel, would no doubt have had the credit which belongs now to others. He presents the curious spectacle of labouring to erect a structure for the purpose of afterward pulling it down on top of himself, constructing systems in which he sought for contradictions in order to prove the hypotheses false. Wolfgang Boljai, a Hungarian, was in his college days a friend of Gauss, the greatest mathematician Germany has ever produced. He was professor in the reformed college of Maros Vasarheli. 
The son, Johann Bolyai de Bolyai, is best described by his father when he relates that the boy in mathematics sprang before him like a demon. As soon as he enunciated a problem, the child solved it and asked him to go farther. At the age of thirteen he lectured in his father's absence. Writing to his father November 3, 1823, at the age of twenty-one, he says, I have not got my object yet, but I have produced such stupendous things that I was overwhelmed myself, and it would be an eternal shame if they were lost. Now I can only say that I have made a new world out of nothing. And his discovery was nothing more or less than to reject the postulate which had been intuitively accepted since the time of Euclid, and without this axiom built up a non-self-contradictory geometry. It was published as an appendix of twenty-eight pages in a work of his father's. In 1829, Nikolaus Ivanovich Lobachevsky, a brilliant young Russian, issued his New Elements of Geometry with a complete theory of parallels, in which the same axiom is rejected. And so, almost simultaneously, the new field was created by two young men, one a Magyar and the other a Russian, in almost precisely the same manner. If P is a point not on the line AB, the lines on the right of P are divided into two classes, those which cut AB and those which do not. The line which separates the two classes is said to be parallel to AB. On the left of P there is also a parallel. Euclid's axiom would say that one of these is the prolongation of the other, but such cannot be proved. Lobachevsky began his geometry with the assumption that they are not one and the same line. In other words, through the point P there are two parallels to AB one on either side of P. In the figure, PC and MB make equal angles with PM. Several cases arise. 1. PC meets AB in the two points, one on the right of PM and the other on the left. These points may be distinct or coincident. 2. PC meets AB in one point, and A, there exists but the one line PC which has this property, or B, there exists on the left of PM a second line having a similar property. 3. PC does not meet AB on either side, however far produced. In order to give objective reality to these hypotheses, the geometry of a surface of a sphere will be considered. It will be necessary to inquire into the meaning of straight line, since obviously no line may be drawn on a spherical surface which has the property of straightness, in the common acceptance of the term. It is not always clear just what property is meant when the term straight is used. A very common conception of straightness is that property by which, if a portion of the line terminated by two points A and B is placed on any part of the line so that A and B lie in the line, then the line is said to be straight if, when this segment is rotated, keeping A and B in the line, all points between A and B lie evenly in the line. But this is an unnecessarily complicated statement. Another conception which is equally fundamental and much more fruitful is that the straight line is the minimum line between the two points. Such a line will be called a geodesic. It is the line which the navigator would naturally choose, other conditions being equal, when sailing between two points on the surface of the earth, or if a cord is stretched between two points on the surface of a sphere without friction, it will mark a geodesic. It is easily shown that the only geodesic that may be drawn on the surface of a sphere is cut out by a plane passing through the center of the sphere, or the geodesic is a great circle. It will be convenient to speak of the spherical surface as a sphere 
and the great circle as a straight line or geodesic. A geodesic on a sphere is determined by two points, just as the geodesic or straight line in the plane, except in the special case of the two points being the extremities of a diameter. The sum of the angles of a triangle formed by three geodesics is greater than two right angles. The excess is denoted by E. The area of such a triangle is proportional to E. In the plane triangle, the sum of the angles is exactly equal to two right angles, and its area is entirely independent of the magnitude of the angles or their relations one with another. Two triangles are equal on the sphere if the three angles of one are equal respectively to the three angles of the other. This was the case of duality which broke down in the plane. The surface of the sphere is a two-dimensional manifold of points. In other words, it has extension in two ways, but has no thickness. If such a surface could be stripped from the sphere, it could be folded and rolled up by bending one side inward. If such deformation be performed without tearing or stretching, it is evident that any theorem concerning lines on the surface would be still valid, and any figure could at will be moved freely about in the surface without in any way altering the relations of the various parts. Likewise, the geometry of a portion of a plane is unaltered if it be rolled up in the form of a cylinder or cone. Such a property is said to belong to surfaces of constant curvature. If r is the radius of a circle, 1 divided by r is called the curvature, since as r increases, 1 divided by r decreases, and vice versa. If the radius becomes larger, the curvature becomes smaller, and the surface flattens out. Through any point of a surface, let all the geodesics be drawn, and in the plane of any geodesic, let that circle be drawn which most nearly conforms with the geodesic at the point. The geodesics form a pencil, and the curvature of each geodesic is the curvature of its particular circle. Now, if all the circles have the same radius, and this radius is the same for circles at any other point of the surface, it is said to have constant curvature. This may be put analytically. A certain expression is taken involving quantities that are known and which is fully determined when the line element of the surface is given. This expression is an invariant of the surface, that is, it is independent of the coordinates used to define a point. This expression is indicated by K and called the Gaussian measure of curvature. When K is the same for all points of a surface, the surface is said to have constant curvature. Suppose the radius of the sphere R to increase indefinitely. 1 divided by R, or the curvature, is positive and becomes indefinitely small. The surface flattens out and approaches, as a limit, the plane with curvature 0, that is, the plane is the limiting case of a spherical surface as curvature, or k, approaches zero. Now allow k to pass through zero and become negative. Since k is equal to 1 divided by r is negative, the radius must be negative, or turned in direction. Formally, it was directed inward, and for the moment it will be convenient to think of it as projecting outward from the surface. As k passes through zero, it is very small, and r is very great, but negative, or the surface first flattened into a plane, and very slowly curves the other way, giving a saddle-shaped surface. A surface of this nature, which has constant curvature, is generated by the revolution of the track tracks about the axis to which it is asymptotic. The tractrix is a curve such that the tangent PT is always a constant. This curve is the projection on a plane of one of the curves of a skew arch. 
If this curve be revolved about the axis OX, it will give a saddle-shaped surface called the pseudosphere. On this pseudosphere, a triangle has the appearance of figure 50, and the sum of the angles is less than two right angles. This deficiency is denoted by D, and is proportional to the area of the triangle. Going back to the hypotheses, it is seen that the spherical surface meets the conditions of 1. Through a given point P outside a line, no line can be drawn which does not intersect the given line in two distinct points. The geometry of such a surface, of positive curvature, is called Riemannian or Gaussian. The plane satisfies hypothesis 3, if it be assumed that no other such line may be drawn. The geometry of the plane is termed Euclidean, and 2b is true on the pseudosphere. Through a point outside a given line, two parallels to the line may be drawn. The appearance of the parallels is indicated by the figure. The geometry of a surface of constant negative curvature is called Lobachevskian. The curvature of a point, regarded as a sphere of zero radius, is infinite. Starting with a point, let the radius increase and curvature decrease. As the curvature runs continuously through the values from plus infinity down to zero, the surface has a Riemannian geometry of no parallels. When curvature passes through zero, for an instant the surface is a plane with the property of one parallel, the curvature becoming negative. The Lobachevskian geometry applies and there are two parallels. Continuing, the curvature becomes larger and larger negatively, with radius becoming smaller, until finally the surface closes up again into a point and the complete course has been run. Paralleling the case with the conic section, the parabola was seen to be the boundary between the ellipse and the hyperbola. So, the Riemannian geometry is said to be elliptic, the plane parabolic, and the pseudosphere hyperbolic. These terms come, however, from a different property of the spaces. It is a curious fact that in the simple Riemannian plane, the straight line cuts through the plane without cutting it in two. This cut cannot well be pictured, but an idea of its meaning may be got by thinking of the surface of a ring with a cut extending around the outside of it. In Lobachevskian space, the unit of measure is a continuously decreasing length, while in Riemannian space it is continuously increasing. Riemann, in his celebrated paper on The Hypotheses Which Lie at the Basis of Geometry, first advanced the theory that space might be unbounded without being infinite, in these words. In the extension of space construction to the infinitely great, one must distinguish between unboundedness and infinite extent. That space is an unbounded threefold manifoldness is an assumption which is developed by every conception of the outer world. The unboundedness of space possesses a greater empirical certainty than any external appearance, but its infinite extent by no means follows. On the other hand, if we assume independence of bodies from position, and therefore ascribe to space constant curvature, it must necessarily be finite, provided this curvature has ever so small a positive value. If we prolong all the geodesics from one point in a surface of constant curvature, this surface would take the form of a sphere. The question as to whether the space of experience is Euclidean, Lobachevskian, or Riemannian is one which can never be determined. Are there two parallels, one or none, could only be settled in one of two ways, by reason or by measurement. A better form for the question is as to whether the sum of the angles of a triangle is less than, equal to, or greater than two right angles. As to reason, 
the geometry of one hypothesis is just as consistent as that of another. As to measurement, it is conceivable that an error in the measurement of the three angles of a triangle, which may be drawn on this page, would not show an error which would easily be detected if the triangle were drawn with sides ten miles in length. The largest triangles ever possible to measure have as a side the diameter of the Earth's orbit, the opposite vertex being a celestial body. That no deviation from two right angles in the sum for this triangle is found is no evidence that if it were a million times as great, the deviation would not be appreciable. The most that can be said is that if space is curved, the curvature is slight. The study of non-Euclidean spaces enables one better to appreciate the insight of the old Greek geometer, who two thousand years ago realized that the proof of his fifth postulate was beyond his powers. All measurement in mathematics is concerned either with that of lines or of angles. Euclid developed a complete theory of measurement of lines, but aside from the right angle and several of its exact divisors, as one-third of a right angle, etc., the only relations which he determined were those of greater and less. Thus, if the sides of a triangle are three, four, five, it is known by geometry that the angle opposite the side five is a right angle, and further that the angle opposite the side four is greater than that opposite three, but exactly how much Euclid gives us no means of determining. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Pure Mathematics, Chapter 6, Trigonometry. Trigonometry is the science of the triangle, with reference to the particular problem of finding the value of the unknown parts when three independent parts are given, as finding the angles when the three sides are given, etc. In a right triangle, capital ABC, Lettered as in figure 52, six ratios are involved, which remain the same so long as the angles are not changed, the size of the triangle changing at will, but preserving its shape. These six ratios are functions of the angles. That is, they depend for their value upon the values of the angles. They are named in the table below, with the abbreviations usually assigned to them given last. A table with six rows and two columns, red by row. A divided by C equals sine capital A equals sine of A. A divided by C equals cosine of capital B. B over C equals cosine of capital A equals cosine of A. B over C equals sine of capital B. A over B equals tangent of A equals tan of A equals Tg of A. A divided by B equals cotangent of B. B over A equals cotangent of capital A equals cotangent of capital A equals Ctn of capital A. B over A equals tangent of capital B. C over B equals secant of A equals sec of A. C over B equals cosecant of capital B. C over A equals cosecant of capital A equals CS of capital A. C over A equals secant of capital B. In the first column, the functions are arranged in pairs. 
the second of the pair having its name from the first, with the prefix CO. The origin of this prefix is from the relation which exists between capital A and capital B, the sum of which is one right angle. It therefore takes capital B to fill a right angle together with capital A or capital B is said to be the complement of capital A or co-A. Looking at the second column, one sees that the ratio B over C is the sine of capital B or the sine of co-A or cosine of A. These six ratios were originally used in connection with a right triangle alone. When it became desirable to consider angles greater than one right angle, such angles not being found in a right triangle, the definitions for sine, cosine, etc. were so framed as to apply to any angle, positive or negative. This was done by means of a line representation. A circle of radius unity is chosen and divided into four quadrants by means of a horizontal and vertical line through the center. It is agreed that the angle shall begin at capital O, capital A, and shall be considered positive if it extends in a counterclockwise direction. Directions of other lines are given by the arrows on the two axes. Figure, a circle with a rectangle inscribed into it, and lines running the diagonals of the rectangle and intersecting at the middle and extending past the circle to the point where they intersect a vertical line tangent to the circle. Take a point capital P on the terminal side of the angle and on the circumference of the circle. Since the angle may be of any magnitude, the point P may be any one of the four arcs capital A, B, capital B, A prime, capital A prime, B prime, or capital B, A. The construction here given applies to any position of capital P. It will be supposed that capital P is in the arc capital AB, and the relations between the new and old definitions of the functions will be apparent. Draw capital OP, which will be directed outward from capital O. Drop a perpendicular from capital P to capital OA, calling the foot of the perpendicular capital M. Then capital PM divided by OP equals sine of capital AOP, where the vertex of the angle is capital O, and capital OM divided by OP equals cosine of capital AOP. But the circle was a unit circle, and capital OP equals 1. Whence, capital MP equals sine of capital AOP, and capital OM equals cosine of capital AOP. From capital A, erect a perpendicular cutting capital OP produced in capital T. Then, capital AT divided by OA equals tangent of capital AOP equals capital AT, secant of capital AOP equals capital OT. From B, draw a parallel to capital OA, cutting capital OP produced at capital S. Capital BS equals cotangent of capital AOP, and capital OS equals cosecant of capital AOP. If capital OP beginning at capital OA swings through a complete revolution about capital O, all angles from capital O to four right angles will be passed through. There are two units employed in measuring angles, the degree with its subdivisions minute and second, and the radian. The degree is 1 divided by 360 of a complete circumference due to the Babylonian year, which was made up of 360 days. The degree, symbolized by degree symbol, is divided into 60 equal parts, each called a minute indicated by a single prime. Another Babylonian division, the minute is again divided by 60, giving the second, double prime symbol. The unit of radian measure is the angle which cuts off an arc equal to the radius of the circle. It is nearly 57.3 degrees. Since two pi r equals circumference, four right angles, 
equals 2 pi radians, or 2 pi r. 90 degrees equals pi radians divided by 2. 180 degrees equals pi radians. 270 degrees equals 3 pi radians divided by 2. The number of radians is given by the arc divided by the radius. In the figure of the line functions, if capital P returns by making a complete revolution, or 2 pi radians, to capital A and continues turning in the same direction, an angle is formed which is greater than 2 pi radians. But the functions of this angle are exactly those of the angle formed during the first revolution. This property of again passing through the same values with every complete turning is called periodicity. The periodicity of the six trigonometrical functions is well exhibited by a diagram in which distance along the horizontal line represents the magnitude of the angle measured in radians, and the perpendicular to this line at any point is the value of the function for the angle indicated by the point. Figure 53 curve of lines y equals sine x. Figure 54, curve of cosines, y equals cosine of x. The simplest relation is that between the sine and cosine of an angle which comes directly from the Pythagorean theorem, sine squared capital A plus cosine squared capital A equals 1. One of the most important properties of these functions is that they have an addition law. That is, if two angles are added, the sine of the sum is not the sum of the sines of the two angles, but it may be expressed through functions of the angles. This is the most fruitful property. The addition theorem for sine and cosine follow where capital A and capital B are any two angles. Figure 55 curve of secants. Sine of capital A plus capital B equals sine of A cosine of B plus cosine of A sine of B. Cosine of capital A plus B equals cosine of A cosine of B minus sine of A sine of B. In the practical application to the solving of triangles, three laws are used which may be expressed by the formula law of sines. A over the sine of capital A equals B over the sine of capital B equals C over the sine of capital C. Law of cosines. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine of capital A, which is the law spoken of as summing up in one statement the Pythagorean theorem with the acute and obtuse cases. Law of tangents. a plus b over a minus b equals tangent of one half of capital A plus capital B divided by tangent of one half capital A minus capital B. Tables have been constructed by which the function of any angle, and conversely the angle of any function, may be obtained as accurately as the needs of science demand. Figure 56. A. Napier's rules. B. Polar triangles. Spherical trigonometry is the science applied to a triangle on the surface of a sphere. The sides are now also expressed in angular measure. In the solution of the right triangle, a mnemonic device found by Napier, the inventor of logarithms, eliminates the necessity of committing to memory the relations of the functions. In the figure, C is a right angle, and before the parts capital A, comma C, comma capital B, are written co, which means that in the lines which follow, that the complement of each part is to be taken rather than the part. Napier's Rules of Circular Parts. Sine of middle part is equal to the product of the cosines of the opposite parts, or equal to the product of the tangents of the adjacent parts. 
it is seen that omitting the right angle capital C, which is indicated by putting the capital C within the triangle, that there are five remaining parts. Now choosing a part and calling it a middle part as A, there are two parts, B, co-capital B, and adjacent to A, and two parts, co-capital A, co-C, which are opposite to A. Apply the rules above. Figure 57, section of a model of a cubic surface from Blythe. Sine of A equals cosine of co capital A times cosine co C equals sine capital A sine of C. Sine of A equals tangent B times tangent co capital B equals tangent of B cotangent capital B. In this way, the ten necessary relations in the right triangle may be written at will. There is a very interesting relation in spherical geometry concerning what are called polar triangles. If the angular points capital A, B, C of a triangle are used as centers, and the arc of one right angle is used as a radius, striking three arcs which form a triangle, this triangle, indicated by capital A prime, B prime, C prime, is called the polar triangle of capital A, B, C. The relation is reciprocal. Capital ABC is polar of capital A prime, B prime, C prime. The property which is to be noted is that a side of a triangle or angle is the supplement of the opposite angle or side of the polar triangle. Capital A plus A prime equals 180 degrees. A plus capital A prime equals 180 degrees. The law of cosines in spherical trigonometry is the most general case of the universal law which is expressed in its simplest form by the Pythagorean theorem. Cosine of C equals cosine of A times cosine of B plus sine of A times sine of B times cosine of capital C. If the radius of the sphere is allowed to become great, without limit, that is, the spherical surface flattens out and approaches a plane. In the limit, this formula becomes the law of cosines in plane trigonometry. c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of capital C. If now the angle capital C becomes a right angle, the formula reduces to c squared equals a squared plus b squared, or the Pythagorean theorem. In the figure used in the definition of the trigonometric functions by lines, each function belonged to the angle capital AOP. Since the arc AP has the same measure as the angle and the sector capital AOP, i.e. the portion of the circle bounded by the two radii and the arc, is measured by the arc capital AP, it is convenient to say that the six ratios are functions of the sector as well as of the angle. The circle was seen to be a particular case with a fixed form or shape of the ellipse, which varied as the cone was turned. The hyperbola varies in shape also with the turning. There is a position of the cone which gives a form of the hyperbola analogous to the circle. This form is called the equilateral hyperbola. Its most familiar use is in representing the relation between the pressure and volume of a gas, which is expressed by PV equals a constant. A set of functions belonging to the equilateral hyperbola has been devised which is distinguished from the set pertaining to the circle by calling the first set circular functions and the second hyperbolic functions. In the figure, the sector of the hyperbola bounded by capital OA, OP, and the arc OP will be denoted by U. From the foot of the perpendicular, capital MP, capital MT is drawn tangent to the circle. The sector of the circle, capital AOT, will be called V. The hyperbolic functions of the sector, capital AOP, will be denoted by cinch of U 
kosh of you, etc. V is said to be the Gudermanian of you, or V equals GD of you. Some of the relations existing between the functions of U and V are cosh of U equals secant of V, cinch of U equals tan of V, hyperbolic tangent of U equals sine of V, etc. The discussion just given is of but a special case of these functions. The name hyperbolic was not originally given on account of the properties here stated. One would expect that the term elliptic function would be used for some similar relation in connection with the ellipse, but such is not the case. The desirable use of the word would be to denote the more general case of the circular functions. The term arose in connection with some expressions which appeared in the early attempts to rectify or measure an arc of the ellipse. They may, however, be regarded as an extension or branch of trigonometry since they have two properties, analogous to two properties of the trigonometric functions. Namely, they admit of an addition theorem and periodicity. The trigonometrical functions are simply periodic. In the sine curve, let the angle be taken 30 degrees. The value of the sine for 30 degrees is indicated by the perpendicular line capital MP. If a point capital Q be taken 2 pi units from capital M, the sine line capital QN will be the same as capital MP. 4 pi will give the same sign. These points of periodicity are points of a line. The elliptic functions are doubly periodic. It requires the entire plane to indicate the values of the independent variable. Rudiments of trigonometry are found in the Alms Papyrus, where the dimensions of square pyramids are to be found. In these computations appears a word, sept, which has a value of about 0.75. This is the cosine of 41 degrees, 24 minutes, 34 seconds, which is very nearly the slope of the edges of the existing pyramids. In Ptolemy's 13 books of the Great Collection, or the Almagest, spherical trigonometry is developed and applied to astronomy. The names minute and second are from the Almagest. Half chords were first brought into favor by Al Batain, an Arab prince, circa 850 to 929, in whose work first appears the law of cosines for the spherical triangle. The greater part of the plan used in the trigonometry of today is the work of Reggio Montanus, or Johannes Müller, 1436 to 1476. End of section 12. Section 13 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Ralt Wheeler. Part 1, Pure Mathematics, Chapter 7, Analytic Geometry, Part 1. The final union of algebra and geometry by means of the analytic geometry is usually attributed to Descartes. Algebra has been used at various times in connection with geometry, by Apollonius and Vieta in particular, but in their works the idea of motion is wanting. Descartes, by introducing variables and constants, was enabled to represent curves by algebraic equations. A point in a plane is determined by its distances from two intersecting lines which, for convenience, may be taken as perpendicular to each other. By allowing these two distances to vary, the point moves and generates a curve. By expressing the relation between these two variable distances in the form of an equation, the curve becomes subject to investigation following the laws of algebra. This is the great contribution by Descartes, and by it, the entire conic sections of Apollonius is wrapped up and contained in a single equation of the second degree. Kajori. 
The plotting of an equation of the first degree, which results in a straight line, was spoken of in connection with algebra, as was also an equation of the second degree. The general equation of the second degree is written in the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals zero. Two processes are applied to change the form of an equation, which evidently depends upon the axes chosen. One of these is to translate, or move parallel to themselves, the axes, and the other is to rotate them about the point of intersection, which is called the origin. If the general constants a, b, c, d, e, f are such that the equation can be reduced by one or both of these operations to the form b squared x squared plus a squared y squared equals a squared b squared, the curve is an ellipse. If to the form x squared plus y squared equals r squared, the circle b squared x squared minus a squared y squared equals a squared b squared is the equation of the hyperbola, and y squared equals 2px is the parabola. If the left member of the equation can be factored, it is a degenerate conic. The equation of the third degree gives a curve which is called the cubic. Newton gave a classification of the cubic curves, the general form of which is a closed loop and an open branch. The curves of higher degree comprise some of the historic curves. In addition to the algebraic curves, there is a great class of curves called transcendentals. To this class belong the curves of the trigonometric functions given in page 157. The most famous of the transcendentals is the cycloid, the path of a point on the rim of a carriage wheel as the wheel rolls on the ground. If the wheel rolls on the circumference of a circle instead of on a line, the curve generated is called an epicycloid and is one of the curves used in laying out gear wheels. Some idea of the number of curves that have been investigated may be gathered from the fact that an Italian writer listed these curves with a short description of each, filling a large book of about 700 pages. The method of Descartes is easily carried to three variables. An equation of this form might be z equals f, open parenthesis, x, y, close parenthesis. The plane determined by the two perpendicular lines o, y, and o, x is the old x, y plane, perpendicular to it the new z axis o, z. Since x and y are independent of each other, any value as om may be laid off for x on the x-axis. Perpendicular to this axis, a value of y, say mn, is plotted. Putting these values in the equation, z is determined, which is laid off at right angles to the plane xoy, or np. That is, p is one point of the surface represented by the equation. If a corresponding point is found for every point in the xy plane, the entire surface will be plotted. An equation of the second degree in three variables, x, y, and z, represents one of what are called quadric surfaces. Such surfaces are of two classes. On a surface of the first class, such as the ellipsoid, no straight lines may be drawn, and the geodesics are all curved lines. The ellipsoid is generated by a variable ellipse moving parallel to itself. In the second class of surfaces, called the ruled surfaces, the geodesics are straight lines. The hyperboloid of one sheet may be generated by a line moving parallel to itself while constantly touching two circles in parallel planes, the planes being oblique to the moving line. Such a surface has two sets of line generators, one set inclined to the right and the other to the left. The cubic surface or surface of the third degree contains 27 straight lines, a fact discovered by Dr. Cayley in 1849. In the drawing of the section of one of these surfaces, 
some of these lines are seen. The blackened portion indicates where the solid model is cut, only a part of the surface being shown. The principal advances in analytic geometry have been along three lines. One, changes in the system of coordinates. Two, changes in the element used. Three, the introduction of the imaginary element. In 1857, President Hill of Harvard gave a list of 22 systems of coordinates then in use, and since that time, many more have been added. One of the most useful systems is known by the term polar coordinates, in which a point P is located by the distance R equals OP from the origin and the angle theta between OP and the initial line through O. This system greatly simplifies some of the equations of the Cartesian system. For example, R equals a constant is the equation of a circle in polar coordinates. The general equation of the straight line in Cartesian coordinates is ax plus by plus c equals zero. This equation is seen to lack homogeneity or likeness, two of the terms containing variables and the third term being a constant. This unlikeness is removed if, in place of choosing as determining coordinates the distances from two intersecting lines, Three lines are taken which intersect in pairs, that is, do not pass through the same point. Instead of using the three distances, the three ratios of these distances are taken as the trilinear coordinates of a point. In Euclid's choice of elements, the primary element is the point, with the circle and line as secondary, each of these being an aggregate of points. A point in motion generates a line or curve. The curve in motion, not along itself, generates a surface, which, if moved outside of itself, gives a solid. And the whole geometry is a point geometry, made up problems in which a certain point is to be found, the intersection of two lines, a line and a circle, or of two circles. Looking at these elements from another viewpoint, they are but the circle which Euclid could draw and its two limiting cases, as the radius becomes indefinitely small and becomes indefinitely great. The latter Euclid could not draw, whence he assumes straight edge as one of his instruments. The symmetry of the three suggests that the line might just as well be taken as the point. A line is made up of an infinite number of points arranged in a certain way, and a point is made up of an infinite number of lines arranged in a definite manner. A theorem which is thought of as a relation between points, it is evident, may be by simply interchanging the words point and line, become the expression of a relation between lines. This principle of duality was first worked out in its entirety by Jean-Victor Poncelet, a brilliant young French lieutenant of engineers who was made prisoner in the French retreat from Moscow in 1812. Finding himself in prison without books or any means of enjoyment, he occupied himself with investigations in geometry and wrote his classic work on the projective properties of figures, in which the principle of duality is completely worked out. The analytical or algebraic investigations of geometry very often result in giving values which involve the imaginary element I. Every equation of the second degree represents a conic, and if two such equations are solved simultaneously for the points of intersection, four such points result. If the equations are those of circles, it is seen that two circles at most intersect in two real points. The other solutions result in imaginary solutions. The coordinates of these two points are conjugate imaginaries. One is of the form a plus ib, and the other of the form a minus ib. These two points are indicated by i and j, and are called the two circular points at infinity, for it is found that every two circles, besides intersecting in two real or two imaginary points in the finite region of the plane, also intersect in I and J. Again, it requires five points to determine or pick out a conic section, 
and it is known that three points determine a circle. What about the two missing points? They are I and J, which lie on every circle in the plane. In this conception, a circle is the aggregate of all the points in its circumference and the two points I and J. If a circle has its radius indefinitely diminished, it approaches as a limit a point, a degenerate conic which was its center. The equation of a circle with the center at the origin of coordinates is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. If r be made zero, the equation is x squared plus y squared equals zero, which may be factored, giving x equals iy and x equals minus iy. These are the equations of two imaginary lines called isotropic lines, which have some interesting properties. Through every point of the plane pass two isotropic lines. These isotropic lines make the same angle with every real line through the point. The distance between any two points on an isotropic line is zero, from which property they are called minimal lines. The isotropic lines join the real point through which they pass with I and J respectively. Perpendicularity between two real lines through the real point is a relation between the two lines and the two isotropic lines through the point. The algebraic treatment of geometry permits the investigation of imaginary elements with exactly the same rigor as that of the real elements, and the only distinction between real and imaginary elements is not one of existence but of adaptability to the picturing processes of the mind. The term imaginary originally implied non-existence, but the development of algebraic processes has entirely swept away that meaning. The whole question of existence with the geometer is not one of material existence. Points, lines, and planes are but creations of thought without materiality. That which exists is that which is consistent in thought, coherent, and non-contradictory. A real element is one which may be represented as a line by a mark or string, a surface by a sheet of paper, and the imaginary is one of which no such picture or image may be formed. The disposition to seek decision upon matters which do not come within the domain of present knowledge, that intuitive desire of mankind to rely upon the doctrine of chance, seems to be a universal trait with humanity that such an instinct should arise and be cultivated in every branch of the human race is but a corollary of the fact that the future is hidden. Probability is more or less a factor in the life of every individual. It may be said that in no contingency which arises is there more than probable evidence upon which to proceed. Voltaire puts the case more strongly. All life, says he, rests on probability. As a moral guide, it is said that the following theory was taught by 159 authors of the church before 1667. Quote, if each of two opposite opinions in matters of moral conduct be supported by a solid probability, in which one is admittedly stronger than the other, we may follow our natural liberty of choice by acting upon the less probable." Close quote. This gaming instinct has left as a heritage a number of games of great antiquity, varying from those in which skill and mental acuteness is the predominant factor, down to those in which no element enters except that of pure chance. The best type of the first class is the game of chess, while perhaps midway comes cards, and finally, dice. Games akin to chess and checkers are represented in Egyptian drawings as early as 2000 BC. Professor Forbes puts the origin of chess between three and 4,000 years before the 6th century of our era. Although this antiquity is to be doubted, it must be considered as extremely old. The game of Chaturanga is said to have been invented by the wife of Ravana, king of Ceylon, when his capital, Lanka, 
was besieged by Rama. That the game was in some way connected with war seems evident. The Chinese name for chess is literally the play of the science of war. The word chaturanga means the four divisions of the army, elephants, horses, chariots, and foot soldiers. The intricacies of the game are seen when it is known that there are as many as 197,299 ways of playing the first four moves and nearly 72,000 different positions at the end of these moves. The move of the knight is one move forward and one diagonally, and from this has been framed a famous problem. So to move the knight that it occupies but once each of the 64 squares of the board. This problem gives rise to some very odd geometrical designs on the board if its straight line is drawn between each two successive positions. The solution here given is that of de Mauvre. The number of possible solutions has been shown to be over 31,054,144, figure 55, Knight's Move in Magic Square. The origin of cards is as uncertain as that of chests. They appeared in Europe about 1200. If one seeks to go back from this, one trail leads through Spain to Africa and Egypt, another over the Caucasus to Persia and India, and perhaps another is picked up in China. In the Chinese Dictionary, 1678, it is said that cards were invented in the reign of Sion Ho. 1120 AD, for the amusement of his various concubines. Tradition says that cards have existed in India from time immemorial and that they were invented by the Brahmins. Figure 56, Knight's Tour on Single and Double Chessboards, Falconer. One form of cards, the tarot card, was brought into Europe from the East by gypsies who used them for divination purposes. They undoubtedly have been connected with witchery from the very beginning. A number of famous problems have been devised with cards. The first to be spoken of is Gurgons, or the three-pile problem. In this trick, 27 cards are dealt face upward in three piles, dealing from the top of the pack, one card at a time, to each pile. A spectator is requested to note a card and remember in which pile it is. Taking this pile between the other two, the operation is repeated, and the third time is noted the middle card of each pack. Ask now for the pile, and it is the card noted in this pile. Now if the three piles are taken face down in the same order and dealt from the top, it is the fourteenth card. Gergon generalized the problem to a pack containing M to the M power cards. The mouse trap is another noted game with cards. A set of cards marked with consecutive numbers from 1 to n are dealt in any order face upward in the form of a circle. The player begins with any card and counts round the circle. If the kth card has the number k on it, a hit is scored and the player takes up the card and begins afresh. The player wins if he takes up all the cards. If he counts up to n without taking up a card, the cards win. In Tartelia's work occurs a similar problem. A ship carrying as passengers 15 Turks and 15 Christians encounters a storm, and the pilot declares that in order to save the ship and crew, one half of the passengers must be thrown into the sea. To choose the victims, the passengers are arranged in a circle, and it is agreed to throw overboard every ninth man, reckoning from a certain point. In what manner must they be arranged that the lot will fall exclusively upon the Turks. The number of combinations possible in various card games is enormous. With the whist deal, this number is 53 octillion, 644 septillion, 737 sextillion, 765 quintillion, 488 quadrillion, 792 trillion, 839 billion, 237 million, 440,000. Dice and Delassus go back in history at least 3,000 years. Apollo taught their use to Hermes. 
These Greek gods probably got their knowledge from Egypt, where dice, and it is even said loaded ones, have been found in the tombs. Gaming with dice was common with the Romans, who had two forms, one like those of the present, and the other oblong and numbered on but four sides. On these, the deuce and the five were omitted. The convulsion of nature which overwhelmed Pompeii found a party of gentlemen at the gaming table, and they have been uncovered two thousand years after, with the dice firmly clenched in their fists. Seneca brings the gambling Emperor Claudius finally to Hades, where he is compelled to play constantly with a bottomless dice box. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rott Wheeler. Part 1, Pure Mathematics, Chapter 7, Analytic Geometry, Part 2. The two theories of choice and chance are very closely bound up together. Choice is made up of two branches, those problems which deal with arrangements and those with combinations alone. A problem of the first type is to find the number of ways in which ten men may be seated at a round table. The first man has manifestly no choice. He may be seated anywhere. After he is seated, the second man has nine choices, the third eight, and so on, until the tenth man who has but one choice. It is a principle that if a thing may be done in A ways and another in B ways, the two together may be done in A times B ways. Therefore, the ten men may be seated in nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one ways, which is denoted by nine exclamation mark, or nine factorial. The general expression for n things taken r at a time is n factorial divided by open parentheses n minus r close parentheses factorial. If there is no distinction between the objects, that is, the order is immaterial, a choice is called a combination, as defined in how many ways a committee of four men may be chosen from twenty-five men. The mode of solution is to find in how many ways twenty-five men may be arranged if chosen four at a time, and divide the number of arrangements possible with the four men. If an event happens A times and fails B times, the probability of the event happening is A divided by A plus B, and the probability of it failing is B divided by A plus B. A divided by B are the odds in favor, and B divided by A are the odds against the event happening. This may be illustrated in finding the probability of throwing at least four with two dice. The number of favorable cases is the number of cases in which 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 may be thrown. The number of unfavorable cases is the number of ways in which 2 and 3 can be thrown. 2 can be thrown in one way by throwing 1 and 1. 3 can be thrown in two ways, 2 and 1 and 1 and 2. The number of unfavorable cases is 3. The total number of cases is 6 times 6, or 36. The number of favorable cases is then 36 minus 3, or 33, and the probability of throwing at least 4 is 33 divided by 36, or 11 twelfths. If 52 cards be dealt to 4 players, the probability that a particular player will hold 4 aces is 11 over 4,165. An application of the theory of probability may be given in determining the expectancy of a player in the ordinary crap game. A and B play with two dice, A throwing and B being the banker. If A throws seven or eleven, he wins. If he throws three or two aces or two sixes, B wins. 
but if he throws 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, or 10, he continues throwing to duplicate his first throw, in which event he wins. If in throwing a 7 comes up, B wins. To determine the chances of the two players, the chance of throwing 7 or 11 is 2 ninths, of 2, 3, or 12 is 1 ninth, of 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, or 10 is 2 thirds. If A throws 4, his chance of winning the second throw is 1 twelfth times 2 thirds, of the third throw is 1 twelfth of 2 thirds of open parentheses, 1 minus open parentheses, 1 twelfth plus 1 sixth close parentheses, close parentheses, or 1 twelfth of 2 thirds of 3 fourths. A's chance of winning on 4 is 2 ninths plus 1 twelfth of 2 thirds, open parentheses, 1 plus 3 fourths plus 3 fourths squared plus 3 fourths cubed plus dot 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 close parentheses equals 4 ninths. A's chance of winning on 5 is 2 ninths plus 1 ninth of 2 thirds open parentheses 1 plus 13 eighteenths plus 13 eighteenths squared plus 13 eighteenths cubed plus dot 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 equals 22 forty fifths. A's chance of winning on 6 is 2 ninths plus 5 thirty sixths of 2 thirds open parentheses 1 plus 25 thirty sixths plus 25 thirty sixth squared plus 25 thirty sixth cubed plus dot 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 equals 52 99 A's chance of winning on 8, 9, or 10 is the same as 6, 5, or 4. A's chance is then 1 third, open parentheses, 4 ninths plus 22 40 fifths plus 52 90 ninths, close parentheses, equals 722 over 1485. B's chance is 1 minus 722 over 1485 equals 763 over 1485. The odds in favor of B are 763 over 722. Zare's solution. One very important application of probability is to determine the probable error in a number of observations. In 1805, Legendre gave his law of least squares, which may be simply stated as follows. The most probable value of a measured quantity is that in which the sum of the squares of the difference between this quantity and the observed values, provided they are equally good, is a minimum. Probability finds its greatest function, however, in determining the probable death rate upon which are based insurance premiums. When it is recalled that at the present time the greatest amount of money that is involved in any single business is that in insurance, the words of Augustus de Morgan penned in 1838 seem more than prophetic. Quote, the theory of insurance, with its kindred sides of annuities, deserves the attention of the academic bodies. Stripped of its technical terms and its commercial associations, it may be presented from a point of view which will give it strong moral claims to notice. Though based on self-interest, yet it is the most enlightened and benevolent form which the projects of self-interest ever took. It is, in fact, in the limited sense, and a practicable method, the agreement of a community to consider the goods of its individual members as common. It is an agreement that those whose fortune it shall be to have more than the average success shall resign the overplus in favor of those who have less. And though, as yet, it has only been applied to the reparation of the evils arising from the storm, fire, premature death, disease, and old age, Yet there is no placing a limit to the extensions which its application might receive if the public were fully aware of its principles and of the safety with which they may be put in practice. Close quote. The science of probability had its origin in a problem proposed in 1654 to Blaise Pascal by Chevalier de Mer, a professional gambler. It is now known as the problem of points. 
Two players want each a given number of points in order to win. If they separate, how should the stakes be divided? Pascal's solution is as follows. Two players play a game of three points and each player has staked 32 pistoles. Suppose that the first player has gained two points and the second player one point. They have now to play for a point on this condition that if the first player wins, he takes all the money at stake, namely 64 pistoles. And if the second player gains, each player has two points, so that if they leave off playing, each ought to take 32 pistoles. Thus, if the first player gains 64 pistoles belong to him, and if he loses, 32 pistoles belong to him. If then, the players do not wish to play this game, the first player would say to the second, I am certain of 32 pistoles if I lose this game. And as for the 32 pistoles, perhaps I shall have them and perhaps you will have them. The chances are equal. Let us then divide these pistoles equally and give me also the 32 pistoles of which I am certain. Then the first player would have 48 pistoles and the second 16 pistoles. Next, suppose that the first player has gained two points and the second player none and that they are about to play for a point. The condition then is that if the first player wins this point, he secures the game and the 64 pistoles, and if the second player gains this point, they will be in the position just examined, in which the first player is entitled to 48 pistoles and the second to 16 pistoles. Thus, if they do not wish to play, the first player would say to the second, if I gain the point, I gain 64 pistoles. If I lose, I am entitled to 48 pistoles. Give me the 48 pistoles, of which I am certain, and divide the other 16 equally, since our chances of gaining the point are equal. Thus, the first player gets 56 pistoles and the second 8 pistoles. Finally, suppose that the first player has gained one point and the second player none. If they proceed to play for a point, the condition is, that if the first player gains it, the players will be in the position first examined, in which the first player is entitled to 56 pistoles. If the first player loses the point, each player is then entitled to 32 pistoles. Thus, if they do not wish to play, the first player would say to the second, give me the 32 pistoles of which I am certain, and divide the remainder of the 56 pistoles equally, that is, divide 24 pistoles equally. Thus, the first player will have the sum of 32 and 12 pistoles, that is, 44 pistoles, and consequently, the second player will have 20 pistoles. Thus, the science which underlies the greatest business of the 20th century had its origin at the gaming table. Pascal corresponded with his friend Fermat regarding the problem, and the subject continued to be developed to such an extent that Professor Todd Hunter's History of Probability from which the above problem is taken, covers 624 pages. The theorem at the base of probability is thus stated by James Bernoulli, quote, If a sufficiently large number of trials is made, the ratio of the favorable to the unfavorable events will not differ from the ratio of their respective probabilities beyond a certain limit in excess or defect, and the probability of keeping within these limits, however small, can be made as near certainty as we please by taking a sufficiently large number of trials. Close quote. The inverse problem of reasoning from known events to probable causes is much more complicated. De Morgan thus states the principle of the inverse probability. Quote, when an event has happened and may have happened in two or three different ways, that way which is most likely to bring about the event is most likely to have been the cause. Close quote. Another principle due to Bayes is thus stated. Knowing the probability of a compound event and that of one of its components, we find the probability of the other by dividing the first by the second. Mitchell, more than a century ago, gave a classic attempt to apply the inverse theorem when he strove to find the probability that there is some cause for the fact that the stars are not uniformly distributed over the heavens. The following witty dictum is from Poisson, quote, After having calculated the probability of an error, 
it is necessary to calculate the probability of an error in the calculations. Close quote. One thus gets in an endless regression by in turn calculating the probability of the correctness of the next preceding calculation. Poincaré closed his lectures on the calculus of probabilities with this skeptical statement, quote, The calculus of probabilities offers a contradiction in the terms itself which serve to designate it, and if I would not fear to recall here a word too often repeated, I would say that it teaches us chiefly one thing, i.e. to know that we know nothing. Close quote. An idea floating about in the minds of mathematicians for centuries most nearly approached in the method of exhaustions used by Archimedes and in the method of indivisibles of Cavallere, pupil of Galileo, was, by aid of the introduction of the notion of variable into geometry, finally evolved almost simultaneously and independently by the two greatest mathematicians of the period, Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and has become the mighty engine of analysis, the first and only mathematical subject to be dignified by the article the, the calculus. This subject is based upon two fundamental and comparatively easily understood operations, the direct operation differentiation and its inverse integration. A few preliminary ideas are necessary. A variable quantity is said to have a limit when it approaches a constant quantity in such a way that the difference between the variable and the constant quantity can be made to become and remain less than any previously assigned value. The constant quality is called the limit of the variable. The condition is very often added that the variable never actually reaches its limit, but this is not necessary and very much narrows the application of the notion. Starting with the number 1, add to it its one-half, and continue the process indefinitely, each time adding one-half of the next preceding addition, thus 1 plus one-half plus one-quarter plus one-eighth plus one-sixteenth plus dot dot dot. It is evident that this sum never reaches 2, but may, by proceeding far enough, be made to differ from 2 by as small a number as we please. Inscribe in a circle a regular polygon. Take the midpoint of each arc and join it with straight lines to the two adjacent vertices of the polygon. A new polygon is formed with double the number of sides of the original. Continuing indefinitely, a polygon may be formed which in area and perimeter differs from the circle by as little as we please, but the circle is never actually reached. A quantity which approaches zero as a limit is called an infinitesimal. An infinitesimal is not necessarily an exceedingly small quantity. The smallness is not the important matter, but the fact that it can be made small. Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise rested upon the consideration of infinitesimals. Achilles was a certain distance behind the tortoise and attempting to overtake it. Zeno argues that he can never do so, for, says he, while Achilles travels half the distance between them, the tortoise has traveled a certain distance, while Achilles is traveling half the remaining distance, the tortoise has moved forward, etc. If these half distances were traveled in finite intervals of time, Zeno's argument would be correct, but the intervals of time are approaching zero as well as the distances. The differential calculus is based on finding the limit of the ratio of two infinitesimals. Suppose a train travels without stop from A to B, a distance of 100 miles in 100 minutes, and is required to find its speed. One says a mile a minute, but the train started from rest at A and comes to rest at B, whence there are points at which the speed is less than that given and at other points greater, so that the speed assigned is not the speed at every point, but what might be called an average speed. Suppose it is required to find the speed at a particular point C. One would proceed in this manner. Measure a distance of, say, 1,000 feet along the track of which C is the middle point. Time the train over this distance. The ratio of the distance to the time is the speed or rate, but it cannot be said that this is the rate at C. It is an average rate over the 1,000 feet. 
Take a shorter distance, say 500 feet. The ratio of this shorter distance to the shorter time is more nearly the rate at C than the former. Continue this process, and the ratio of the distance to the time as each becomes indefinitely small comes nearer and nearer to the exact rate at C. If the motion of the train was subjected to a law by which the limit of this ratio could be found, that limit would be the rate at C. Differentiation is this process of finding the limit of the ratio of two infinitesimals that are mutually dependent. A geometric example will be given. It is required to find the direction in which the point moves which generates the curve in the figure as it passes through the particular position P. This direction will be along a tangent line, PR, since if the point were to continue in the direction which it is moving at P, it would move in a straight line tangent to the curve at P. Take a second point, P' prime, on the curve and pass a line through P and P'. Prime. Now if P' prime moves along the curve towards P, this line swings around toward the limiting position, PR. The direction of P, P' prime, is fixed by the angle MPP prime, of which the tangent is MP prime over PM. As P prime approaches P, both MP prime and PM approach zero, but they have a limiting ratio which is equal to MN over PM, or the tangent of the angle MPN. The mode of applying this operation algebraically is quite simple. The coordinates of P are given, say, x1, y1. A second point, P prime, is chosen with coordinates x1 plus h, y1 plus k, and subjected to the condition that P prime lies on the curve. This is done by finding the relation of h and k by substituting x1 plus h and y1 plus k in the equation of the curve in place of x1 and y1. The limit of the ratio of h equals mp and k equals mp prime is then found as h and k approach zero. In the parabola y squared equals 8x, find the direction or slope of the tangent at point p whose coordinates are 2 and 4. Take p prime 2 plus h 4 plus k, a point on the curve. Since it lies on the curve, these coordinates must satisfy the equation of the curve. Putting 2 plus h for x and 4 plus k for y, one has, open parentheses, 4 plus k, close parentheses, squared, equals 8, open parentheses, 2 plus h, close parentheses, or 16 plus 8k plus k squared equals 16 plus 8h or 8k plus k squared equals 8h. Solving for k over h, one has k over h equals 8 over 8 plus k. As k and h approach 0 together, the ratio becomes 1, or the tangent of the angle which the line of direction makes with the x-axis is 1, from which the angle may be found by consulting a table of tangents to be 45 degrees, or the line which is tangent to the parabola at the point 2, 4, makes an angle with the x-axis of 45. The sign of the operation of differentiation is d over dx. The inverse operation, or integration, may be looked at from two viewpoints. If one chooses to consider it as simply the inverse operation, in order to perform it, it would only be necessary to take cognizance of the steps in the direct process and reverse them. This would seem to be a very simple matter, but in practice frequently becomes extremely difficult or impossible. The second phase of integration is that of a summation of infinitesimals. y equals f of x is the equation of a curve. If y is differentiated with respect to x, the result is a new function of x, say, capital X. Then d over dx equals y, or dy over dx equals capital X, from which dy equals capital X dx. This x, being a function of x if plotted, gives a curve as in the figure. The y of any point in the curve is found by putting the corresponding value of x in the equation y equals capital X of x, as x gives y, x2 gives y2, etc. 
in dy equals capital X dx, take dx1 equals the interval x1, x2, and let x1, x2 equal x2, x3 equal x3, x4, etc. Then for x equals x1, dy1 equals y1 times dx1 equals y2 times x1, x2 equals area of rectangle x1, r. For x equals x2, dy2 equals y2 times dx equals y2 times x2, x3 equals area of rectangle x2, s. For x equals x3, dy3 equals y3 times dx equals y3 times x3, x4 equals area of rectangle x3, t. Now if dx and dy each be made to approach 0 and the sum of the dy's be taken to find y, this sum will be equal to the sum of the areas of these rectangles, as each rectangle has its base diminished toward 0. When this occurs, the small shaded triangles approach 0, and the sum of the rectangles approaches the area bounded by the curve, the x-axis, y1 and y4. This is written as y equals epsilon large x tx equals area a p q b, where epsilon means the sum of all terms of the form x dx as dx approaches 0. If x be placed equal to y and the curve plotted as above, and also y equals f of x, the relations of the two curves is that the ordinate of any point of the second curve indicates the area under the first curve from a chosen point on the curve to the point for which the ordinate is taken. When integration is regarded as above, as a summation, the sign epsilon is sometimes used, although it is customary to write the usual sign of integration, s. With the invention of the analytic geometry and the calculus, modern mathematics begins. Speaking of its development from the date 1758, which closes the period covered by the third volume of Moritz Cantor's Geschichte der Mathematik, Professor Kaiser says, That date, however, but marks the time when mathematics, then schooled for over a hundred eventful years in the unfolding wonders of analytical geometry and the calculus, and rejoicing in the possession of these, the two most powerful among instruments of human thought, had but fairly entered upon her modern career. And so fruitful have been the intervening years, so swift the march along the myriad tracks of modern analysis and geometry, so abounding and bold and fertile withal, has been the creative genius of the time, that to record even briefly the discoveries and the creations since the closing date of Cantor's work would require an addition to his great volumes of a score of volumes more. Close quote. And throughout all this wonderful growth, nothing is lost or wasted. The achievements of the old Greek geometers are as admirable now as in their own days, and they remain the eternal heritage of man. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Foundations of Mathematics, Part 1. A traditional conception, still current everywhere except in critical circles, has held mathematics to be the science of quantity or magnitude, where magnitude, including multitude, with its correlative number, as a special kind, signified whatever was capable of increase and decrease and measurement. Measurability was the essential thing. That conception of the science was a very natural one, for magnitude did appear to be a singularly fundamental notion, not only inviting, but demanding consideration at every stage and turn of life. The necessity of finding out how many and how much was the mother of counting and measurement, and mathematics, first from necessity and then from pure curiosity and joy, so occupied itself with these things that they very plausibly came to seem its whole enjoyment. Nevertheless, numerous great events of a hundred years 
have been absolutely decisive against that view. For one thing, the notion of continuum, the grand continuum, as Sylvester called it, that great central supporting pillar of modern analysis, has been constructed by Weisterstrass, Dedekind, George Cantor, and others, without any reference whatever to quantity, so that number and magnitude are seen to be more than independent, they are radically disparate. When the attempt is made to correlate the two, the ordinary concept of measurement as a repeated application of a constant finite unit undergoes such refinement and generalization through the notion of limit, or its equivalent, that counting no longer avails, and measurement retains scarcely a vestige of its original meaning. And when we add the further consideration that non-Euclidean geometry, primate among the emancipators of the human intellect, employs a scale in which the unit of angle and distance, though it is a constant unit, nevertheless appears, from the Euclidean point of view, to suffer lawful change from step to step of its application, it is seen that to retain the old words and call mathematics the science of quantity or magnitude and measurement cannot be accepted as telling either what the science has actually become or what its spirit is bent upon. Moreover, the most striking measurements, as of the volume of a planet, the weight of a sunbeam, the growth of cells, the valency of atoms, rates of chemical change, the penetrative power of radium emanations, are none of them done by direct repeated application of a unit, or by any direct method, whatever. They are all of them, accomplished by one form or another of indirection. It was perception of this fact that led the famous philosopher and respectable mathematician Auguste Comte to define mathematics as the science of indirect measurement. But the thought is not yet sufficiently deep or comprehensive, for there is an immense range of admittedly mathematical activity that is not in the least concerned with measurement, whether direct or indirect. Consider, for example, that splendid creation of the 19th century known as projective geometry. Here is a boundless domain of countless fields, where reals and imaginaries, finites and infinites, enter on equal terms, where the spirit delights in the artistic balance and symmetric interplay of a kind of conceptual and logical counterpoint, an enchanted realm where thought is double and flows throughout in curiously winding but parallel streams. In this domain, there is no concern with number or quantity or magnitude, and metric considerations are entirely absent or completely subordinate. The fact, to take a simplest example, that two points determine a line uniquely, or that the intersection of a plane and a sphere is a circle, or that any configuration, whatever, the reference is here to ordinary space, presents two reciprocal aspects according as it is viewed as an ensemble of points or as a manifold of planes, is not a metric fact at all. It is not a fact about size or quantity or magnitude of any kind. In this region of thought, it was position rather than size that seemed to sum the central matter, and so it was proposed to call mathematics the science of measurement and position. The conception thus mightily expanded, it excludes many a mathematical realm of vast extent. Consider, for example, that limitless class of things known as operations, limitless alike in number and in kind. Now it so happens that there are many systems of operations, such that any two operations of a given system, if they be thought as following one another, together thus produce the same effect as some single operation of the system. Such systems are infinitely numerous, and present themselves on every hand. For a simple illustration, think of the totality of possible straight motions in space. The operation of going from point A to point B, followed by the operation of going from B to point C, is equivalent to the single operation of going straight from A to C. Thus, it is seen that the system of such operations is a closed system, that is, combination of any two of the operations yields a third one, not without, but within the system. The great notion of group, thus simply exemplified, though it had barely emerged into consciousness a hundred years ago, has meanwhile become a concept of fundamental importance and prodigious fertility. It not only affords the basis of an imposing mathematical doctrine, the theory of groups, but therewith serves also as a bond of union, a kind of connective tissue, uniting together a large number of widely dissimilar doctrines as organs of a single body. But, and this is the point to be noted here, the abstract operations of a group of operations, though they are very real things, are neither magnitudes nor positions. This way of trying to come at an adequate conception of what mathematics is, namely by attempting to characterize in succession its distinct domains, or its varieties of subject matter, or its modes of activity, in the hope of finding a common definitive mark, is not likely to prove successful. 
for it demands an exhaustive enumeration, not only of the fields now occupied by the science, but also of those destined to be conquered by it in the future, and such an achievement would require a provision that none may claim. Fortunately, there are other paths of approach that seem more promising. Every one has observed that mathematics, whatever it may be, possesses a certain mark, namely, a degree of certainty not found elsewhere. So it is, proverbially, the exact science par excellence. Exact, no doubt, but in what sense? An excellent answer is found in a definition given about one generation ago by distinguished American mathematician Professor Benjamin Pierce. Mathematics is a science which draws necessary conclusions. This formulation is of like significance with the following, yet finer, mot, by that scholar of Lebanonian attainment and brilliance, Professor William Benjamin Smith. Mathematics is a universal art, apodictic. These statements, though neither of them is adequate or final, are both of them telling approximations, wondrously penetrating insights, at once foreshadowing and neatly summarizing for popular use the epoch-making thesis established mainly by the creators of modern logistic, namely that mathematics is included in, and in a profound sense may be said to be identical with symbolic logic. Observe that the emphasis falls on the quality of being necessary, that is, correct logically, or valid formally. But why are mathematical conclusions correct? Is it that the mathematician has a reasoning faculty different in kind from that of other men? By no means. What then is a secret? Reflect that conclusion implies premises, that premises involve terms, that terms stand for ideas, concepts or notions, and these latter are the ultimate material with which the spiritual architect, called the reason, designs and builds. Here, then, one may expect to find some light. The apodictic quality of mathematical thought is not due to any special kind of faculty peculiar to the mathematician, nor to any peculiar mode of ratiocination, but is rather due to the character of the concepts with which she deals. What is that distinctive characteristic? The answer is precision and completeness of determination. But how comes the mathematician by such precision and completeness? There is no mystery or trick involved. Some concepts admit of such precision and completeness. Others do not, at least not yet. The mathematician is one who deals with those that do. The matter, however, is not so simple as it may now seem, and the attentive consideration of the reader is invited to what is yet to follow the two movements of logical-mathematical thought. The foregoing thesis, which will be more narrowly examined in the latter part of this article, is a joint result of two modern movements of thought, which have had separate origins, have followed separate paths, and, having been carried on by two distinct and even alien groups of investigators, have recently converged, to the astonishment of both groups, upon the thesis in question. One of these movements originated at the very centre of mathematics itself, and may be appropriately designated as the critical mathematical movement. The other, which may be called the logistical movement, took its rise in other interests, and in what seemed to logicians and mathematicians alike to be a very different and even a scientifically alien field, the interests and the field of what has come to be known as logistic or symbolic logic. The critical mathematical movement, for more than a century after the inventions, i.e. the discoveries of analytical geometry by Descartes and Fermat, and the infinitesimal calculus by Leibniz and Newton, mathematicians devoted themselves almost righteously to application of these powerful instruments to problems of physics, mechanics, and geometry, without much concerning themselves about the nicer questions of fundamental principle, logical cogency, and precision of concept and argumentation. In the latter part of the 18th century, the efforts of the incomparable Euler of Lacroix and others to systematize results served to reveal in a startling way the necessity of improving foundations. Constructive work was not, indeed, arrested by that disclosure. On the contrary, new doctrines continued to rise and old ones to expand and flourish, but a new spirit had begun to manifest itself. The science became increasingly critical as its towering edifices more and more challenged attention to their foundations. Manifest already in the work of Goss and Lagrange, the new tendency under the powerful impulse and leadership of Cauchy rapidly developed into a momentous movement. The calculus, while its instrumental efficacy was meanwhile marvelously improved, 
was itself advanced from the level of a tool to the rank and dignity of a science. The doctrines of the real and of the complex variable were grounded with infinite patience and care, so that, owing chiefly to the critical constructive genius of Weisserstrass and his school, that stateliest of all the pure creations of the human intellect, the modern theory of functions, with its manifold branches, came to rest on a basis not less certain and not less enduring than the very integers with which we count and tell the number of coins in the coffer or cattle in the field. The movement still sweeps on, not only extending to all the cardinal divisions of analysis, but through the agency of such as Lobakovsky and Bollier, Grassmann and Raven, Cayley and Klein, Hilbert and Lye, Pino, Pierre and Pasque, recasting the foundations of geometry also. In the light of all this criticism of mathematics by mathematicians themselves, the science assumed the appearance of a great ensemble of theories, competent, no doubt, interpenetrating each other in a wondrous way, yet all of them distinct, each built up by logical processes on its own appropriate basis of pure hypotheses, or assumptions, or postulates. As all the theories were thus seen to rest equally on hypothetical foundations, all were seen to be equally legitimate, and doctrines like those of Caternians, non-Euclidean geometry in hyperspace, four times suspected because based on postulates, not all of them traditional, speedily overcame their heretical reputations and were admitted to the circle of the lawful and orthodox. The Logistical Movement it is one thing, however, to deal with the principal divisions of mathematics severally, underpinning each with a foundation of its own, as, for example, the theory of the cardinal numbers, the positive integers, was assumed as the basis for the upbuilding of function theory, that, broadly speaking, was the plan and the effect of the critical movement above sketched. But it is a very different and a profounder thing to underlay all the divisions at once, both those that are and those that are yet to be, with a simple foundation, with a foundation that shall be such, not merely for the divisions, but for something else, distinct from each and from the sum of all, namely, for the organic whole, the science itself, which they constitute. It is nothing less than that achievement, the founding, not of mathematical branches, but of mathematics, which, unconsciously at first, consciously at last, has been the aim and destined goal of the logistical movement, research in symbolic logic. The advantage of employing symbols in the investigation and exposition of the formal laws of thought is not a recent discovery. As everyone knows, symbols were thus employed to a small extent by the Stagiriot himself. The advantage, however, was not pursued, because for two thousand years the eyes of logicians were blinded by the blazing genius of the master of those that know. With a single exception of the reign of Euclid, the annals of science afford no match for the tyranny that has been exercised by the logic of Aristotle. Even the important logical researches of Lebanus and Lambert, and their daring use of symbolical methods, were powerless to break the spell. It was not till 1854, when George Boole, having invented an algebra to trace and illuminate the subtle ways of reason, published his symbolical investigation of the laws of thought, that the yet advancing revolution in logic really began. Although it was neglected for a time by logicians and mathematicians, it was this work of Boole, who was both logician and mathematician, that inspired and inaugurated the scientific movement, now known and honored throughout the world under the name of symbolic logic. Under the leadership of C.S. Pierce in America, of Bertrand Russell in England, of Schroeder in Germany, of Couturat in France, and of Piano and his disciples and peers in Italy, supreme histologist of the human intellect, the deeps of logical reality have been explored in the present generation as never before in the history of the world. Not only have the foundations of the Aristotelian logic, the calculus of classes, been recast, but side by side with that everlasting monument of Greek genius there rise today two other structures, fit companions of the ancient edifice, namely the logic of relations and the logic of propositions. And now the base of this triune organon, the calculus of classes, the calculus of propositions, the calculus of relations, is surprising in its seeming meagerness for it consists of a score or so of primitive propositions, the principles of logic, and less than a dozen primitive notions called logical constants. Yet more surprising, however, is the fact, justly described as one of the greatest discoveries of our age, that this foundation of logic is the foundation of mathematics also. So one may say, symbolic logic is mathematics, mathematics is symbolic logic, the twain are one. The thesis 
The thesis, accordingly, which it is the purpose of the following paragraphs, to explain with some detail, is this. All mathematical notions are definable directly or indirectly in terms of a few undefined or primitive notions, called logical constants, and in mathematical argumentation there enter as fundamental not more than about twenty undemonstrated or primitive propositions, called principles of logic. What these primitives are will be seen presently. It is to be at once mentioned, and to be constantly borne in mind that, if nothing be assumed, nothing can be deduced. Accordingly, in mathematics, as in any other science, the ideas that occur fall into two classes, the undefined and the defined, and the propositions fall into two classes, the undemonstrated and the demonstrated. In any case, the primitives, the undefined and the undemonstrated, are, to some extent, a matter of arbitrary choice and convenience. Simplicity is desirable, but not essential. What is necessary is that the set of notions chosen for primitives must be such that all other ideas of the science in question must be definable in terms of them, and whatever system of propositions be chosen for primitives must be such that all the other propositions of the science are demonstrable in terms of them. The set of primitive propositions must be compatible among themselves, and it is desirable, though not necessary, that the system should be non-tautological or irreducible, that is, that none of them be logically deducible from the others. The primitives contemplated in the foregoing thesis constitute the foundation of modern logic. It is to be shown that no new primitives are required in mathematics. This done, it follows that mathematics, instead of being a science that merely uses logic, is really a prolongation of it, a proper part, and, indeed, the principal part of the superstructure of logic. If, then, an edifice includes both the basal masonry and that which is built upon it, and such appears to be the better use of the term, the propriety of identifying mathematics and logic is sufficiently evident. It remains a moot question which of the three above-mentioned branches of modern logic, if any one of them is entitled to the distinction, is logically prior to the others. As, however, discourse would seem to be quite impossible without propositions, in the following sketch, we adopt the obvious recommendation of common sense, and begin with the calculus or logic of propositions. The set of primitive notions and propositions here presented is that which at present seems most likely to be finally adopted with least modification. Though it is the result of the thought of numerous investigators, it may be called the piano-rustle system, as suggesting the two men who have done most to produce it. Logic or calculus of propositions. In this logic, besides the notion of truth, which remains undefined and constantly employed, the primitive ideas are two. One, material implication, and two, formal implication. The notion of implication is not defined. We know, however, that it is a relation that, when it is found, is found to subsist between propositions. The idea of proposition is, however, defined. It is, namely, anything that is true or fake, or anything that implies anything. It is important to distinguish between a genuine proposition, as Xerxes was a soldier, from what has merely the form of a proposition, as why was a soldier, this last being, as it stands, neither true nor false. Such forms as the last, containing a variable, why or some other, are known as prepositional functions, the notion being one of the primitives of the logic of classes. The distinction between material and formal implication is to be acquired very much as a child learns to distinguish cats from dogs, and the very young logician often confounds them. For one thing, material implication subsists only between genuine propositions, while formal implication is the kind that holds between propositional functions. Thus, Xerxes was a soldier, implies Xerxes was a man, is an example of material implication. But A was a soldier implies A was a man is an example of formal implication. If in the last one replaces the variable A by some constant, as Columbus or Caesar, the function is replaced by a proposition, and formal by material implication. In actual discourse, as it runs in the world, the distinction in question is often disguised. If P and Q are propositions, then the proposition, P implies Q, asserts a material implication and means that either Q is true or P is false. 
The proposition, if 2 is 4, 5 is 10, suits a material implication, but the implication in the statement, if x is twice x, and a multiple of x is twice that multiple, one is formal. To borrow Mr. Russell's illustration, the fifth proposition of Euclid follows from the fourth. If the fourth is true, so is the fifth, while if the fifth is false, so is the fourth. This is the case of material implication, for both propositions are absolute constants. But each of them states a formal implication. The fourth states that if x and y be triangles fulfilling certain conditions, then x and y are triangles fulfilling certain other conditions. And the fifth states that if x is an isosceles triangle, x has the angles at the base equal. CF dot Russell's Principles of Mathematics, Volume 1, page 14. The primitive propositions of propositional logic are 10 in number and are as follows. 1. P implies Q implies P implies Q. 2. P implies Q implies P implies P. 3. P implies Q implies Q implies Q. 4. If P implies Q, and if P is true, then P may be dropped and Q asserted. 5. P implies P, and Q implies Q implies PQ implies P the expression p and q being denoted by the symbol pq. 6. p implies q and q implies r implies p implies r. 7. q implies q and r implies r and p implies q implies r implies pq implies r. 8. p implies p and q implies q and pq implies t implies p implies q implies r 9. P implies Q and P implies R implies P implies QR. And 10. P implies P and Q implies Q implies P implies Q implies P implies P. Experience has shown that it is in various ways advantageous without compensating disadvantages to reduce all matter whenever it is possible to symbolic form. In case of the foregoing primitives, such reduction is readily accomplished by employing the symbol, an inverted C, to denote the word implies, and by using periods or dots in place of the word and, as well as to indicate the relative ranks of the various copulas O of a same proposition. A very little practice suffices to enable one both to translate into symbolic forms and to interpret them. Of these, one means that POQ is a proposition, two means that what implies something is a proposition, three means that what is implied is a proposition, four is peculiarly interesting as illustrating the limits of formalism. It does not admit of symbolic statement, a fact not to surprise or mystify since it is a priori obvious that discourse is essentially prior to symbolism and is necessary to tell the meaning of it. The meaning of four may be made clear by a familiar example. If Socrates is a man, and if all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. Let the two premises be granted true. How justify the assertion of the conclusion as a true proposition to be henceforth so taken? The answer is four, an exceedingly subtle principle introduced into logic by Piano. Coderat calls it the principle of deduction. Five means that the joint assertion of two propositions, P and Q, implies the assertion of the former. Six is evidently the familiar principle of the syllogism. Seven states that if a certain proposition implies that a second one implies a third, then the third is implied in the joint assertion of the other two. Thus, the proposition, Socrates lived in Athens, implies that if Athens was then a city of Greece, the population of Greece once contained a philosopher. Now, all this, says Seven, implies that the proposition, the population, and so on, is implied in the joint assertion of the two propositions. Socrates lived in Athens. Athens was then a city of Greece. Eight is the converse of seven. Nine means that if a proposition implies each of two propositions, it implies both of them. That is, that the assertion of the first carries implicitly the joint assertion of the other two. The reader can easily illustrate. Finally, 10 tells us that if P is implied by the proposition, P implies Q, then P is implied by the proposition that P implies Q implies P. End of section 15.
Section 16 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Ralt Wheeler. Foundations of Mathematics, Part 2. The reader will have observed that the foregoing principles differ in respect to simplicity and obviousness. He must be reminded that they were not selected because they were simple or obvious, but because they were found to be expedient. It is their serviceability that recommends them. They shine in their agency and use. That the primitive propositions are true propositions, the reader may convince himself by means of a test now to be explained. The proposition P implies Q, means that Q is true or P is false, and nothing more. This consideration readily serves to justify the remarkable statement— in respect to material implication, every false proposition implies all propositions, and every true proposition is implied by every proposition. Let us now apply this proposition as a criterion to test the truth of one of the primitives, say 8. Suppose first that P, Q, R are all true. Then Q implies R is true, hence P implies and Q implies R is true, and hence 8 is true. Next, suppose P is false and Q and R true. Then P implies and Q implies R is true, and hence 8 is true. Again, suppose P true, Q false, and R true. Then P implies and Q implies R is true, and hence 8 is true. Once more, suppose P and Q true and R false. Then P implies P is true, Q implies R is false, and hence the joint assertion preceding the third dot is false. Hence 8 is true. A like result follows under all the other possible suppositions respecting the elements P, Q, and R, and in like manner for the remaining nine primitives. The conception of a science in a state of perfection requires that all other notions entering the structure of the propositional calculus be defined in terms of implication and truth, and that all the other propositions of that calculus be demonstrated as theorems by means of the above-given primitive propositions. Among such superstructural notions and theorems are the following cardinal ones. The logical product of two propositions, P and Q, is their joint assertion and is symbolized by P times Q, or simply by PQ. In terms of implication and truth, the definition is... If P implies P and Q implies Q, i.e. if P and Q are propositions, PQ signifies that R is true if P implies that Q implies R. The logical sum of P and Q is denoted by writing P plus Q. It is a proposition S implied by P and Q and implying every proposition that is implied by both P and by Q. The sum of P and Q is the same as the disjunction or alternation P or Q. The negative, minus P, of a proposition P is defined to be such a proposition that, if R be any proposition whatever, minus P implies that P implies R. Two propositions are said to be equivalent when and only when each of them implies the other, that is, if P implies Q and Q implies P, then P equals Q, and conversely. The fact that the product of a proposition by the same proposition is equivalent to the proposition, P P equals P, is called the law of tautology for propositional multiplication, and for addition it is the fact that P plus P equals P. Cardinal among the theorems of the propositional calculus are the following. The product P times minus P of a proposition and its negative is false, the law of contradiction. The sum P plus minus P of a proposition and its negative is true, the law of excluded middle or third. The negative of the negative of a proposition is equivalent to the proposition, that is, minus minus P equals P. Such is the law of double negation. Logical multiplication of propositions is commutative, associative, and distributive, that is, P times Q equals Q times P, P times the quantity Q times R equals the quantity P times Q times R, and P times the quantity Q times R equals the quantity P times Q times the quantity P times R. The same three laws hold for logical summation of propositions. The calculus or logic of classes. This logic is characterized by three primitive or undefined ideas or notions, and by two primitive or undemonstrated propositions. The primitive ideas are, 1. Propositional function, 2. The relation of an individual to a class containing it, 3. And the notion expressed by the phrase such that, or its equivalent in some other language. The notion 1 is denoted by such symbols as phi of x, psi of x, f of y, etc. It is familiar to everybody. Of it, Mr. Russell, Principles of Mathematics, Volume 1, page 19, says, We may explain, but not define, this notion as follows. Phi of x is a propositional function if, for every value of x, phi of x is a proposition, determinate when x is given. Thus, x plus 2 equals 0 is a propositional function, for it yields a proposition, true or false, on replacing the variable x by any constant, as 1, 5, minus 2, Socrates, Wednesday, or love. Again, tangent of 45 degrees equals 1, tangent of 60 degrees equals 4 are propositions, while tangent of x equals 1, tangent of x equals x, are propositional functions. Once more, x is a triangle is a propositional function, but John Jones is a triangle is a proposition. Primitive 2 is denoted by the letter epsilon, thus to say that the individual k belongs to a class A, we write k epsilon A. 
The important distinction between the relation denoted by epsilon and that of part to whole was first pointed out by Pino. To say that a class A is a part of or is included in a class B, we write A implies B, the symbol implies being that which in the logic of propositions denotes implies. Thus the syllogism A implies B and X epsilon A and implies and X epsilon B means the class A belongs as a part to the class B, the individual X belongs to the class A, therefore the individual X belongs to the class B. But if A, B, and X are all classes, the syllogism is A implies B and X implies A and implies and X implies B. The third primitive, such that, is denoted by the symbol such that, inverse of epsilon. Thus, to say the ensemble of X values that render the function phi of X a true proposition, or verify or satisfy it, we write X such that phi of X, which may be read the X's such that phi of X is true. The two primitive propositions of this calculus are as follows. 1. Phi of x is true when and only when x belongs to the ensemble of terms satisfying phi of x. 2. If phi of x and psi of x are equivalent propositions for all values of x, then the classes of x's such that phi of x is true is identical with the class of x's such that psi of x is true. These primitives may be stated symbolically as follows. 1. k epsilon the quantity x such that phi of x implies phi of k. 2. Phi of x equals psi of x, and implies x such that phi of x, and equals x such that psi of x. The chief among defined ideas and proved propositions of class logic are the following. A class of terms is composed of the constants that satisfy a propositional function. A propositional function that is false for every value of the variable it defines is a null class. An individual x is identical with an individual y if and only if y belongs to every class that contains x, otherwise x and y are diverse. The class A is said to be included in the class B, and then we write A implies B, when and only when every proposition of the form X epsilon A implies for the same X that X epsilon B. The classes A and B are said to be identical if each includes the other. A class A is said to exist when and only when the logical sum of all propositions of the form X epsilon A is true. The logical product of two classes, A and B, is the class of terms X, such that the logical product of the two propositions X epsilon A, X epsilon B, is true. The logical sum of two classes, A and B, is the class of terms X, such that the logical sum of the two propositions, X epsilon A, X epsilon B, is true. The logical product of a class C of classes is the class of terms X, such that U epsilon C implies X epsilon U. The logical sum of a class C of classes is the class of terms X, such that if U epsilon C implies U epsilon K for all U's, then X epsilon K for all K's. When, as often happens, it is necessary to distinguish formally between a singular class, one having but one term, and its term, it is customary to place the Greek letter zeta before the symbol for the class. Thus, if A be a singular class, zeta A is its term. Also, the inverse iota of the Greek letter, if placed before the symbol for a term, gives a symbol for the singular class having that term for sole term. Thus, if X be a term, iota X denotes the corresponding singular class. The laws of tautology for class multiplication and summation are the fact that the logical product of a class by the class is the same class, and the sum of a class and the class is again just the class. If we write x minus epsilon a for the negative of x epsilon a, then the negative minus a of the class a is defined by minus a and equals and x epsilon the quantity x minus epsilon a, that is the class minus a is the class of terms x such that x is an a is false. The negative of the negative of a class is this class minus minus a equals a, the law of double negation for classes. The laws of commutation, association, and distribution are valid for the logical multiplication and addition of classes. Thus, if a, b, c be classes, then a, b equals b, a, a plus b equals b plus a, a times the quantity b, c equals the quantity a, b times c, a plus the quantity b plus c equals the quantity a plus b plus c, a times the quantity b plus c equals a, b plus a, c, a plus the quantity b plus c equals the quantity a plus b plus the quantity a plus c. The foregoing class logic definitions in terms of ideas in the propositional logic serve to exhibit the close connection and interpenetration of the two logics. Their parallelism, too, is striking. Thus, to the propositional syllogism, p implies q and q implies r implies p implies r corresponds to the class syllogism. If a is included in b and b in c, then a is included in c. The parallelism is not, however, thoroughgoing and may not be incautiously employed. For example, if P, Q, and R denote propositions, and if A, B, C denote classes, then we have P, Q implies R equals P, C, R plus implies Q implies R, but not A, B implies C equals A implies C plus B implies C. The calculus or logic of relations. We come now to the latest, in point of development, the subtlest, the profoundest, and, for mathematics, the most significant division of modern logistic. 
Founded by Charles S. Pierce upon the extensional view of relations, the view that a relation consists of the class of couples between which it subsists, elaborated and expounded on the same view by Schroeder, Algebra or Logic, the Calculus of Relations was then refounded by Bertrand Russell in 1900 upon the intentional view of relations, and by him dressed in the garb of a slightly modified Peano symbolism. It is this last theory, mainly due to Mr. Russell, of which the following account is a sketch. This logic is characterized by two primitive ideas and eleven primitive propositions. The primitive ideas are, one, the notion of relation, symbolized by R and written rel, two, the notion of identity, denoted by the symbol prime. The primitive propositions are as follows. One, R being a relation, X, R, Y, means for all X's and Y's that X has the relation R to Y. Two, given any R, there is a relation R prime, called the converse of R, such that X, R prime, Y is equivalent to Y, R, X. Three, if X and Y be any two definite terms, there is a relation that X has to Y, and that does not subsist between any other couple of terms. 4. If k be a class of relations, the logical sum of the relations of k is a relation, whereby logical sum is meant the class of relations r such that, if an r relates an x to a y, there is in k a relation r prime relating that x to that y, and that, if an r prime of k relates an x to a y, that x is related to that y by an r. 5. If k be a class of relations, the logical product of the relations of the class is a relation, whereby this product is meant the class of relations r such that, if an r relates an x to a y, then each relation r prime of k relates that x to that y, and that, if an x be related to a y by each r prime of k, that x is related to that y by one of the r's. 6. If any term x is related to a term y by relation r sub 1, and if y is related to z by r sub 2, x is related to z by a relation r sub 1 r sub 2 called the relative product of r sub 1 and r sub 2. 7. The negative, minus r, of a relation r is the relation where minus r means the proposition x minus r y is equivalent to the proposition x is not related to y by r. 8. The symbol blank, as employed in the class logic, is, or expresses, a relation. 9. Identity, the primitive notion, is a relation. 10. Any term x is identical with that term x. 11. Identity implies identity. If we denote the assertion that a thing exists by writing before its symbol the symbol inverse e, inverse of the letter e, denote the logical sum and product of a class k of relations respectively by the symbols plus prime k and times prime k, and denote by inverse delta the class of terms that may stand before an r, i.e. its domain, and by inverse delta the codomain or class of terms that may come after an r, then the foregoing primitive propositions may be written in symbolic form as follows. 1. r epsilon rel and implies x r y and equals and x has the relation r to y. 2 r epsilon rel and implies inverse e rel times r prime such that the quantity x r prime y and equals and y r x. 3. Inverse e rel times r inverse small e the quantity inverse delta equals iota x and inverse delta equals iota y. 4. Plus prime k e rel. 5. Times prime k e rel. 6. r sub 1 r sub 2 e rel. 7. Minus r e rel. 8. Epsilon epsilon rel. 9. I prime e rel. 10. X e rel. 11. I prime implies I prime. It will be observed that a relation has sense, that is, x r y means to assert that r relates the antecedent x to the consequent y and not y to x. The class of the antecedents is the domain of the relation, that of the consequence is the codomain, and the logical sum of the domain and the codomain is the field of the relation. Relations admit of important classifications. Thus, a relation R is uniform if each of its antecedents has the relation to one and but one of the consequence. A relation R is bi-uniform if R is uniform and its converse not R is also uniform. R is symmetric if X R Y implies Y R X. It is non-symmetric if X R Y and Y R X are both true for some but not all pairs of values of X and Y, and asymmetric if, when X R Y is true, Y R X is false. R is transitive if the logical product of x r y and y r z implies x r z, non-transitive if the three statements are true for some but not all triplets of values of x y z, and intransitive if x r z is false when x r y and x r z are both true. Thus the relation of equality is both symmetric and transitive. The relations greater than and less than are transitive but asymmetric. The relation implies is non-symmetric but transitive, and the relation epsilon is asymmetric and non-transitive. A relation R is reflexive if, like equivalence, for example, it holds between an X and that X. The relation R is included in the relation R prime if X R Y implies X R prime Y for all values of X and Y, and R and R prime are equivalent if each includes the other. Among the theorems that enter the logic of relations of the two following ones, which are converses of one another, are specially noteworthy. 1. The relative product of relation and the converse relation is a symmetric and transitive relation. 2. Every relation that is symmetric and transitive is equivalent to the relative product of a uniform relation and the converse relation. The last states the principle of the so-called definition by abstraction. The thesis justified. 
A sketch of modern logic having been premised, the above-stated thesis regarding the connection of mathematics with symbolic logic remains now to be justified by taking up serially the ideas upon which the chief divisions of mathematics have been built up, and presenting them in terms of the primitives, above given, of logic. Conceiving mathematics as falling into analysis and geometry, we may begin with the former, though in this connection some ideas, as that of order, belong as well to geometry as to analysis. The reader should note that all definitions are given directly or indirectly in terms of the above given logical ideas. The Cardinal Theory of Cardinals the cardinal numbers may be defined either with or without the use of the notion of order, giving rise to two theories of the cardinal numbers, namely the cardinal and the ordinal. It will be instructive to present the cardinal theory first. Two classes, A and B, are said to have the same cardinal number when there is a biuniform relation whose domain includes A and such that the class of consequence of the terms of A is identical with B. It follows that two null classes have the same number. This is called zero and denoted by the symbol zero. Plainly too, two singular classes have the same number. It is called one and denoted by the symbol one. It is to be noted that we have defined sameness of number of two classes, but have not yet defined number of a given class. Two classes having the same number are said to be equivalent. Now equivalence is a reflexive, transitive, and symmetric relation, so that, a class A being given, there is a class of classes each equivalent to A and to any other class in the class of classes. The number of the class A is defined to be the class of classes each equivalent to A. Two classes without a common term are said to be disjoint. If A and B are two disjoint classes, and if alpha and beta are their cardinal numbers, then the arithmetic sum of alpha and beta is the cardinal number gamma of the logical sum of A and B. The commutativity, alpha plus beta equals beta plus alpha, of arithmetic addition is evident in the fact that the notion of order does not enter the definition of such addition. Arithmetic multiplication of cardinals is definable as follows. Let K be a class of disjoint classes, of which none is the null class. The class of classes formed by taking, to compose a class, one and but one term of each of the classes k is named the multiplicative class of the classes k. The cardinal number of this multiplicative class is named product of the cardinal numbers of the classes k. The notion of order being absent, the validity of the commutative law, alpha beta equals beta alpha, is obvious, and the laws of distribution and association are readily shown to be valid. It is noteworthy that in the foregoing there enters no distinction of finite and infinite class or number and that the theory is applicable, therefore, alike to finite and to infinite cardinals. A class is said to be infinite or finite, according as it contains or does not contain a part or subclass, such that a biuniform relation, a one-to-one -one correspondence, subsists or does not subsist between the terms of the class, the whole, and the subclass, the part. And the number of a class is said to be infinite or finite, according as the class is infinite or finite. The Ordinal Theory of Cardinals This begins by joining the foregoing definitions of zero, zero, and one, one. The two definitions. 1. The successor of a cardinal n is the cardinal n plus 1, the arithmetic sum, already defined in logical terms, of n and 1. 2. n is the class of cardinals that belong to every class c that contains both 0 and the successor of every cardinal that it contains. This last definition states the principle of mathematical induction. It readily admits of proof that n is an infinite class, but that all the cardinals in n are finite, so that, unlike the cardinal theory, the ordinal theory of cardinals applies only to finite cardinals. It is not difficult to establish the propositions that 0 is an n, that if a is an n, the successor of a is an n, that if a is an n, the successor of a is not 0, that if the successor of a is identical with the successor of b, a and b are themselves identical and, without using other than logical primitives, to erect the entire arithmetic of the finite integers. The Notion of Order The definition of this exceedingly important notion is a notable achievement of recent investigation. Whatever order is, it was noticed that it might be linear any two of the terms of the ordered class being the one before, the other after, with or without a term between, the class so ordered being called an open series. Or it might be circular, of which a term cannot be said to be before or after another, but of which we are enabled to say merely that a pair of terms A, B, is separated by a pair C, D, if the four terms are arranged thus, A, C, B, D, A, or A, D, B, C, A, a class thus ordered being described as a closed series. The sense of the disposition AB is disregarded so that AB and BA are the same. Accordingly, a triplet of terms is essential to linear order. Thus ABC, or CBA, differs from ACB, or BCA, and enables us to say that one of the terms is between the other two. Similarly, disregarding sense, three terms cannot be in circular order, for ABCA is then the same as ACBA. Hence, four terms are the element in case of circular order. What order is has been ascertained by inductive study of the various relations that generate order. These, which reduce apparently to six distinct varieties, cannot be here presented. It is found, however, that any order, no matter by what relation it is generated, is generable by a transitive asymmetric relation. That is to say, if we have any ordered class of terms, the order, whatever it may be, is regardable as being set up by some asymmetrical transitive relation R, such that X and Y being two terms of the class X R Y, or else Y R X is true, but one of them is false, that R being transitive, the logical product of X R Y and Y R Z implies X R Z, 
that the conversive R is also transitive and asymmetric, and that, given any term x of the class, the remaining terms fall into two classes y and z such that x are y and z are x. And thus, of any three terms, x, y, z of the class, one of them, as y, is between the other two, i.e. x are y and y are z, or z are y and y are x. A simple example is that of the class n of finite cardinals ordered by the relation greater than. Another example is that of the class of points on a line of unit length extending from 0 to 1, the points 0 and 1 being both included, the points being taken in their so-called natural order of increasing distance from 0. The order may be regarded as established by the asymmetric transitive relation farther from 0. End of 16. Section 17 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rott Wheeler. Foundations of Mathematics, Part 3. Ordinal numbers. We are now prepared to define ordinal numbers, or types of order, which must not be confounded with the terms of the familiar series first, second, third, and so on. Two series, u and b, are said to be like when there is between them a biuniform relation such that for every pair of terms a sub 1, b sub 1 of u, and their correspondence a sub 2, b sub 2 of v, if a sub 1 precedes b sub 1, a sub 2 precedes b sub 2, or the likeness may be affirmed of the two relations by which the series u and v are generated. It is noteworthy that likeness is to series or their generating relations analogous to equivalence in the case of classes. Like equivalence, the relation of likeness is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. The ordinal number, or order type, of a series u is the class of series each like to u. If a series be a finite class, its ordinal number is uniquely determined by its cardinal number. The two numbers obey the same laws of operation and are, owing to the failure of man to distinguish between them, denoted by the same symbol. Thus the cardinal three and the ordinal three are both denoted by three, yet they are radically different things, for the cardinal three contains, for example, the class composed of the individuals a, b, c, but not the series a, b, c as such while the ordinal three contains that series and the distinct series b, a, c, among others. In the fields of infinities, the difference between the concept of ordinal number and that of cardinal not only may but must be observed, for the laws of operation are then no longer the same for the two kinds of numbers. For cardinals, whether finite or not, the commutative law of addition holds without exception, not so, however, for ordinals. For example, denote by alpha the infinite ordinal number of the endless series a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and by 3 the ordinal number of the series b sub 1, b sub 2, b sub 3. Then the ordinal number of the series b sub 1, b sub 2, b sub 3, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, is naturally 3 plus alpha. That of the series a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, b sub 1, b sub 2, b sub 3, is alpha plus 3. But the last two series are not similar, so that 3 plus alpha is not the same number as alpha plus 3. Hence, not all ordinals obey the commutative law of addition. And so for other laws of operations. The calculus of infinite cardinals and the distinct calculus of infinite ordinals are among the most beautiful and inspiring creations of mathematics. Philosophers and theologians have yet to learn to appreciate the significance of these doctrines, both of which are due mainly to the subtle creative genius of Georg Cantor, though others have made important contributions to their development and refinement. Rational numbers. Rational numbers, or fractions, are defined to be certain relations between the integers or cardinal numbers. This may be clear as follows. Let the small letters a, b, c, d, e denote integers. Suppose that a, b equals c, d, b equals e. It is obvious that to b there corresponds a relation, conveniently denoted by a capital B, which consists in the fact that a, b equals c, d, b equals e. Similarly, to any other integer, as small m, there corresponds a relation capital M, such that p capital M q means that p small m equals q. Now suppose that a, b equals c, d. Then we may write a b equals p, c d equals p, whence a capital B p and d capital C p. From the last follows p capital C d, while from this and a capital B p follows a capital B capital C d. The compound relation capital B capital C, uniquely determined by the integers small b and small c, is named fraction and denoted by the familiar symbol divided by. All such relations together constitute the class of fractions or so-called rational numbers. Rational numbers having the cardinal 1 for denominator are usually denoted by the symbol for the numerator and are thus made to appear as cardinals. Cardinals, however, they are not, as is evident by comparing definitions. A cardinal is a class, a rational is a relation. Upon this relational basis, the entire theory of rationals is easily built up. Positive and negative. It is to be noted and kept in mind that cardinal numbers and rational numbers are neither positive nor negative. Each of them is signless. Numbers having sign, plus or minus, are defined as follows. If two integers are consecutive, there is a relation between them, the same for every pair of consecutives by virtue of which one of them proceeds and the other follows. Denote this relation by R. 
Then, a and b being integers, the proposition a r b means that a plus 1 equals b. The relation r is asymmetric but intransitive. If a r b and b r c, then a r r c or a r squared c, and so on. The powers of r are also asymmetric relations. The converse of r to the p is not r to the p, that is, the quantity not r to the p. S that a r to the p s equals s not r to the p a, the left-hand member signifying simply that a plus p equals s, and the right-hand member that s minus p equals a. The relations r to the p and not r to the p are defined to be respectively the positive and negative integers, commonly denoted by plus p and minus p. Next, let small a, small b, small c denote rational numbers or fractions. Suppose that the sum of small a and small b is small c. Then corresponding to small b, there is a relation capital B, such that small a capital B small c means that small a plus small b equals small c. That small m capital B small n means small m plus small b equals small n, and so on. This relation capital B is defined to be a positive fraction and is denoted by plus small b. The converse relation capital B is named negative fraction, is denoted by minus small b, and is such that small m capital B small n means that small n minus small b equals small m. The reader should not fail to discriminate the integer a and the positive integer plus a. The former is a class, the latter a relation. Similarly, the fraction a and the positive fraction plus a are distinct. Both are relations, but the relations are by no means the same. Real numbers. Consider the ensemble e sub 1 of all the rational numbers less than the rational number 1, and the ensemble e sub 2 of all rationals whose squares are less than the rational 2. Each of the ensembles possesses the properties, it does not contain all the rational numbers, it contains every rational number that is less than any rational whatever, any variable rational, contained by it, that is, if it contains the rational x, it contains every rational less than x, it contains no number greater than all the numbers in it. Any class of rational numbers that has the three properties stated is named segment of rationals. Given any segment, S, the class composed of all other rationals may be conveniently denominated co-segment of S, complement of S. A segment of rational numbers is called a real number, which is thus a class. The real number E sub 1 is named 1, and denoted by 1. The real number E sub 2 is named square root of 2, and denoted by the usual symbol. Segments fall into two classes, according as their co-segments contain or do not contain a minimum number, one that is smaller than every other number in the co-segment. The segments, or reals, of the latter kind are called irrationals. Those of the former kind are commonly called rational numbers, though they are obviously very different from rationals, merely corresponding to them. Thus the symbol 2, for example, denotes the cardinal 2, the positive integer 2, the rational 2, and the real number 2, all different ideas manageable by the same laws of operation. The theory of real numbers, as thus defined, turns out to be identical with that arising from the usual definition of reals, and has the advantage of not having to assume a limit where there is none, as, for example, in case of the foregoing segment E sub 2. The notion of limit, not yet employed, will be defined in the following section. The concept of continuum. This most important concept is definable in terms of order and without use of metric or magnitudinal considerations. The process is due to that primate among subtile thinkers, Georg Cantor. Denote by eta the order type represented in the ensemble of rational numbers taken in order of magnitude. Any series of this type has the following three properties. 1. It is denumerable. 2. It has neither a first nor a last term. 3. It is compact, that is, between any two of its terms there is another term of it. By calling it denumerable, it is meant that a biuniform relation subsists between its terms and the terms of the series 1, 2, 3, 4. That it is denumerable may be shown easily. Arrange the rationals in a series by beginning with 1 over 1, following this with those having 3 for sum of numerator and denominator, these with the fractions having 4 for sum of terms, and so on, omitting any fraction that is equal to a predecessor in the series. The series is 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 2 over 1, 1 over 2, 3 over 1, 1 over 4, 2 over 3, 3 over 2, 4 over 1, the fractions having same number for sum of terms being arranged according to increasing magnitude. It is now plain that we can correlate the first term of the series with 1, the second with 2, the third with 3, and so on, so that each term gets paired with an integer and conversely. Hence, the series of rationals or any other series of type eta is denumerable. A series of the type of the series 1, 2, 3 is named progression. A progression, all of whose terms are terms of a series eta, is called a fundamental progression of eta, and ascending progression of its terms follow in the same order or sense as those of eta, but descending if in the contrary sense. A class of terms belonging to a series is said to have a limit x when and only when x immediately follows or precedes the class, but does not immediately follow or precede any one term of the class. A fundamental progression of a series eta has a limit x if x be in eta and immediately follows or precedes all of the terms in the progression. Again, a series is said to be perfect when and only when all of its fundamental progressions have limits and all of its limits are terms of fundamental progressions. These definitions premised, we are now prepared to define continuum. A series is said to be continuous if it is perfect and contains a series of type eta. It admits of proof that an ensemble that belongs to a perfect series is denumerable and has a term between every pair of terms of the containing series is of type eta. 
Hence, we may say that a series S is continuous if it is perfect and if it contains a denumerable class having a term between every two terms of S. A standard example of a continuum is the class of the real numbers equal to or greater than zero and equal to or less than one. This continuum is commonly represented by the class of points of a line segment of unit length, it being assumed that the series of such points and the mentioned series of real numbers are like. Multiple series and geometry. The remainder of this article, which aims at merely sketching modern thought on the foundations of mathematics, will be devoted to geometry. For many centuries, indeed down to the early part of the last century, the term geometry meant Euclidean geometry, and the propositions constituting it, the axioms and postulates together with the theorems deduced therefrom, were regarded not merely as a set of assumptions and deductions from them, thus constituting a coherent body of doctrine suspended in the intellectual error, but as true statements about actual space. And so, geometry has often been said to be the science of space, where space was used to denote actual or sensuous space, and not, as in recent years, merely the ensemble of elements, whether existent or not, about which geometry discourses. One of the Euclidean premises, however, namely the so-called parallel axiom, seemed to critical minds to be not sufficiently self-evident and yet baffled all attempts, of which there is a vast literature and still increasing by occasional contributions of the ill-informed, to deduce it as a theorem from the other Euclidean axioms. At length appeared the geometries of Lobachevsky and Bollier, in which the axiom in question was denied. The fact that these geometries contradict the Euclidean at many points, for example regarding the sum of the angles of a triangle, and are at the same time both free from interior contradiction and from contradictability by experimental measurement or other experience, led first to the suspicion, and then, through the discovered possibility of manifold geometries, each consistent with itself but inconsistent with the others, to the conviction that the attempt to describe space results in an experimental science like physics or biology, that the so-called geometry thus arising is but a branch of what is commonly denominated applied mathematics, though there is, strictly speaking, no such thing as applied mathematics, and that geometry, regarded as a branch of mathematics, is to be regarded and justified not as a description of actual space, but, like every other branch of mathematics, as a hypothetical deductive system. A given geometry consists of certain assumptions A and certain theorems T deducible from A. The truth of the geometry resides in the implication of the theorems T by the assumptions A, and not in their practical usability in the business of the workaday world, not in any applications in the concrete facts of the universe. In recent years, numerous memoirs on the foundations of geometry have been produced by European and American mathematicians. A striking result of such many-sided investigation is that the subject matter of what is called geometry is multiple series, that is, series of two or more dimensions. These terms may be explained as follows. A series S sub 1 generated by an asymmetrical transitive relation R is said to be simple, no matter what the nature of the terms of S sub 1. Suppose now that each term of S sub 1 is itself a simple series or an asymmetric transitive relation, for the relation and not the terms is the essence of the series. The class of all the terms and all the fields of the terms of S sub 1 is said to be a series of two dimensions. Call it S sub 2. For an image, the reader may think of S sub 1 as the series of the lines of a plane that are parallel to a given line. Each line, term of S sub 1, is a simple series, asymmetric relation, of the points. The plane S sub 2 is the field of all the points of all the lines of S sub 1. Next, suppose the terms of S sub 2 to be each of them an asymmetric transitive relation. Thus arises a three-dimensional series S sub 3, the fields of the fields of the fields of the terms of S sub 1. The process here indicated, or its reverse, will, if continued, lead to the concept of a series of n dimensions. It is noteworthy that the ordinary complex numbers of the type x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers, and i is the square root of negative 1, constitute a double series, and that the result of assigning y to the value 0 is, contrary to customary speech, not a real number. Projective Geometry The study of such multiple series, or of the relations generating them, has yielded three grand types of geometry, projective, descriptive, and metric. These agree in the fact that they are concerned with multiple series of what are called points. But the terms of the series might as well be called roints, slightly toves, waves, or any other names, for, as will be seen, point is to be merely the name of a class concept, no matter what, whose individuals satisfy certain relations prescribed with the hypotheses or assumptions or postulates or so-called axioms, all the terms are in use, that are chosen for undemonstrated propositions of whatever geometry is being built up. In what respects the three grand divisions differ fundamentally will appear in the sequel. For each of the varieties in question, there have been found various systems of basal hypotheses, so that an undemonstrated proposition of one system may be a theorem, a proposition demonstrated on the basis of another system serving for a basis of the same geometry. The following system of basal assumptions for projective geometry is due to Pieri. I principi della geometria di posizione composti in sistema logico deductivo. Memorie degli arri accad delle scienze di Torino. Second series, volume 48, 1898. An analysis of the system is found in Russell's Principles of Mathematics and also in Courant's Le Principe de Mathematique. The basis upon which Pieri erects the beautiful edifice of protective geometry consists of the following assumed, undemonstrated propositions. 1. Points form a class. 2. There is at least one point. 3. If A is a point, there exists a point other than A. 4. If A and B are two different points, the straight line AB is a class. 5. Each term of this class is a point. 
6. If A and B are two different points, the straight line AB is contained in a straight line BA. 7. If A and B are different points, A belongs to the straight line AB. 8. If A and B are distinct points, the straight line AB contains at least one point distinct from A and from B. 9. If A and B are distinct points, and if C, a point of the straight line AB, is distinct from A, then B is a point of the straight line AC. 10. Under the hypothesis of 9, the straight line AC is contained in the straight line AB. 11. If A and B are distinct points, there exists at least one point not belonging to the straight line AB. 12. If A, B, and C are three non-collinear points, and if A' prime is a point of B, C other than B and C, and B' prime a point of A, C other than A and C, then the straight lines A, A' prime, and B, B' prime have a point in common. 13. If A, B, and C are three non-collinear points, there exists at least one point that does not belong to the plane A, B, C. 14. If A, B, C are collinear points, their fourth harmonic does not coincide with C. 15. If A, B, C are three distinct points of a straight line, then if D, a point in the line, be distinct from A and from C, and it does not belong to the segment A, B, C, it belongs to the segment B, C, A. 16. If A, B, C are three distinct collinear points, then if the point D belongs to both the segments B, C, A and C, A, B, it cannot belong to the segment A, B, C. 17. If A, B, C are distinct collinear points, and if D belongs to the segment A, B, C and E to the segment A, D, C, then the point E belongs to the segment A, B, C. 18. If the segment ABC is divided into parts capital X and capital Y, such that each of them contains at least one point, and that every point small x of capital X precedes every point small y of capital Y in the order ABC, there exists at least one point Z of the segment ABC such that every point of ABC that precedes it belongs to capital X, and every point of ABC that succeeds it belongs to capital Y. Some of these propositions plainly presuppose certain definitions. These are now to be given, along with some commentaries designed to indicate the spirit and course of the author's thought. Certain diagrams, which the reader may readily construct, though they are not essential, will serve to make it clear. Such propositions as 2 and 3 show that no more points are to be assumed than are indispensable. The existence of others is to be proved. Thus, in the matter of fundamental assumptions, William of Ockham's famous dictum is regulative. Encia non sunt multiplicanda praeter necessitatum. The meaning of 4 and 5 is that two points, A and B, determine a class of points, named straight line and denoted by AB, whereby determine is meant that, given any pair of points, there is a certain definite relation R that holds between the pair and a corresponding unique class of points. The offices of A and B being indistinguishable, it follows from 7 that B too belongs to AB. From 10 it readily follows that a straight line is completely determined by any two of its points. Number 11, with preceding postulates, implies the existence of at least several straight lines. Number 12, which is not valid in either the Euclidean or the Lobachevskian, called by Klein hyperbolic geometry, leads to the conception of the projective plane. The class of points on the straight lines containing A, and each of them a point of BC, is named plane and denoted by ABC. It is then proved that the planes ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, and CBA are one and the same. Also that a plane is determined by any three of its non-collinear points, once it follows that a plane containing two points of a straight line contains the entire line. The term fourth harmonic of 14 is defined as follows. The fourth harmonic of three collinear points A, B, C, or, as it is often called, the harmonic conjugate of C with respect to A and B, is a point X of A, B, such that there exist two distinct points U and V collinear with C, but not on A, B, and such that X is collinear with the intersections of A, U with B, V, and A, V with B, U. The point X is constructed by means of a figure indicated in the foregoing definition, known as the von Stott quadrilateral. It is noteworthy that the definition implies neither the existence nor the unicity of X. The former is readily demonstrable by means of the first twelve postulates, but the latter requires thirteen, for the unicity depends upon the theorem of homologous triangles found in every book of projective geometry, and it is a most notable fact that this plane theorem does not admit of proof except by the help of points outside the plane, a most suggestive fact. What is true in a given domain of experience may, nevertheless, not be provable within that domain. End of 17